Moving outside, the scene shifts to Roman engrossed in training. At this moment, a stranger approaches, extending a greeting to Roman. Roman found himself face to face with a man named Macon. To Roman's surprise, Macon hailed from Valhalla's intelligence department, but his attire bore the insignia of Dimitri's staff uniform. A surge of anger coursed through Roman as he questioned Macon about his unexpected appearance, considering that Roman had already communicated through the Dinvar family a few days earlier. Macon, seemingly aware of the tension, swiftly apologized for the abrupt intrusion, explaining that the circumstances had compelled him to take formal action. He reassured Roman that this encounter reflected Valhalla's genuine sentiments. Acknowledging the complexities surrounding Roman, such as his nationality and the challenge of leaving Dimitri, Macon extended an intriguing proposition. He offered Roman a title of his own and an iron mine, coupled with a fertile territory. This, Mayan explained, would enable Roman to continue his role as a blacksmith while addressing the pressing concerns of his family's survival. Roman grappled with the unconventional nature of the offer, contemplating the potential benefits against the backdrop of his family's well-being. The weight of responsibility pressed upon him as he considered the implications of aligning himself with Valhalla. Mayin, sensing Roman's internal struggle, emphasized the paramount importance of power for a swordsman. To sweeten the deal, Macon revealed that Valhalla would grant Roman access to their Class I treasury, a repository of invaluable records encompassing mind methods and sword arts passed down through generations. These records, meticulously classified based on their content, held the key to ancient knowledge. Roman, taken aback by the extent of Valhalla's offer, absorbed the information. The mention of the Class I treasury, which housed special records of the highest grade, intrigued him. Valhalla, it seemed, guarded the secrets of mind methods and sword arts, preserving the wisdom of their ancestors. This revelation added a layer of complexity to Macon's proposal, enticing Roman with the allure of unparalleled knowledge. Macon, delving into Valhalla's ambitious vision, spoke of conquering the entire continent and establishing themselves as the sole empire. Remaining in the kingdom of Cairo, Macon argued, was a strategic shortcut to hastening this grand objective. The prospect of Roman contributing to Valhalla's ascent stirred the air with a sense of destiny, a destiny intertwined with the rise of an empire. As Megan painted this grand narrative, he appealed to Roman's sense of purpose, urging him to stand by Valhalla. The promise of a glorious future for Roman lay in aligning himself with this powerful force. Megan believed that, with secure compensation and a calculated amount of intimidation, Roman could navigate this path with both benefit and security. A man of discernment would typically find it challenging to reject the proposal laid before him by Macon, but Roman stood firm in his refusal. The atmosphere crackled with tension as Macon, the proposer, registered his shock at the unexpected turn of events. As the air hung heavy with anticipation, Roman felt compelled to elucidate the rationale behind his seemingly contrarian choice. It was not, as one might assume, a matter of Valhalla's insufficient compensation or a wavering loyalty to his homeland that prompted Roman's descent. In a moment of candor, Roman unveiled the complex tapestry of considerations weaving through his mind. He spoke of a surge in proposals, each seemingly designed to elevate his standing without requiring a commitment. This abundance of attention, however, mirrored the intricate political dance within the kingdom of Cairo. Influential figures, including the kingdom's royal knights, Marcus Benedict, Count Gregory, and Count Denver, sought to secure Roman's allegiance. What appeared as a straightforward decision was, in reality, a labyrinth in negotiation. Roman elucidated the intricacies of his predicament, illustrating the delicate balance he needed to strike amid the power plays of the kingdom. Pledging allegiance wasn't a mere formality, it was a calculated move with far-reaching consequences. The kingdom's political landscape resembled a chessboard, and Roman, the reluctant pawn, had to tread cautiously. He confessed to Macon that he found himself at a crossroads, not solely due to the influx of proposals but also because he sought to discern what was genuinely worth risking his life for. The multifaceted nature of the political machinations in the kingdom demanded a thoughtful and measured response. It wasn't a matter of mere proposals, it was a soul-searching journey for Roman. In an attempt to convey his commitment and loyalty, Roman explained that the appearance of difficulty in swearing allegiance was essential. It was a carefully choreographed act to convince Macon and others of his unwavering dedication. Mayin, moved by the intentional display, began to comprehend the depth of Roman's internal struggle. Acknowledging the urgency of the situation, Macon cautioned Roman about the limitations of time. 
The volatile political climate in Valhalla required swift decisions, and delay could prove costly. With a gentle yet firm tone, Macon implored Roman to be cautious not to let the sands of time slip through his fingers. Roman, understanding the gravity of the situation, assured Macon that he would provide an answer within the stipulated time frame. As Macon prepared to depart, he turned back, a glint of intrigue in his eyes. A parting gift, a symbolic gesture of the relationship blossoming between Roman and Valhalla, was promised. The enigmatic warning about the southern front, akin to a ticking bomb, lingered in the air, leaving Roman with a heightened sense of vigilance. Transitioning to the opulent halls of the Dimitri Palace, Roman bid his father farewell. The weight of his duty in national defense rested heavily on his shoulders. With a promise to return in good health, as Roman bid farewell to his family and prepared to embark on his journey, his mother, with a reassuring demeanor, turned to Romero Dimitri, Roman's father, and advised him not to fret excessively about their son. She sought to allay his concerns by explaining that Roman wasn't being deployed to the Western Front, the borders shared with the Kronos Empire. Instead, Roman had received orders to serve on the Southern Front, a posting deemed safer than the Western counterpart. With unwavering confidence, Roman's mother assured Dimitri that their son would return home unscathed, echoing the resilience that often accompanies a mother's steadfast belief in her child's well-being. Outside, the atmosphere changed as Roman assumed a leadership role. Addressing his soldiers with a tone of command, he urged them to move forward. It marked the commencement of their journey, a march into the unknown where duty and destiny intertwined. The narrative then shifted to the last stop before the southern front, and in serving as a temporary refuge for Roman and his troops. Their plan was to rest there until the break of dawn before resuming their march toward the designated front line. Amid the soldiers settling in, a disturbance caught Roman's attention. Investigating the source of the commotion, he found Kevin and Chris engaged in a heated exchange with Henry Albert, the eldest scion of the prestigious Albert family. Then the scene shifts to a few hours earlier. Roman reads a letter from central government where Benedict expressed concern for Roman's well-being, acknowledging his dedication to the kingdom. In a display of goodwill, Benedict had intervened to ensure Roman's assignment to the seemingly safer southern front, shielding him from the harsh conditions of a barren environment. Roman contemplated Benedict's actions, noting a pattern of consistent goodwill extended over the past few months. It became evident that the Marquez, at the helm of the aristocratic faction, was unwilling to lose Roman, recognizing his exceptional talent, especially in confronting the royal knights. Despite these efforts, Roman harbored doubts about the perceived safety of the southern front. Intelligence from Valhalla had painted a contrasting picture, describing it as a ticking time bomb waiting to detonate. Returning to the unfolding scene with Henry Albert, the narrative delved into the clash of social statuses. Henry, asserting his lineage as a descendant of one of Cairo's prestigious families, demanded the use of the inn. He questioned the audacity of individuals like Chris, deeming them, low lives, to speak against someone of his elevated stature. In the midst of a heated conversation between Chris and Henry Albert, Roman entered the scene, seeking an explanation for the commotion. Chris quickly briefed him on the situation, Henry was demanding that Chris and others vacate the inn, asserting his desire to use the space. However, Chris firmly resisted, informing Henry that he had already booked the entire inn. Despite Chris's protests, Henry seemed unyielding. Roman, observing the audacity of House Albert, recognized a family clinging to former glory, perhaps ignorant of their waning prestige. Seeing an opportunity to address the situation, Roman stepped forward, questioning Henry's demand. He asked why he and his soldiers should leave, challenging the apparent entitlement displayed by House Albert. Henry, undeterred, inquired if Roman was the leader of the soldiers. Roman confirmed his leadership role, prompting Henry to issue a warning. He emphasized the potential consequences of upsetting him, reminding Roman that both of them were headed to the southern training camp. With an air of superiority, Henry granted Roman a mere five minutes to vacate his site. As Roman pondered the treatment of House Dimitri, a remote and less influential house, he made a resolute decision not to yield to Henry's demands. Preferring a direct resolution to the standoff, Roman drew his sword, a symbolic gesture challenging Henry to a duel. He proposed that if Henry could defeat him, he would willingly leave the inn. Henry, seemingly taken aback by the unexpected turn of events, prepared to attack Roman. However, before any swords clashed, Albert's soldiers intervened, restraining Henry. In a surprising twist, they began enlightening Henry about the formidable opponent he was dealing with. The soldiers painted a vivid picture of Roman's martial prowess, 
recounting how he had ascended to become the youngest ranker in history. They detailed his exploits in the war against Barco, highlighting how Roman had slain Baron Barco's eldest son in direct combat. The soldiers spoke of Roman as a relentless force on the battlefield, a figure devoid of both blood and tears. Henry, now confronted with the realization that he was dealing with a formidable adversary, froze in place. The soldiers warned him of the dire consequences that could unfold if he engaged in a duel with Roman. Their description painted Roman as a formidable warrior, a force to be reckoned with. As Henry grappled with this new information, he couldn't help but acknowledge the potential peril that lay ahead. In a swift change of tone, Henry admitted to having forgotten about a prior arrangement. Attempting to salvage his pride, he proposed that the issue at hand be considered resolved. Yet, beneath his outward acquiescence, Henry harbored a desire to find a way to punish Roman for what he perceived as disrespect toward House Albert. As Roman positioned himself directly in front of Henry, the abrupt proximity sent a shiver down Henry's spine. Overwhelmed by fear, Henry hastily retreated to the opposite side of the room. Observing this reaction, Roman couldn't help but muse that this might be the norm on the southern front. On that particular day, three similar incidents unfolded, each culminating in individuals hastily withdrawing upon hearing Roman's name, a testament to the reputation he had acquired. Inside the inn, Roman engaged in conversation with the innkeeper, seeking insights into the peculiar dynamics of the southern front. The innkeeper, a witness to such occurrences, explained that unlike the western front, the southern front presented no immediate peril. This region enjoyed a relatively amicable relationship with Hector, prompting the offspring of nobles, unable to evade conscription, to prefer the southern front colloquially dubbed the resort. Here, training was lenient, devoid of life-threatening challenges, making it an ideal location for nobles to fulfill their national defense duty without exposing themselves to undue risks. As Roman examined a map, his thoughts delved into events that transpired precisely 48 days earlier when scouts from the kingdom of Hector crossed the border. Though they withdrew after confirming movements on the southern front, Hector's scouts continued their surveillance. Roman acknowledged the uncertainty surrounding Hector's intentions, whether they were preparing for war remained unclear. However, even from the fragments of information gathered, Roman concluded that the current state of the southern front offered no sanctuary. A smirk played on Roman's lips as he contemplated the inevitability of war, detecting a familiar scent of blood lingering in the air. The narrative seamlessly transitioned to the following day, where Viscount Bale Frank assumed the role of commander overseeing the training of noble recruits in the southern training camp. Bale, a figure of authority, took the opportunity to introduce himself and outline the purpose of the southern training camp. Bale clarified that the Southern Training Camp served as the foundational training ground for soldiers designated for the Southern Front. Following three weeks of rigorous training, all noble recruits would seamlessly integrate into a reserve corps, spending the remainder of their service on the Southern Front. This transition marked a critical juncture in their military journey. Addressing the assembled noble recruits, Bale delivered a stern directive, urging them to shed their preconceived notions of status upon entering the camp. In this egalitarian environment, everyone was simply a soldier, tasked with fulfilling their military service. Bale emphasized discipline, warning against any inclination to flout the established rules. The looming punishment for the soldiers was a deployment to the Western Front, Roman reflected, considering it a relatively lenient form of retribution. After this revelation, Viscount Bale Frank, the commander overseeing the training of noble recruits at the Southern Training Camp, addressed the soldiers. He informed them that the evening would bring detailed information about the upcoming training schedule. For the time being, Bale encouraged the soldiers to settle into their designated quarters. Shortly afterward, one of the soldiers approached Roman, conveying the commander's request for a private conversation. Roman obliged, making his way to Bale's office. As he entered, Bale greeted him with a warm smile, inquiring about the comfort of Roman's journey to the south. Roman assured Bale that the trip had been without issues. As they settled into the discussion, Bale expressed his excitement upon learning that Roman would be joining the Southern Front. To Bale, Roman's presence, as Cairo's youngest ranker, symbolized the emergence of a hidden strength within the Dimitri house. Bale, eager to confirm certain details, cut to the chase. He directly asked Roman if it was true that Marquis Benedict had intervened to have Roman dispatched to the Southern Front. Roman confirmed the accuracy of this information, clarifying that while he hadn't sought Benedict's help, he had heard about it afterward. Bale, absorbing the implications, considered the significant investment Benedict seemed to be making in Roman's potential. 
Seizing an opportunity, Bill candidly expressed his intentions. He revealed his desire to leave a positive impression with Marquis Benedict, acknowledging the stark contrast between the Southern training camp and the more opulent life of a central government member. Despite this, Bale pledged to do everything in his power to make Roman stay in the Southern training camp as comfortable as possible. In return for his efforts, Bale put forth a straightforward request. When Roman eventually met with Marquis Benedict, Bale wanted Roman to mention that Viscount Bale had played a pivotal role in making Roman's experience at the Southern training camp more amenable. It was a direct appeal, a quid pro quo arrangement that aimed to foster connections and potentially open doors for both parties. Roman, considering the proposal, recognized the pragmatism in Bale's approach, as there is no reason to refuse what Bale is willing to give Roman. After Roman exited Bale's office, he encountered Henry, who wasted no time in accusing Roman of messing with the wrong person. Henry dropped a bombshell, revealing that Viscount Bale, the commander at the Southern Training Camp, was his uncle. With a smirk, Henry suggested that Roman had made a grave mistake, insinuating that the consequences would be dire. In response to Henry's ominous words, Roman, unfazed, questioned what exactly Henry expected him to do with this newfound information. The nonchalant response only fueled Henry's anger. Without further ado, Henry stormed off, making a beeline for his uncle's office. In Viscount Bale's office, Henry breathlessly conveyed to his uncle that he felt threatened by someone in the camp. The words, someone is threatening Henry, reached Bale's ears, igniting his protective instincts for his nephew. Fueled by concern and anger, Bale wasted no time in seeking out the alleged perpetrator. Expecting to confront a potential threat, Bale burst into the scene, ready to take decisive action. However, to his surprise, the supposed antagonist turned out to be none other than Roman Dimitri. The tension escalated when, in a sudden and shocking move, Bale slapped Henry right in front of Roman. The unexpected slap left Henry stunned, tears welling up in his eyes. For Henry, his uncle Bale had been a figure of trust and support since childhood. The sudden act of physical discipline from someone he cherished more than his own parents cut deep, leaving Henry bewildered and emotionally shaken. In the aftermath of the slap, Viscount Bale, recognizing Roman's significant potential and the favor he had received from Marquis Benedict, turned to Roman with an apology. Bale admitted that Henry's behavior required better guidance and education. Roman, displaying a surprising degree of magnanimity, assured Bale that he would let the matter go, acknowledging the Viscount's attempt to address the situation. As Viscount Bale and a visibly distressed Henry left the scene, Bale's anger shifted towards his nephew. Outside, Bale expressed his frustration with Henry, questioning the wisdom of opposing someone like Roman, who had clearly caught the attention of Marquis Benedict. Henry, still grappling with the shock of the slap, sought an explanation from his uncle. Bale, in a stern and fatherly manner, admonished Henry to grow up and act responsibly. He warned Henry that if he continued his reckless behavior in the camp, mirroring his conduct back at the Albert estate, Viscount Bale wouldn't be able to protect him from the consequences of his actions. Recognizing the potential animosity that might have developed between Roman and Henry after the recent incident, Bale decided to take a proactive approach. In a strategic move, he announced that henceforth, Henry would be partnered with Roman in all aspects from training to the formation of the Reserve Corps. Bale, with a sense of urgency, instructed Henry to forge an amicable relationship with Roman, irrespective of the circumstances. In the complex dynamics of Viscount Bale's instructions, Henry found himself in a precarious position. Viscount Bale, his uncle and the commander at the Southern Training Camp, made it explicitly clear that any defiance on Henry's part would result in his swift relocation to the dreaded Western Front. Meanwhile, Roman retreated to his room, a private quarter provided by Viscount Bale. Observing his surroundings, Roman acknowledged the Viscount's deliberate effort to accommodate him. Reflecting on the situation, Roman mused that individuals who openly disclose their ambitions are often easier to manipulate. Despite the potential challenges of life in the Southern training camp, Roman remained optimistic about what lay ahead. The narrative then shifted to the heart of the training grounds, where an instructor named Mac Burney played a pivotal role as the general trainer. However, Mac Burney's journey to this role had been marked by a poignant tale of sacrifice and resilience. Just three years prior, Mac Burney stood as a veteran warrior actively engaged in the Western Front. Driven by unwavering loyalty to the kingdom, Mac Burney had volunteered for the Western Front, becoming a stalwart protector of Cairo through countless battles spanning a decade. Rising from humble origins, Mac Burney had ascended to the position of a commander leading a hundred men. Yet, 
In a cruel twist of fate during a fierce battle to safeguard the Western Front, Mac Burney lost his right arm, the very limb that once skillfully wielded a sword. For Mac Burney, the pain wasn't solely physical but stemmed from the abrupt end of a life defined by warriorhood. In recognition of Mac Burney's past contributions, the Empire contemplated appointing him as a training instructor for the Southern Training Camp. Despite the emotional turmoil of leaving the battlefield, Mac Burney accepted the reality with the hope that he could continue safeguarding Cairo, even from the training grounds. However, the transition proved challenging. The Southern Training Camp's training system was, in Mac Burney's eyes, an absolute train wreck. While the Western Training Camp ensured uniform training for everyone, the nobles in the Southern Training Camp were exempted from such rigorous discipline. Mac Burney had meticulously devised a tight training system, starting with a three-week basic training program. However, the effectiveness of this plan was compromised by the refusal of nobles, who held command over the soldiers, to partake in the training. This discrepancy frustrated Mac Burney, who grappled with the stark contrast and commitment between the two factions. The nobles, shielded from the rigors of training, seemed oblivious to the potential consequences this could have on their ability to lead effectively in the future. Mac Burney recognized the inherent flaw in a system that allowed such exemptions, jeopardizing the unity and preparedness of the entire Southern training camp. Mac Burney questioned the nobles' lack of commitment to training, frustrated by their casual demeanor on the front lines. As he walked by them, contemplating the meaning of their indifference, his exasperation grew. In the midst of the Southern training camp, Mac Burney, a seasoned leader, finds himself taken aback by a surprising sight. Roman, a noble, stands shoulder to shoulder with his soldiers, perfectly aligned with Roman Dimitri. The precision in their formation suggests a unity that catches Mac Burney off guard. As he observes the troops, he notices a commanding figure leading them, bringing forth questions about the soldiers' awareness of the unique practices of the Southern training camp. Approaching Roman, Mac Burney decides to share some insight into the camp's ethos. He informs Roman that nobles are not compelled to partake in training and suggests that if Roman desires respite, he can find shade and observe the training from a distance like others have chosen to do. Roman, curious about the motivation behind Mac Burney's advice, inquires if it stems from the influence of other nobles. Mac Burney candidly admits that Roman's suspicion is correct. Other nobles, unfamiliar with the demands of the Southern Training Camp, often choose to abstain from the physical rigors of training. This revelation prompts Roman to delve into a broader perspective. He emphasizes that on the battlefield, adversaries do not discriminate based on status. Roman articulates the necessity for commanders to possess stamina to navigate diverse terrains such as mountains, rivers, and swamps. He argues that for a commander to fulfill their role effectively, it is imperative to partake in the same training as their soldiers. Roman's perspective resonates with Mac Burney, who is impressed by the noble's understanding of the purpose behind the training. Roman points out that the Southern Training Camp's regimen serves not only to gauge the strength of the soldiers but also as a conduit for the transfer of invaluable experience. The training, according to Roman, is a holistic process designed to equip soldiers with the skills necessary for any battlefield scenario. The realization dawns on Mac Burney that Roman possesses a genuine commitment to understanding the challenges faced by his soldiers. In response, Roman urges Mac Burney not to wear a fake smile in his presence, assuring him that he is willing to undergo any form of training, transcending the constraints of his noble status. This declaration surprises Mac Burney, who, for the first time, encounters a noble willing to devote himself wholeheartedly to the training regimen. Mac Burney, initially considering compromises to accommodate the nobles, reconsiders his approach. He resolves to uphold the standards of the Southern Training Camp without dilution. Returning to the stage, Mac Burney contemplates the upcoming three weeks with a renewed sense of determination. He decides to give his best effort, acknowledging the rare commitment displayed by Roman and recognizing the significance of this unique convergence of nobility and common soldiers. Taking center stage once more, Mac Burney addresses the assembled troops. He declares the commencement of the first week of physical training. Mac Burney's pivotal decision marked the commencement of an arduous training regimen often dubbed Training Hell. The primary objective of this rigorous training was clear to equip individuals with the skills needed to navigate the unpredictable and relentless nature of the war zone, emphasizing the crucial ability to move swiftly in any circumstance. Gathering the soldiers, Mac Burney laid down a non-negotiable rule. Regardless of the weather, they would ascend a mountain every single day as part of their training routine. This announcement was met with astonishment from the other soldiers, 
who were taken aback by the evident strength and capabilities displayed by Roman and his troops. During the rigorous training sessions, MacBurney passionately conveyed the idea that warfare extends beyond the physical realm. It is also a psychological battle with an uncertain duration. Soldiers were subjected to relentless swinging exercises without a specified quota, pushing them to surpass their perceived limits. In an emphatic tone, MacBurney made it clear that those who gave up midway would have their training extended, even if it meant sacrificing precious sleep. As the grueling training sessions unfolded, a palpable sense of exhaustion settled among the soldiers. Seeking relief, some soldiers cooled off in the nearby river. In a candid exchange, one soldier remarked that he could have tackled the day's training more efficiently if he had the extensive preparation time seemingly enjoyed by Roman and his soldiers. Henderson, overhearing this conversation, interjected with a probing question about the soldier's training background. The soldier admitted to having trained for barely a year, acknowledging the expected disparity in proficiency compared to Roman and his soldiers, who had undergone years of training. Henderson, however, corrected the soldier's assumption, revealing that Roman soldiers had only been training for three months. With a serious expression, Henderson addressed the soldier's misconception, asserting that Roman soldiers had achieved remarkable progress within a short time frame. He went on to emphasize that the soldier's struggles were not a result of inadequate preparation but stemmed from a failure to give his best effort, plain and simple. In the quiet town of Henderson's residence, a seemingly ordinary day took a decisive turn when he stumbled upon a soldier recruitment notice. Intrigued by the prospect of a different life, he delved into the possibilities laid out before him. Little did he know that this seemingly straightforward choice would plunge him into a world where his perceptions of capability and qualification would be shattered. Upon joining Roman Dimitri's ranks as a private soldier, Henderson initially believed that the role required no outstanding qualifications. In his mind, the transition from a farmer to a warrior seemed like a natural progression, a mere change in occupation. However, reality struck hard when veteran mercenaries like Lucas and Pucky gathered to assess the conditions Roman offered. Henderson found himself surrounded by battle-hardened individuals, turning his initial confidence into a massive delusion. As the days unfolded, Henderson discovered that he was akin to a herbivore surrounded by beasts. Doubts began to gnaw at him, questioning whether he could truly measure up to the expectations set by serving under Roman. The very qualities he thought unnecessary for a private soldier were now glaringly absent, leaving him feeling unprepared and vulnerable. In a moment of vulnerability, Henderson sought counsel from Chris, a seasoned warrior within Roman's ranks. Henderson confessed that he felt undeserving of serving Lord Roman, citing his lack of swordsmanship skills and his background as a mere farmer. He deemed his decision to step into the world of warriors as arrogant and questioned whether he had the right to be amongst such skilled individuals. Chris, however, responded with a narrative that transcended Henderson's current state. He spoke of Kevin, a once spiteful boy whom Roman had taken under his wing. Chris vividly recalled the skepticism he felt when Roman chose Kevin, a common boy with nothing but spite in his eyes. However, the passage of time had transformed Kevin into a formidable warrior, earning the respect of all who crossed his path. Reflecting on his own journey, Chris revealed that he, too, had undergone a profound transformation. He recounted a time when his ignorant self had challenged Roman, only to have his front teeth almost blown away in response. Back then, Chris admitted to being nothing more than a frog in a well, unaware of the vastness of the world beyond. Under Roman's guidance, he had evolved into a warrior, just as Kevin had. With a sense of camaraderie, Chris urged Henderson to pay heed. He reminded him that the liege, Roman himself, had personally accepted Henderson into his ranks. Chris acknowledged Henderson's current struggles but emphasized the latent potential within him. Drawing parallels to Kevin and himself, he assured Henderson that growth was not only possible but inevitable under Roman's mentorship. In the quiet realm of Henderson's self-doubt, the prospect of transformation beckoned as he stepped into the fold of Roman Dimitri's service. It was a decision laden with skepticism for Henderson's struggle to believe in his own potential. Yet, Amidst his uncertainty, he reasoned that Roman must have discerned something worthwhile in him, a reason to select Henderson above a multitude of other applicants. Despite being a humble farmer, Henderson began to weave a delicate thread of trust in Roman's judgment, spurred on by the assurance of a fellow soldier, Chris. From the moment Henderson embraced this newfound trust, a subtle but profound change unfolded in his life. However, he clung to Chris's counsel, choosing to place his faith in Roman Dimitri, the liege who seemed capable of turning such improbable aspirations into reality. 
In the ensuing months, Henderson adhered steadfastly to a demanding training regimen. The physical toll was relentless, pushing him to the brink where vomiting or losing consciousness became a regular part of the ordeal. Yet, undeterred, Henderson summoned the resilience to persevere. It was through this unwavering commitment that he forged the path to his present self, a testament to the transformative power of dedication and the guidance of a minor. In the present, Henderson found himself questioning the very essence of war. He posed a poignant inquiry to his fellow soldiers, urging them to contemplate the reality of conflict where survival hinged on taking the lives of others. In this existential boundary between life and death, Henderson rejected the notion of soldiers using inadequate preparation as an excuse. He cast aside requests that dragged others down to the level of complaint, emphasizing the importance of acknowledging weaknesses and actively striving for improvement. As Henderson departed from the scene, the resonance of his words lingered, leaving his fellow soldiers momentarily speechless. The glimpse into Roman soldiers revealed a group already entrenched in the mindset of war. It spoke of an unwavering commitment, a shared understanding that transcended mere physical training. The soldiers, fueled by the unspoken camaraderie of shared purpose, were readying themselves for an impending conflict, even in the absence of its immediate manifestation. Outside this realm of warriors, other nobles observed with skepticism. They sought understanding as to why Roman and his soldiers, hailing from common birth, were expending such tremendous effort. In the shade, away from the intensity of the training grounds, these onlookers struggled to comprehend the purpose of such extreme measures. The Southern Front, far removed from the active theaters of war, seemed an unlikely place for such rigorous preparations. Among these observers was Henry, contemplating his own distance from someone like Roman. The nobles questioned the motives of Roman soldiers, deeming their efforts unnecessary. Yet, within this seemingly pointless exertion, there lay a profound truth that those born under the banner of Dimitri were striving to be acknowledged, to prove their worth even when far from the immediate battleground. Henry found himself perplexed by what he perceived as Roman's obliviousness to the benefits of dialogue and forging alliances with other nobles. He mused that this might be a common issue among nobles of common birth, a failure to recognize the importance of interpersonal connections in the complex dance of politics. The notion lingered in his thoughts as he pondered the potential repercussions of such isolationist tendencies. As the narrative shifted, we found ourselves in the grand halls of the Hector Palace, a domain where crucial decisions shaped the destiny of a kingdom. Here, Jackson, a stalwart soldier and captain of the Ranger Corps, stood before the King of Hector. In a detailed report, Jackson unveiled the meticulous efforts of the Ranger Corps, having infiltrated and investigated Cairo's southern front defense line an astonishing 48 times over the past year. Jackson's findings painted a strategic picture. The defensive strength of the southern front had been skewed towards the western front due to the ongoing confrontation with Cronist. This tactical imbalance left the southern front exposed and vulnerable. The conclusion drawn was that conquering the southern front would be a relatively straightforward endeavor. In the complex geopolitics of the continent, this revelation held significant implications for the Hector Kingdom. The narrative then delved into the historical grandeur and subsequent fall from grace experienced by Hector. Once a superpower comparable to the formidable Kronos Empire, Hector faced a devastating defeat in a war against Valhalla. This defeat marked the turning point, reducing Hector's national strength to a level on par with Cairo. The once proud kingdom, a beacon of power and influence, now found itself relegated to one of the six kingdoms, struggling to maintain relevance in the face of imperial dominance. Against this backdrop of decline, Prince Edwin Hector approached his father, the king, with a heavy heart. Edwin disclosed the harsh reality of Hector's plight, five years of consecutive poor harvests, exacerbated by the burden of repaying loans from the Golden Bank with crippling interest. The kingdom stood at the precipice of financial suffocation, and Edwin expressed deep concern that if the current trajectory continued, Hector would lose its identity as a kingdom. In a moment of poignant honesty, Edwin traced the root of Hector's troubles to a deliberate distancing from war and its historical entanglements following the ancestral defeat. However, he asserted that this self-imposed isolation must come to an end. Edwin revealed that over the past year, Hector had made extensive preparations for an inevitable confrontation. Addressing his father with a sense of urgency, Edwin presented a stark choice. War. He acknowledged the desperate state of the citizens in the kingdom itself, asserting that the time for decision had arrived. War, in Edwin's perspective, was the only recourse that could potentially salvage Hector from its downward spiral. In the chambers of Hector's royal palace, Edwin's father grappled with the weight of the word, war. 
To him, it was a term too significant to easily pass from a king's lips, especially given his son Edwin's distinct and resolute nature. Seeking affirmation, the king questioned Edwin about his confidence in pursuing war. Edwin, unyielding in his conviction, reassured his father that he wouldn't have proposed it if he lacked confidence. With a pivotal decision at hand, the king relinquished all executive authority related to the impending war to his sole heir, Edwin Hector. Taking up this newfound responsibility, Edwin conveyed his readiness to carry out the king's command. The transfer of executive authority marked a transformative moment, setting the stage for Edwin to lead Hector into the uncharted territories of conflict. In a seamless transition, the narrative shifted to the southern camp, where the culmination of a three-week training regimen brought a sense of accomplishment. Bale, the bearer of good news, joyfully informed Roman and the other soldiers who had completed the training that they were now part of the prestigious 5th Defense Line's Reserve Corps. He acknowledged that this position was highly sought after and revealed that he had utilized some influence to secure Roman's deployment to this coveted post. Grateful for the opportunity, Roman extended his thanks, but Bale, in a display of camaraderie, waved off any expressions of gratitude, assuring Roman that he could always turn to Bale if any needs arose. Beyond the confines of the training grounds, a moment of gratitude unfolded as MacBurney expressed his appreciation to Roman. The past three weeks had offered MacBurney a renewed sense of purpose, and he recognized the impact of Roman's guidance. Handing Roman a piece of paper, MacBurney explained that it contained summarized information and geographical features of the Southern Front. He hoped it would be a valuable resource in the event of war and conveyed his sincere prayers for Roman's safety. Roman, appreciating the gesture, thanked MacBurney for the thoughtful preparation. In the depths of MacBurney's emotions, a complex realization surfaced. Observing Roman over the training period, MacBurney felt a strong inclination to follow him. However, this newfound admiration was tinged with a sense of self-awareness. MacBurney, a one-armed individual lacking proficiency in swordplay, grappled with the notion that there might not be a place for him among the elite warriors under Roman's command. As MacBurney bid farewell to Roman, a sense of self-doubt clouded his departure. He believed that his presence might hinder Roman's efforts, yet the parting was marked by a gesture that spoke volumes. Roman, examining the map MacBurney had meticulously prepared, couldn't help but acknowledge the difficulty even seasoned individuals like Lucas faced in acquiring such detailed information. In MacBurney's selfless act, Roman found a source of respect, recognizing the purity of his goodwill. The narrative then shifted to the heart of the unfolding conflict, the Southern Front's first defense line. A soldier's urgent shout pierced the air as the enemy's attack began in earnest. The chaos and uncertainty of warfare unfurled, setting the stage for a tumultuous series of events. Simultaneously, the scene transitioned to the Reserve Corps base camp of the 5th Defense Line. Here, Henry grappled with the significance of his Uncle Bale's words. Bale, intentionally placing Henry in the same Reserve Corps as Roman, had impressed upon him the importance of cultivating a friendly relationship with Roman over the next two years. Henry, contemplative and uncertain about how to bridge the gap with someone like Roman, found himself thrust into a situation that demanded both strategic acumen and personal connection. The sudden blare of an emergency siren shattered the camp's tranquility, signaling Hector's declaration of war. Soldiers hurriedly prepared for the impending engagement, each moment marked by a palpable tension. However, Amidst the urgency, Henry was struck by the realization that Roman Dimitri, his intended companion on this tumultuous journey, had vanished from his immediate surroundings. As the war unfolded, the first defense line bore the brunt of Hector's initial onslaught. Hector's soldiers breached the gate, threatening the stability of this once prized bastion. Baron Bruce, the fifth defense line's commander, grappled with the severity of the situation. Baron Bruce, reflecting on the fifth defense line's transformation, lamented the loss of its true essence as a battlefield. Once hailed as the Southern Front's paradise, it had devolved into a haven of luxury for nobles who prioritized personal gain over their duty as soldiers. The corruption and neglect overseen by Baron Bruce himself had eroded the line's capacity to withstand a genuine threat. Realizing that defending the 5th defense line to the end was tantamount to suicide, Baron Bruce urgently commanded his soldiers to hold their positions. He emphasized the potential danger to innocent civilians should Hector's soldiers breach their defenses, underscoring the weight of the responsibility that rested on their shoulders. Baron Bruce's fervent pleas for his soldiers not to retreat echoed futilely. The chaos of battle engulfed the 5th defense line, and in a stark twist, Bruce himself found his resolve wavering. Instructing his soldiers to buy him time, 
he revealed his intention to personally contact the royal family, seeking reinforcements. Roman, sensing the urgency of the situation, swiftly took charge, issuing orders for all soldiers to immediately head towards the beleaguered 5th defense line. As the contingent moved with purpose, Roman contemplated the dire state of the Southern Front's overall defensive capabilities. It was a confluence of factors, degraded gear, demoralized mindsets, and an ineffective commander that rendered their military strength woefully weak. The Reserve Corps, crucial for emergencies, had been strategically positioned two hours away from the front line, adding a layer of urgency to Roman's directive. The goal was clear, reach the fifth defense line within an hour. Amidst the urgent march, Roman's eyes fell upon the figure of Baron Bruce, the commander of the 5th defense line. Bruce, seemingly detached from his soldiers, issued an order that conflicted with Roman's immediate mission. The commander instructed Roman to prioritize escorting him to the rear, asserting the perceived superiority of his own safety over the reinforcement of the 5th defense line. Roman, however, was not one to blindly follow orders without questioning. He confronted Bruce, questioning why the commander stood alone separated from his soldiers in the midst of a critical battle. Bruce, maintaining a tone of authority, scolded Roman for daring to speak out of turn. Frustration seeping through him, Roman asserted that he had heard enough. Seizing Bruce by the neck, Roman condemned the commander for abandoning his soldiers, highlighting the severe consequences of such actions. Roman emphasized that, by law, desertion could lead to on-the-spot execution, regardless of one's status. In a drastic turn of events, Driven by the gravity of the betrayal, Roman, regretfully but resolutely, ended Bruce's life on the spot. It was a stark reminder of the harsh realities of wartime decisions, where the code of honor faced the brutal necessities of survival. Despite the somber moment, Roman pressed on, resolute in his mission to reinforce the 5th defense line. The narrative pivoted to the besieged line, where a lone soldier fought valiantly against the relentless onslaught of Hector's forces. The soldier, anticipating a day when the tides of war would turn against them, now grappled with the unfathomable, a commander abandoning their post in the face of danger. In the pivotal moment when the 5th defense line hung in the balance, Roman's timely intervention disrupted the advance of Hector's soldiers. The air cleared momentarily, allowing Roman to engage in a conversation with a soldier named Stephen. Confirming his identity, Stephen received the solemn news of Baron Bruce's demise. With Bruce no longer in command, the weight of responsibility now rested squarely on Stephen's shoulders. Roman, recalling insights from Lucas, recognized Stephen as a crucial figure for the defense line. Lucas had singled out Stephen as the linchpin for this particular scenario. Demonstrating his trust in Stephen's dedication to the defense line, Roman sought Stephen's judgment. He urged Stephen to share his thoughts on how they could fortify and protect the area. Alongside this, Roman made it clear that, if all seemed lost, he, as the Reserve Corps commander, would not hesitate to order a strategic retreat. This encounter solidified for Stephen that he was in the presence of Roman Dimitri, a figure of importance. Roman expressed his reliance on Stephen's understanding of the battlefield dynamics. Stephen, assessing the strained ebb and flow of the ongoing battle, acknowledged the apparent safety in retreat. However, he also highlighted the potential strategic disadvantage of yielding a defense line to Hector, providing them with control over vital supply routes and thereby prolonging the war. Roman, faced with the grim reality, proposed an audacious plan, using railings to block the enemy's access through the gate. In this bold strategy, Roman pledged to buy the necessary time for the installation of the railings. Simultaneously, Stephen would mobilize his forces, preparing for this calculated yet risky maneuver. Stephen, taken aback by the daring nature of Roman's plan, expressed concern about the imminent danger particularly as enemy forces were charging in. Roman, however, reassured Stephen that he wasn't recklessly endangering himself. In a display of swift and seemingly effortless agility, Roman deftly dodged an incoming attack, emphasizing that he wouldn't embark on a plan deemed impossible. As Roman incapacitated an approaching enemy with a strategic maneuver, Stephen, witnessing the display of skill, found himself both astonished and silenced. Amidst the chaotic backdrop of battle, Chris, a member of the cohort, sought orders from Roman. Roman confidently outlined the plan to Chris, intending to clear a path to the gate. With a firm command, he rallied all forces to follow him. The soldiers under Roman's command displayed unwavering readiness, leaving Stephen in awe. The palpable loyalty and commitment among Roman soldiers surprised him, challenging his preconceived notions of leadership dynamics. Witnessing this, 
Stephen couldn't fathom the depth of the master-servant relationship that seemed to be built on more than mere duty. Addressing Stephen, Roman tasked him with making the necessary preparations, underlining that the war had only just commenced. As Roman soldiers seamlessly fell into formation, Stephen grasped a crucial insight. Their loyalty wasn't merely an obligation, it emanated from a profound respect for Roman. The sight on the battlefield revealed a leader whose authority wasn't asserted through dominance, but earned through mutual understanding and genuine admiration. As Roman thundered towards the Hector soldiers, his mind wrestled with a profound question. Was there truly a need for someone like him, devoid of a fervent love for his homeland, to willingly plunge into such a perilous endeavor? War, in its essence, seemed to be a grim theater where the powerless were destined to be sacrificed. Despite his current stature as a highly esteemed figure in the Cairo kingdom, Roman contemplated the privileges he had garnered as one of the formidable. It was an internal struggle, amplified by the harsh realities faced by small nations lacking in power and wealth. Amidst the clashing of swords and the chaos of battle, Roman found himself yearning for the life he had once led on the battlefield. The camaraderie of his fellow soldiers, including Chris, Kevin, and others, provided a sense of purpose. Together, they skillfully dismantled their enemies, and Roman's mere presence became a harbinger of death. The toll of his kills rose steadily, first ten, then twenty, and with each fallen opponent, the Hector soldiers underwent a transformation. At ten kills, trust among Hector's soldiers remained unshaken, but as Roman reached the twentieth, a realization dawned upon them. Their adversary was not just strong, he was an indomitable force they had never fathomed. Fear etched itself onto their faces, and whispers of Roman being a monstrous presence on the battlefield echoed among the retreating soldiers. Meanwhile, Baron McCleary, the commander of Hector's forces, stood bewildered by the sudden retreat of his soldiers. Victory had seemed assured when they breached the castle gate, and the unexpected withdrawal left McCleary grappling for an explanation. His confusion deepened as he caught sight of Roman amidst the tumult, their eyes meeting from a distance. The shock on McCleary's face mirrored the enigma of the unfolding events. Observing Roman charging ahead alone, McCleary, mired in disbelief, concluded that Roman sought his head. Arrogance, he thought, fueled such a lone assault. In response, he swiftly commanded his soldiers to converge upon Roman and take him down. The soldiers, under the assumption that Roman was isolated, rushed towards him with a collective determination to vanquish this seemingly solitary threat. However, Roman, keenly perceptive amidst the chaos, recognized the opportune moment when the enemy had let their guard down. It was a lesson learned from the numerous battlefields he had traversed. The key to swiftly concluding a war often lay in severing the head of the lead commander. As the enemies teetered on the brink of collapse, Roman discerned the pivotal moment that could turn the tide, the elimination of the commander. Charging headlong into the chaotic fray, he made a split-second decision to unleash the second move of his heavenly demon sword technique. The result was a devastating single strike that brought down a significant portion of the Hector soldiers, leaving the remaining adversaries in stunned disbelief. Witnessing the swift and efficient display of combat prowess, the Hector soldiers faltered. Their commander, McCleary, stepped forward, attempting to assert authority by identifying himself to Roman. However, Roman, fueled by his unwavering determination, wasted no time. In a seamless motion, he executed another strike, swiftly felling McCleary before he could utter another word. The battlefield echoed with the clash of steel and the cries of the fallen as Romans stood triumphant. In the midst of the chaos, Roman raised his voice, commanding the attention of the Cairo soldiers. With authority and urgency, he declared that he had successfully taken down the enemy commander. However, his tone shifted to caution as he emphasized the potential threat posed by the remaining Hector soldiers. Roman reasoned that sparing them now would only breed future adversaries for Cairo. Despite the significant loss of blood on their part, Roman rallied his soldiers, urging them to put their lives on the line and eradicate every last remnant of the enemy. On the opposing side, Henry, a witness to Roman's resolute actions, found himself grappling with a profound question. How could he approach Roman in such a state? The unexpected transformation in Roman's demeanor left Henry pondering the complexities of their camaraderie in the crucible of war. With their commander gone, the Hector soldiers faced a disheartening reality. They scattered in different directions, attempting to escape the relentless pursuit of Roman and his forces. The 5th defense line stood firm under Roman's leadership, successfully repelling the onslaught. Chris, one of Roman's trusted comrades, reported to him that none of the 30 soldiers, including himself, had incurred casualties. Roman, 
acknowledging the valor and efficiency of his soldiers, commended them for their excellent work on the battlefield. Roman's leadership extended beyond the strategic and martial aspects of the conflict. In a gesture that surprised onlookers, including the astute MacBurney, Roman generously supplied potions to all his soldiers. These magical concoctions, crafted in the Magic Tower for healing purposes, held considerable value. Even the lowest-grade potions were deemed precious, yet Roman distributed them without hesitation. Mac Burney, recognizing the layers of Roman's character, strength, decisiveness, and generosity, marveled at the intricate tapestry that wove trust among Roman, Dimitri, and the soldiers. As the dust settled on this part of the battlefield, Roman directed Stephen to oversee the aftermath and prepare for a second round of attack. In the urgency of the ongoing war, Roman felt the need for a guide familiar with the intricate terrain of the Southern Front. He relayed this requirement to Stephen, who, surprised, questioned whether Roman intended to head there immediately. Roman affirmed, emphasizing that the war was far from over and prompt action was necessary. To meet this need, Stephen introduced Roman to Kobe, a local citizen intimately acquainted with the Southern Front's topography. Roman, armed with a terrain map, sought information from Stephen regarding the fastest route to reach the rear camp. Kobe, with a deep understanding of the Southern Front's geography, proposed a route along the mountainside. Roman, relying on his knowledge, estimated that the suggested path would take approximately two hours and thirty minutes. However, ever the strategist, Roman expressed the need for a shortcut, aiming to expedite his arrival to within a mere two hours. Kobe, surprised by Roman's accurate estimation of the mountain route's duration, pondered how Roman possessed such specific knowledge. It dawned on Kobe that this was not a mere speculative comment. Roman had an intimate grasp of the Southern Front's terrain, raising questions about the extent of Roman's prior experiences or studies. In response to Kobe's astonishment, Roman clarified his position. While he had familiarized himself with basic information, Roman admitted that his understanding was not exhaustive. Hence, he sought the aid of a local like Kobe, whose intimate knowledge would complement Roman's preparations. It became evident that Roman's intentions extended beyond the conventional expectations of a noble seeking an easy military life. His meticulous approach, grounded in a nuanced understanding of the situation, left a lasting impression on Kobe. Kobe, realizing that Roman's motives were more altruistic and strategic than those of other nobles who sought comfort in the southern front, began to see a glimmer of hope for the region. The arrival of someone like Roman, with a genuine interest in making a positive impact, sparked a sense of optimism within Kobe. He believed that, with Roman's assistance, even the beleaguered Southern Front could find a path towards a better future. As Roman emerged from the room, the atmosphere shifted. Chris, one of Roman's trusted comrades, informed him that a contingent of 30 soldiers, including himself, stood ready for departure. The efficiency and preparedness of Roman's forces spoke volumes about the camaraderie and discipline instilled by their leader. Amidst the readiness of his soldiers, another unexpected figure entered the scene, Henry Albert. Roman, visibly intrigued by Henry's sudden appearance, questioned his presence and sought an explanation. In the midst of tension and anger, Roman fixed Henry with a hard stare, demanding an explanation for his presence. It was a confrontation fraught with the unspoken understanding that Roman would not take kindly to any ulterior motives. In Henry's mind, the possibility of revealing his true purpose, getting close to Roman, loomed like an impending dismissal. Nevertheless, Henry opted for a different approach. With a deep breath, Henry acknowledged his prior mistake and offered a sincere apology. Yet, he quickly pivoted to pledge his loyalty to Roman, emphasizing his commitment as a nobleman from Cairo. In a display of deference, Henry bowed, articulating that, like Roman, he couldn't remain passive in the unfolding events. Roman, wearing a serious expression, granted Henry permission to follow but issued a stern warning. Any interference with Roman's plans would not be tolerated. As the uneasy duo, with Kobe leading, made their way towards the southern front through the mountain route, they stumbled upon an injured soldier from the southern training camp. Concern etched across Roman's face, he sought details about the attack. The soldier, visibly shaken, revealed that the training camp had been assaulted. Roman's sharp mind deduced that it was the rear, not the front line, that had faced the brunt of the attack. Soldiers from the training center, fleeing to their current location, hinted that the attack had occurred approximately 30 minutes ago. The Kingdom of Hector, it seemed, was employing a strategic onslaught against Cairo's five lines of defense, utilizing a fast-moving unit to orchestrate a synchronized assault. The realization hit Roman like a lightning bolt. 
In a decisive moment, he ordered his soldiers to divert immediately to the southern training camp. The urgency in his command underscored the gravity of the situation. The scene transitioned seamlessly to the beleaguered southern training camp. Amidst the chaos, two Hector soldiers found amusement in tormenting MacBurney. Anger ignited in MacBurney's eyes as he demanded an end to the mockery. Unfazed, he declared his unwavering resolve to face any challenge head on, vowing to risk his life to eliminate even one Hector soldier. MacBurney, undeterred by the odds, beckoned the Hector soldiers to confront him. Yet, amidst this tumult, MacBurney's thoughts strayed to his missing right arm. A pang of longing for the strength he once possessed surged through him. His mind also echoed with questions about Roman's whereabouts. In the chaos of the southern front, where tension gripped everyone, Roman stood out as the only one who hadn't let go. Roman, designated to the fifth line of defense, was conspicuously absent. MacBurney, grappling with the unfolding crisis, couldn't shake off the feeling that Roman's presence was crucial, especially in maintaining the much-needed composure. MacBurney's thoughts raised as he faced the imminent threat of death. In the chaotic whirlwind of combat, one name echoed in his mind, Sir Roman. MacBurney couldn't help but wonder why Sir Roman hadn't taken action yet. It was a moment of reflection that hinted at MacBurney's detachment from the battlefield, a realization that perhaps his own fate was drawing near. As the tension mounted, a sudden shattering of the wall behind the Hector soldiers shifted the dynamics of the battlefield. To the surprise of the Hector soldiers, there stood Roman Dimitri, a formidable figure radiating an air of command. Roman's presence provided a glimmer of hope in the dire situation. Glancing to the side, Roman locked eyes with MacBurney, who, against the odds, was still standing. Swiftly assessing the situation, Chris, a trusted ally of Roman, issued a decisive command to the soldiers. They were to wipe out the enemy soldiers and rescue any survivors. The atmosphere on the battlefield shifted as Roman and his forces unleashed their full might in response to Chris's orders. Amidst the fray, a few Hector soldiers, undeterred by the overwhelming force against them, made a desperate attempt to attack Roman. In a calculated move, Roman employed a special technique, surrounded by a mysterious purple aura. The technique had a paralyzing effect, freezing the Hector soldiers in their tracks. Roman's intention was clear. He sought to capture these soldiers alive, an approach that spoke volumes about his strategic mindset on the battlefield. As the paralyzed soldiers lay immobilized, Roman knew their incapacity would buy precious time. However, one resilient Hector soldier, driven by the instinct to escape, attempted to flee. MacBurney, showing remarkable resilience despite his earlier brushes with mortality, swiftly intercepted the escaping soldier. In a display of combat prowess, MacBurney subdued the soldier, putting them in a headlock and swiftly bringing them down. Acknowledging MacBurney's efforts, Roman approached him, expressing gratitude for a job well done. He encouraged MacBurney to take a break, recognizing the toll the intense battle had taken on him. As MacBurney succumbed to exhaustion and passed out, Roman took charge of the remaining tasks, ensuring the safety of the survivors and the containment of the Hector soldiers. With the immediate threats neutralized, Chris reported back to Roman. The outcome was a success. Twelve Hector soldiers were eliminated, and five survivors were rescued. According to the survivors' accounts, Vale, a prominent figure among the Hector forces, had fled to the mountains, nursing injuries from the fierce engagement. In the aftermath of the battle, Roman's thoughts delved into the strategic implications of Hector's actions. He speculated that the assault on the southern training camp might have been a diversion, a prelude to their larger plans. The Hector soldiers they faced were only a fraction of the main unit numbering in the several hundreds. Roman questioned Chris about the captured soldiers and, with a stern directive, allowed only Chris access to the building where they were held captive. Roman, now focused on unraveling the mysteries behind Hector's actions, entered the building with a sense of purpose. He believed there must be a deeper reason for Hector to resort to the strategies outlined in the sacred book. Facing the captive soldiers, Roman set the ominous tone by offering them a slim chance for a painless end. They had three minutes to provide the answers he sought. Otherwise, they would endure unimaginable pain until their demise. A defiant soldier challenged Roman, goading him to end their lives immediately. Unfazed, Roman initiated the interrogation with a simple yet crucial question. What was the goal of the kingdom of Hector? The soldier, instead of answering, met the inquiry with a defiant smile. Unperturbed, Roman pressed on with a second question. Why did the Hector soldiers attack the southern training camp? The soldier's silence persisted, and Roman declared that their three minutes were up. With the same mysterious technique emanating a purple aura, Roman touched the soldier's shoulder, 
eliciting anguish screams. Roman detailed the pain as muscles splitting and bones fracturing, emphasizing the inevitable approach of death. In the face of excruciating torment, Roman acknowledged the soldier's likely training to withstand torture. However, he asserted that divulging information wouldn't alter the outcome of Hector's operation. One soldier, boldly resigned to their fate, claimed it was too late to stop Hector's plan, even if they cooperated. Roman, with a sinister expression, revealed the truth. He never sought the soldiers' genuine answers. Instead, he orchestrated the encounter to observe their reactions. With a victorious guess, Roman unveiled that the true purpose of the meeting was the rear. The revelation sent shockwaves through the captive soldier. Roman, taking advantage of the moment, swiftly subdued the soldier. Roman contemplated the broader implications of Hector's cunning tactics. Reflecting on the situation, Roman discerned that the simultaneous attack on the southern front had been a diversion. The realization struck him with the gravity of the broader conflict. If Hector's operation succeeded, the southern front, a vital strategic position, would be on the brink of destruction. The narrative transitions to a room where Roman directs MacBurney to provide a detailed account of the events at the southern training camp. MacBurney begins by revealing that the kingdom of Hector initiated an attack just two hours prior. Engaged in his routine preparations for the upcoming rider's training, MacBurney was caught off guard when Hector's soldiers, seemingly out of nowhere, launched a sudden assault on the southern training camp. In response to the surprise attack, MacBurney and his comrades swiftly mobilized troops, attempting to counter the intrusion. However, the disparity in power proved overwhelming, resulting in the brutal slaughter of the southern camp's forces. Amidst the chaos, uncertainty loomed regarding the fate of Bale, the commander of the training camp, adding another layer of concern to the unfolding situation. Roman, seeking strategic insights, turns his attention to the specifics of the enemy's armor. He questions MacBurney about any distinctive features he noticed. MacBurney recounts that Hector's soldiers were lightly armed, and the individual who appeared to be the enemy commander bore a face covered in scars. Roman, drawing connections from his knowledge, suggests that these soldiers might be the renowned rangers of Hector's kingdom. MacBurney, taken aback by this revelation, recognizes the leader of the rangers as a decorated veteran with scars earned in numerous wars, emblematic of his experience and prowess on the battlefield. However, the motive behind Hector's audacious attack on the southern training camp remains elusive, prompting MacBurney to express his confusion. He questions why Hector, with a clear advantage, wouldn't direct their forces to topple the front line instead of targeting the training camp. Furthermore, MacBurney is perplexed by the fact that Hector's soldiers, instead of pressing forward, chose to retreat after the assault. In response, Roman provides a crucial piece of the puzzle. Roman explains that the camp, situated on the way to the rear position, left Hector with no choice but to attack it. This insight offers a new perspective for MacBurney, who begins to grasp the intricacies of the situation. However, it also raises more questions, and MacBurney, still in the dark about Hector's true intentions, seeks further clarification. Roman, sensing the need to reveal the hidden truth, discloses that Hector's attack on the front line was merely a deceptive maneuver. The real objective was to secure the rear position, which, to MacBurney's astonishment, housed a warp gate. In a moment of realization, MacBurney understands the gravity of the situation. A warp gate, Roman explains, is a magical crystal that manipulates space, allowing for instantaneous travel. Beyond obstructing enemy reinforcements, possessing warp gates on the battlefield has evolved into a crucial strategic advantage as now Hector have the capability to reset the coordinates of the warp gate under their control. This extraordinary ability enables them to execute a reverse attack, making the warp gate a formidable asset. However, to counter any potential threats, the warp gate is equipped with a self-destruct device, a testament to the intricate and high-stakes nature of the ongoing conflict. Roman, the key strategist in this narrative, reveals to MacBurney the depth of Hector's commitment to victory. The kingdom has devised a must-win strategy, one that hinges on successfully securing the warp gate located in the rear. This tactical move is considered paramount, with the assurance that victory will be within their grasp if executed effectively. Upon learning of this critical strategy, MacBurney, ever the practical thinker, suggests that they should move swiftly to assist the rear troops. However, Rome encounters this instinct, questioning whether MacBurney has received any requests for assistance from the rear. The revelation that Hector's ranger unit, a formidable force, left the southern training camp an hour and a half ago leaves little room for optimism. Roman asserts that, by now, the warp gate may have already fallen into the hands of the enemy, 
effectively isolating all forces on the southern front. This revelation underscores the dire circumstances that Roman and his companions now find themselves in. As the realization sinks in that they won't have the kingdom's support from this point forward, Roman emphasizes the need for survival. The stakes are higher than ever for Roman and his companions. The narrative then transitions to the Hector border, where Edwin, a key figure on the opposing side, stands before the warp gate. The scene provides a glimpse into the calculated moves of Hector's forces. A soldier delivers a report to Edwin, detailing the progress of Hector soldiers as they approach the rear of Cairo, passing through the southern training camp. The kingdom of Cairo, unaware of Hector's strategic maneuvers, is engrossed in defending their line. Edwin, demonstrating a keen understanding of the psychological aspects of warfare, cautions against complacency. He orders the soldiers to persist in their attacks on Cairo's defensive position, emphasizing the need to wear down the opponent's resolve. Edwin's strategic acumen comes to the forefront as he reveals the central importance of the existing wall in front of Hector. Success in the ongoing operation is contingent on preserving this crucial barrier. In a reflective moment, Edwin acknowledges the past infiltrations of Jackson's Ranger unit into the Southern Front. While he contemplates the potential for a swift victory if Hector had initiated a full-scale attack on the Southern Front from the beginning, but the most important thing for Hector now is the existence of the Warp Gate. Edwin issues a stark directive to the soldiers under his command. Contingent on a worst-case scenario, he instructs them to be prepared to destroy the Warp Gate, a potent asset that could turn the tide of battle. Edwin's mind, ever calculating, envisions the potential failure of the operation and the dire consequences of Hector resorting to the destruction of the Warp Gate, triggering the initiation of the second phase of their strategic plan. This decision is not taken lightly, and a soldier observing Edwin's rational yet harsh judgment contemplates the gravity of the man known as the Cald of Hector. Edwin Hector's presence carries weight, embodying the resurgence and revitalization of the Hector's kingdom in the face of challenging circumstances. The narrative then shifts to the rear end of Cairo, where Hector's soldiers are actively engaged in an attack. The commander of the Hector Rangers, recognizing the urgency of the situation, declares that the time for war has arrived. Their primary objective is clear, to establish a connection without alerting the enemy to the existence of the warp gate. The success of this mission holds the key to Hector's strategic advantage and potential victory. The story takes a temporal leap to a year ago, unveiling a pivotal conversation between Edwin and Jackson, the commander of the Rangers. Edwin, acknowledging the kingdom of Hector's vulnerability, highlights the escalating pressure from Golden Bank and the looming threat of a depleted national treasury due to recurring poor harvests. In a move that underscores the desperation of Hector's predicament, Edwin proposes a partnership to Jackson. He suggests that Jackson takes charge of the southern front of the Kingdom of Cairo alongside Edwin. The urgency of this proposal is heightened by rumors that Hector's ongoing poor harvests have invoked the wrath of the gods, casting a shadow over the kingdom's fate. Edwin, recognized as a genius in Hector's history, understands the chaotic age they find themselves in. In a twist of fate, he believes that a hero must rise to meet the challenges that this tumultuous era presents. Within a remarkably short span of time, Hector's forces undertake a meticulous series of actions. They scout the southern front 48 times, employing spies to dig tunnels in the rear positions. The ranger unit, with strategic precision, infiltrates the completed tunnels, gaining access to the coveted warp gate. Returning to the present, the culmination of these efforts materializes as Jackson and his soldiers successfully establish a connection with the warp gate. Through the swirling portal emerges Prince Edwin, a key player in the unfolding drama. Edwin, with strategic foresight, allocates responsibilities. He leaves the 1st Battalion in the capable hands of Killian, instructing him to handle the remnants of the rear positions and fortify defenses in anticipation of support from the Kingdom of Cairo. However, amid this moment of strategic clarity, a note of uncertainty creeps in. Edwin approaches Jackson, revealing a concerning development, the loss of contact with Baron McCleary, who held a critical role in charge of the 5th line of defense. Edwin turned to Jackson, questioning his knowledge of the unfolding situation. Jackson, the commander in Edwin's ranks, informed Edwin that his soldiers were currently in the process of verifying the facts. Trying to allay Edwin's concerns, Jackson assured him that the situation only pertained to the fifth line of defense and not to any critical areas. In his assessment, Jackson speculated that the fifth defense line, known for its historical challenges, might succumb to an attack with just a few troops. 
Edwin acknowledged that he would have instructed Jackson to proceed with the attack regardless of the circumstances. Jackson agreed, understanding the gravity of the directive. However, Edwin revealed a stern resolution. He asserted that once the operation concluded, regardless of Baron McCleary's performance, consequences awaited. Despite Edwin's meticulous planning, he had failed to account for two unforeseen variables. The complexity of the situation became apparent as they navigated through the intricacies of the evolving battlefield. The narrative then shifted to the first line of defense in Cairo, where soldiers conveyed a message to Count Donald, the commander in charge. They had received a call from the southern training camp. Count Donald promptly attended to the call, finding Roman from the fifth line of defense on the other end. Roman, getting straight to the point, shared critical information. It seemed that the Kingdom of Hector was employing a smokescreen strategy to capture the warp gate in the rear position. In anticipation of being isolated by enemy forces from both the front and back, they made the strategic decision to abandon the castle and retreat to the mountains. Roman emphasized the urgency of gathering all remaining forces on the mountain. Count Donald, considering the challenging terrain of the southern mountains, expressed concern about the difficulty of the task. Nevertheless, he assured Roman that he would personally assess the situation and then ended the call. Roman pondered the implications of this decision, realizing that, in this scenario, all defense lines except the fifth will be discarded. Roman swiftly directed the soldiers to pack their belongings as they are heading to the mountains. The narrative pivots to the first defense line in Cairo, where Donald, the commander, grapples with the challenge of connecting to the rear camp. Despite his attempts, he finds it difficult to establish communication. Recalling Roman's earlier caution, Donald acknowledges that even with troops sent from the southern front and nearby areas, it would take an estimated month for them to arrive. Frustration mounts as he contemplates whether there might be an alternative solution to their predicament. It occurs to him that if he can hold out in the fortress until reinforcements arrive, there's a chance they can turn the tide in their favor. Fast forward four hours, and Donald is taken aback to discover that they are now completely isolated. Hector's forces, seizing Cairo's warp gate and sending additional troops, have effectively cut off their defense lines both in the front and rear. Despite the dire circumstances, Donald regains composure and notes that his soldiers have expertly repaired the fortress walls. Armaments are meticulously prepared, a lesson learned from the errors of their initial battle. With these preparations, Donald believes they can endure the siege within the fortress and orders his soldiers to brace for an impending attack. In a briefing to the first defense troops, Donald delivers the sobering news that Hector has taken control of the warp gate, leaving them entirely cut off with no hope of reinforcement from the kingdom. However, drawing from their strategy in the first battle, Donald instills hope, emphasizing their commitment to enduring until reinforcements arrive. To their astonishment, as they launch their counterattack, they realize that Hector has a weapon flare in their possession. Hector initiates the use of the flare, effectively breaching the fortress walls in a matter of moments. In the ensuing chaos, Donald and his soldiers find themselves swiftly overwhelmed. In that critical instant, Donald's mind revisits Roman's cautionary words, realizing the validity of Roman Dimitri's foresight. Swiftly thereafter, Edwin executes a decisive strike, triumphantly overthrowing Count Donald and seizing command of the southern front line. Edwin, reflecting on the advantage gained by using the flare to initiate the attack, acknowledges that they were able to occupy the fortress with minimal losses. From Edwin's perspective, Hector is positioned to seamlessly conquer the entire southern front. He concludes that time is working in Hector's favor in this unfolding conflict. Edwin commands his soldiers to secure all surrendered foes in a designated area, aiming to prevent any unexpected threats to Hector. The objective is to amass as much ammunition as possible for negotiations with Cairo. Jackson approves of the plan, and Edwin initially deems it flawless. However, a sense of unease begins to gnaw at him as he considers potential oversights. The calm is shattered by a soldier delivering distressing news. Baron MacLeary has fallen on the battlefield, disrupting communication channels. Edwin, now wearing a grave expression, presses the soldier for details and demands the immediate presence of the individual who provided this information. Edwin approached the weary soldier, seeking information on the recent events at the 5th defense line. The soldier recounted that, initially, the defense line appeared ill-prepared for any attack. However, when Hector launched his assault, the unpreparedness became apparent. Hector managed to breach the fortress, prompting Baron McCleary to issue a swift order for its destruction. The soldier, a hint of fear in his eyes, then revealed that a monstrous entity had appeared. 
Edwin, taken aback by this unexpected turn, listened intently as the soldier described the terrifying power of the creature. The monster had single-handedly taken down numerous soldiers in the blink of an eye. Even the elite Aura Knights of Hector were powerless against the beast, succumbing to a single strike. The revelation of this formidable adversary left Edwin astonished. As the soldier continued his account, it became clear that the appearance of the monster had turned the tide of the battle. Hector, despite his initial success in breaching the fortress, ultimately lost the confrontation. Edwin, grappling with this shocking information, realized that despite his meticulous year-long preparations, an unforeseen variable had disrupted the carefully laid plans, Roman Dimitri, Cairo's youngest ranker. Leaving the soldier behind, Edwin made his way through the aftermath of the battlefield. Thoughts swirled in his mind as he contemplated the implications of the monster's intervention. He knew that negotiations and strategic decisions were now critical to navigate this unexpected challenge. Back at the command center, Edwin summoned Jackson to provide a report on the current situation. Jackson conveyed that they had thoroughly checked the 5th defense line, only to find it abandoned by Cairo soldiers. Speculating that the soldiers might have withdrawn into the mountains, Jackson proposed forming a pursuit squad. However, Edwin, mindful of the changing tides in Hector's advantageous position, declined the suggestion. Acknowledging that negotiations with the Cairo kingdom were now imperative, Edwin decided to shift his focus. The time for a diplomatic resolution had come, considering Hector's control over the southern front. The decision was made to engage in talks and explore potential avenues for reconciliation. The narrative transitioned to the Cairo royal family palace, where King Daniel's frustration mirrored the tumultuous events on the battlefield. Unable to make decisions independently, King Daniel was beholden to the approval of powerful aristocrats to mobilize troops. The atmosphere in the palace was tense as they awaited the arrival of crucial figures. Marquis Benedict, arriving late with a smile despite the circumstances, explained that his horse carriage had encountered unexpected trouble. Following him were representatives from opposing factions, Count Denver from the Provalhalla faction and Count Gregory from the Proconos faction. Each faction held considerable influence in the political landscape, further complicating the decision-making process. In a tense meeting, Daniel delivered unsettling news to the assembled group. The Hector Kingdom had boldly crossed Cairo's borders, launching an ambush on the unsuspecting camps. The consequences were dire, especially for the Southern Front, which now teetered on the brink of danger. Marquis, quick to respond, suggested sending immediate reinforcements to counter the unexpected assault. However, Daniel, wearing a stern expression, responded that he would assume there were prior agreements in place to dispatch reinforcements promptly. The gravity of the situation escalated as a soldier entered with distressing information. Hector had successfully taken control of Cairo's warp gate. Benedict, one of the attendees, could hardly believe this revelation. The command system, initially split into four, had now morphed into a more significant issue, raising concerns about the kingdom's overall vulnerability. Frustration radiated from Daniel as he questioned the group about how they intended to take responsibility for the unfolding crisis. He expressed his belief that had he been granted decision-making authority from the start, the Southern Front wouldn't be facing such imminent peril. Blame was cast upon everyone seated at the table, with Daniel emphasizing that their collective actions had contributed to the current predicament. Amidst the heated discussion, a soldier burst into the room, announcing a magical communication from Hector. The group hastily convened for the call, during which Edwin, a key figure from Hector, disclosed Hector's demands. Compensation for the war was the price, with Edwin insisting on a gold payment equivalent to what they believed Cairo's southern front was worth. Benedict and Denver, representing opposing factions, voiced their frustration and questioned the reasonableness of Edwin's demand. They highlighted the unjust nature of the war and accused Edwin of orchestrating the conflict from the outset. The tension in the virtual meeting room was palpable as the leaders grappled with the ultimatum laid before them. Edwin, unwavering in his stance, imposed a strict three-day deadline. Failure to meet the demands within this time frame would result in the absorption of Cairo's southern front into Hector's dominion. The severity of the consequence was underscored by Edwin's chilling warning against any attempts by Cairo to employ delaying tactics, threatening the lives of hostages from the southern front. As the magical call concluded, the complex state of affairs within Hector came to light. Economic challenges, including poor harvests and delayed payments to the Golden Bank, were depleting Hector's resources. Edwin, despite no longer occupying the starring role in Hector, contemplated the suffering of the commoners. 
Determined to protect his people, he embraced a sinister resolve, willing to become the devil of the era if that was what it took to secure the safety and well-being of those under his care. As tensions gripped the war room, Daniel faced the grim reality that the enemy now held control of the warp gate. In a resigned tone, he declared that their only recourse was to concede to the demands of the Hector kingdom. The reward sought by Hector seemed to be the only plausible path to minimize their losses. Benedict, however, voiced concerns, anticipating that Hector's financial demands would likely be exorbitant. He questioned if there were any alternatives available. An air of frustration permeated the room as Daniel, in an outburst of anger, implored others to share if they had any countermeasures. The response was an unsettling silence, prompting Daniel to reflect on the irony that despite the internal conflicts within Cairo, when confronted with a genuine crisis, they appeared utterly helpless. The gravity of the situation was not lost on him, as he reluctantly suggested accepting the terms laid out by the Hector Kingdom. Count Denver, however, offered a dissenting opinion. He drew attention to Roman Dimitri, a key player stationed in the Southern Front. According to a recent report, Roman had successfully defended Cairo's fifth line of defense. Denver believed that if Roman could influence the course of the war, Cairo stood a fighting chance. Despite acknowledging Roman's skill, Daniel remained skeptical, emphasizing that while Roman, a three-star swordsman in his twenties, was undoubtedly valuable, he alone couldn't alter the war's trajectory. Marquis Benedict sided with Daniel, underscoring the importance of Roman Dimitri as the future of the Cairo kingdom. Benedict argued for prioritizing the reduction of losses over risking the talents of the kingdom in feudal endeavors. Denver, however, hinted that the true extent of Roman Dimitri's abilities might not be apparent to everyone. Information from the Provalhalla faction suggested Roman possessed talents exceeding those of a typical four-star swordsman. Denver believed that Roman represented the variable capable of turning the tide of the war. Despite his conviction, he chose not to divulge this information to the gathered assembly. While refraining from imposing his viewpoint, Denver requested a mere three days to demonstrate the potential impact of Roman Dimitri. As the weight of the impending decision pressed on Daniel, he proposed a pragmatic approach. If there's no opposition in the southern front within the next three days, then they should consider accepting Hector's terms. This decision was not made lightly. Daniel understood the urgency of the situation and wanted to prepare for all possibilities. For Cairo Kingdom, a delicate balance between war and negotiation was being struck. The narrative then shifted to the first line of Cairo's defense, where Henry found himself facing an unexpected setback. The initial defense line had been taken out by Hector's forces. This shocking revelation prompted Henry to issue an immediate order for his soldiers to retreat to the mountains. In a moment of reflection, Henry contemplated the fleeting nature of fame, realizing that survival took precedence over any desire for renown. With urgency, Henry and his soldiers hastily made their way into the refuge of the mountains. It was in this moment of uncertainty that Chris, one of Roman's knights, emerged. He directed Henry and his soldiers to maintain silence, leading them through the mountainous terrain discreetly. Henry, puzzled by Chris's unexpected presence, questioned Roman's whereabouts. After all, Roman was supposed to be stationed at the rear. To Henry's surprise, they stumbled upon a hidden encampment constructed by Roman in the heart of the mountains. Chris explained that Roman, perceiving the collapse of the rear position, had strategically established this secret hideout. The revelation shed light on Roman's foresight and strategic thinking. Concerned about the rear position's collapse, Henry suggested immediate retreat and questioned the choice of building a hideout in this specific location. In response, Chris, with a serious demeanor, clarified that the war was far from over. The hideout served a strategic purpose, defending against potential enemy advances up the mountains. However, Chris issued a chilling warning. Should Henry align himself with Hector, Chris would not hesitate to end his life then and there. This revelation left Henry bewildered and fearful, contemplating the mysterious prowess of the Dimitri family. Henry inquires of Chris about Roman's whereabouts. It has been a considerable amount of time since Henry last saw Roman. Chris informs Henry that Roman is presently engaged in confronting the enemy on the front line. The scene transitioned to the front line, where the remaining Cairo soldiers engaged in a fierce struggle against Hector's forces. Brant, the front line officer, recognized the gravity of the situation. Survival was paramount, not just for himself, but for the troops he led. In the heart of the battle, Brant, a soldier on the first line of defense, found himself grappling with a grim reality. The troops were dying mercilessly due to the baseless arrogance of their commander, Donald. The weight of this futile struggle led Brant to believe that the end was near. 
However, in a surprising twist, hope emerged in the form of Roman, who appeared seemingly out of nowhere to rescue the beleaguered knights. Caught in a moment of desperation, Roman found himself surrounded by Hector soldiers. To their surprise, Roman skillfully took down every opponent that dared to challenge him. Grant, witnessing this display of prowess, couldn't help but be shocked and wondered about the identity of this mysterious savior who seemed to effortlessly defy the odds. Approaching Brandt, Roman calmly introduced himself as a reserve from the fifth line of defense, Roman Dimitri. This revelation led Brandt to speculate that Roman had been the one who suggested to Donald the idea of a strategic retreat. Contrary to this assumption, Roman had arrived on the scene not to abandon their post, but to save them from the encroaching Hector forces. Despite sustaining injuries, Brandt, filled with gratitude, stood up and expressed his appreciation to Roman for his timely intervention. As Brandt briefed Roman on the dire situation, he revealed that the first line of defense had already collapsed, and Hector's forces had successfully advanced to the second line. Brandt, with a sense of foreboding, predicted that the second line wouldn't hold for long against the relentless onslaught of the Hector kingdom. In response to Brandt's grim assessment, Roman queried whether Brandt was suggesting surrender. While acknowledging Roman's exceptional swordsmanship, Brandt argued that in a war between kingdoms, facing the might of the Hector kingdom was an impossible feat for a lone warrior like Roman. Undeterred, Roman delved into contemplation, analyzing the situation at hand. Roman observed that the actions of the Hector kingdom, setting ambushes, and engaging in war, seemed incongruent with their current circumstances. In a moment of deduction, Roman proposed that Hector's true motive was to swiftly capture the southern front. Recognizing that Hector couldn't sustain a prolonged war, they aimed to create a crisis in the country and then resolve it through war. The complexity of Hector's motives became clearer to Roman. The goal was to take control of the southern front entirely, setting the stage for more favorable negotiations with Cairo's royal family. In Roman's analysis, Hector's actions were part of a calculated gamble, a strategic maneuver with the fate of an entire country hanging in the balance. As the narrative transitions to the second defense line in the southern front, the relentless siege orchestrated by Hector soldiers unfolds. Flares pierce the night sky, illuminating the tactical maneuvers aimed at breaching the fortress walls. Amidst this chaotic scene, the soldiers skillfully ambush their adversaries. In the midst of the siege, Edwin's mind is occupied by the intricacies of his plan. He ponders the significance of Baron McCleary's survival, recognizing it as a linchpin in the vulnerability of the fifth defense line. Yet, a shadow of uncertainty creeps in as he contemplates the strength of Roman Dimitri. Edwin questions whether Roman's might could single-handedly thwart Hector's forces. While acknowledging that Hector might face challenges against Roman, Edwin remains cautious, understanding that Hector is not a force easily subdued by an individual, no matter how formidable. However, the unfolding drama takes an unexpected turn as a messenger interrupts Edwin's contemplation. The soldier rushes in, bearing troubling news, Hector has lost contact with the first squadrons tasked with dealing with remnants of the enemy soldiers. The gravity of the situation deepens as it becomes evident that not only the first squadron but also the second and third squadrons are unresponsive. Edwin, taken aback by this sudden development, connects the ominous feeling he had sensed earlier to the actions of Roman Dimitri. Jackson, reporting to Edwin, sheds light on the sequence of events. After Hector successfully breached the first defense line, Jackson ordered the 3rd Squadron to handle the remnants of the enemy forces. However, communication with the 3rd Squadron was abruptly severed an hour ago, signaling a potential and sinister outcome. The enemy may have successfully eliminated them. The impact of this revelation is significant, with Edwin realizing the dire consequences of his worries turning into reality. The estimated loss for Hector stands at approximately 300 men. Edwin's certainty grows and he identifies Roman Dimitri as the mastermind behind these attacks. The revelation strikes a chord with Edwin. Roman, instead of opting for an escape over the mountain, has chosen to remain on the southern front, confronting Edwin directly. Edwin, cognizant of the potential threat Roman poses, communicates the urgency of addressing this unexpected variable to Jackson. Leaving Roman unchecked, Edwin asserts, will undoubtedly lead to further complications. Jackson, however, downplays Roman's significance, dismissing him as a trivial variable. He contends that Hector's overarching objective, the success of their siege, should not be significantly impacted by the attention diverted towards Roman Dimitri. In the intricate dance of war, Edwin's priorities diverged from Hector's overarching plan. 
While the success of Hector's strategy relied on the destruction of the remaining defense camps, Edwin's focus sharpened on the elimination of Roman Dimitri, the enigmatic factor disrupting his meticulous plans. With a sinister look, Edwin conveyed his altered priorities to Jackson, instructing an immediate retreat for the soldiers positioned on the second defense line. Jackson, perplexed by Edwin's unwavering fixation on Roman Dimitri, questioned the depth of this obsession. The commander's decision seemed to defy the conventional wisdom of prioritizing the conquest of defense lines over singular adversaries. As night fell, the collective might of Hector's soldiers gathered around the mountains. Edwin's conviction that Roman Dimitri lurked within this rugged terrain stemmed from countless hours spent scrutinizing plans over the past year. It was an instinctive certainty, a gut feeling that Roman Dimitri posed a significant threat. Addressing the assembled soldiers, Edwin acknowledged the thoughts racing through their minds. While dealing with the conquered defense lines might be a priority for the soldiers, Edwin stressed that the worst-case scenario lay in the existence of Roman Dimitri. The unexpected variables Roman introduced to Hector's meticulously crafted plans made him the chief concern in Edwin's eyes. Jackson, privy to Edwin's strategic insights, recognized that there was always a method to Edwin's decisions. The soldiers, loyal to their commander, echoed their acceptance of Edwin's orders with resounding shouts. Edwin, seizing the moment, declared it was time to hunt down the Cairo soldiers. However, the vastness of the southern mountain range posed a challenge. Edwin feared that if Hector's soldiers scoured the entire area, the enemy could slip away unnoticed. Edwin's strategic acumen came into play as he decided to adopt a methodical approach. Rather than searching the entire expanse at once, he chose to deploy Hector's forces from the base of the mountain, gradually closing in toward the summit. This method aimed to prevent the enemy from slipping through the cracks, ensuring a systematic sweep of the terrain. As the soldiers began ascending the mountains, commanders emphasized the importance of blowing the whistle upon detecting any signs of the enemy. The strategy was clear, corner the enemy and minimize losses for Hector. The soldiers, armed with determination and a sense of purpose, scanned the surroundings with heightened vigilance, fully aware of the gravity of their mission. In the blink of an eye, a Hector soldier vanished, as if swept away by the wind. His comrades, seemingly undisturbed, failed to notice anything suspicious. However, the normalcy shattered when the realization struck. All the other Hector soldiers had disappeared, leaving one lone soldier bewildered and alone. As he fumbled to blow the whistle, an unseen force struck from behind, and Roman emerged, swiftly incapacitating the soldier before the whistle could sound. Roman, in that fleeting moment, contemplated the unexpected turn of events. He had anticipated gaining a significant advantage during Hector's assault on the defense camp. Yet, Hector's decision to forsake the second defense line solely to impede Roman's progress showcased a level of boldness that caught him off guard. Roman couldn't help but marvel at the strategic prowess of Hector's commander, recognizing an extraordinary mind at work. The Hector soldiers, now aware of the enemy's presence, began searching for their missing comrades. Their objective was clear, cut off any potential retreat routes and drive the enemy soldiers into a corner. However, Roman, with a sinister glare and unmatched swiftness, disrupted their plans by taking down the soldier commander who was orchestrating the troops. In the aftermath of this ambush, Roman's expression transformed into one of controlled chaos. Memories flooded back to a time long ago, to his previous life as Beck Jung, one of the Heavenly Demon's Twelve Sons. These sons endured the harshest environments and relentless trials merely because of their lineage. Beck Jung, in his former life, undertook a mission to pursue a low-ranking demonic follower causing chaos within the cult. Successfully completing the mission in a mere three days, Beck Jung soon found himself facing even more formidable challenges. Confronted with an opponent seemingly insurmountable, Beck Jung sought an alternative approach. His search led him to the reports of the demonic cult, unveiling the martial arts of the Night King. Once a humble thief, the Night King mastered the art of utilizing darkness, rising to prominence as the infamous Great Thief. The Night King, despite meeting a grisly end for his covetous sins according to the Heavenly Demon's report, left an enduring legacy in the annals of Miram's history. Intrigued by the Night King's techniques, Beck Jung delved into their intricacies, employing every available means to execute missions with precision. A year later, having dispatched 38 martial masters, Beck Jung earned the ominous moniker of the Shadow Phantom within the demonic cult, embodying the essence of darkness itself. Fast forward to the present, where Hector soldiers found themselves engulfed in darkness, unable to discern their adversaries' whereabouts. The Aura Knights, realizing the peril, ordered a strategic retreat. However, Roman, 
With a lethal gaze and a determination to make Hector rue their intrusion into the mountains, harness the Night King's techniques. Swiftly, he took down the leader of the first squadron, casting shadows upon the Hector soldiers. Amid the surreal chaos, the Hector soldiers struggled to comprehend the unfolding events. One soldier, sensing the gravity of the situation, felt compelled to urgently report the phantom presence that posed a severe threat to everyone. Utilizing a magical communication device, he relayed the message to his commander, only to be astonished as Roman, the embodiment of stealth, sat right behind him on a tree, poised for a strike. Edwin's world shattered as he absorbed the shocking revelation. Turning to Soldier Thompson, he urgently implored him to maintain composure, explaining that their adversaries were capitalizing on the cloak of darkness. The gravity of the situation hung in the air, prompting Thompson to disclose the grim reality that their soldiers were falling prey to an unseen menace. The troops, helpless and clueless, were perishing one by one, unaware of the direction or method of the insidious assaults. Astonishment gripped Edwin as he grappled with the paradox that even someone with heightened senses like Thompson was rendered powerless against the unseen threat. The concept of an aura knight crossed Edwin's mind, but it seemed inconceivable that Thompson, with his advanced sensory perception, could be entirely blind to the enemy's presence. Thompson painted a dire picture of the soldier's struggle, a relentless battle against adversaries without a discernible form. Edwin struggled to reconcile the fact that Thompson, endowed with extraordinary abilities, was utterly incapable of detecting these elusive foes. The realization gnawed at Edwin, challenging his understanding of the capabilities of those trained for combat. Amidst the chaos, Thompson conveyed the soldiers' desperation, emphasizing the difficulty of engaging enemies without a tangible form. Edwin's mind raced, considering the possibility of magic. Within the domain of sorcery, there are mages who possess the ability to manipulate the essence of transparency, rendering a person's physical form invisible or concealed. However, he swiftly dismissed the notion, well aware that magical abilities had their limitations and required recovery periods between uses. It was a puzzle that defied conventional explanations, leaving Edwin grasping for understanding in the midst of an enigma. Despite the uncertainty, Edwin rallied himself to offer guidance. He urged Thompson not to succumb to the deceptive nature of the darkness, assuring him that reinforcements were on their way. The promise of impending support served as a beacon of hope amid the shadows that threatened to engulf them. Thompson, though visibly shaken, found solace in Edwin's words. He revealed that allies of Hector had encircled the camp, creating a defensive perimeter. This revelation provided a glimmer of optimism, a lifeline for the beleaguered soldiers. The plan was clear, to endure until the prince arrived with additional forces. With a sense of purpose, Thompson directed the first squadron soldiers to adopt defensive formations, urging them to thwart the enemy's relentless assault. Thompson, drawing on his aura, sought to pierce the veil of darkness and sense the elusive enemy. In a moment of heightened awareness, he identified a presence on the right side and swiftly launched an attack. However, the jubilation of striking back quickly turned to dismay as Thompson realized the enemies had cunningly used Hector's soldiers as bait. From the shadows emerged Roman, a silent predator who had concealed himself in the darkness, patiently hunting his adversaries. Frustration gripped Thompson as he confronted Roman, accusing him of cowardice and demanding that he reveal himself. In a sudden twist of events, Roman materialized before Thompson, offering a perspective on Hector's tactical miscalculations. Roman suggested that Hector tended to underestimate adversaries he couldn't see beforehand, leading to a misguided belief in victory. Intrigued by this insight, Roman turned the tables, questioning Thompson about Hector's potential error in judgment. Did Hector truly think he could effortlessly subdue Roman once he identified his location? Thompson, sensing the gravity of the situation, braced himself to confront Roman. The tension hung in the air as Thompson prepared to strike, convinced that he needed to conclude the conflict with Roman here and now. However, Roman swiftly outmaneuvered Thompson with a single, precise strike, sending him crashing to the ground. Thompson's desperate cry echoed through the battleground, alerting his comrades to the presence of an unseen adversary. Roman, unperturbed, explained his calculated move. He had manipulated mana to block off all surrounding sounds, ensuring that Thompson's distress signals wouldn't reach his fellow soldiers. Seizing the advantage, Roman subdued Thompson, pinning him to the ground and seizing a magical communication device. Through the magical device, Roman established a connection with Edwin. Confident that Edwin could hear him, Roman delved into a profound understanding of Hector's current plight. The Hector kingdom faced a severe famine, pushing its people to the brink of starvation. 
Roman dissected the motives behind Hector's aggressive military actions, revealing a strategic ploy to leverage the Southern Front as a means to extort crucial resources from Cairo. Roman, claiming to have unraveled Hector's scheme, outlined the urgency of Hector's predicament. The kingdom lacked sufficient military rations, and Roman pledged to obstruct Hector's plans at every juncture. With unwavering determination, Roman asserted that Hector's time was running out, emphasizing that he wouldn't last three months due to the scarcity of vital resources. As Roman disclosed the intricacies of Hector's precarious situation, forcing extreme measures and a desperate bid for survival, Roman's interference emerged as a formidable obstacle disrupting Hector's grand designs and exacerbating the kingdom's vulnerability. Edwin, absorbing Roman's revelations, refrained from denying the accuracy of the claims. The severity of the famine, coupled with the kingdom's exhaustion of external borrowing options, left no room for denial. Trapped in an unrelenting cycle of debt, Hector faced the daunting task of making a critical decision to extricate itself from the financial abyss. Roman, confronted with this revelation, questioned Edwin's expectation for empathy. Edwin clarified that he wasn't seeking understanding from Roman but rather attempting to convey the desperate circumstances engulfing Hector. The very existence of the Hector kingdom teetered on the edge as they grappled with the consequences of war. Acknowledging the urgency emphasized by Roman earlier, Edwin admitted that Hector couldn't afford to stand down. The deaths of their comrades could not be in vain, driving them to continue the struggle even in the face of imminent crisis. Edwin's plea reached Roman urging him to communicate a dire message to the Cairo royal family. If Hector failed to secure the necessary resources, they threatened to unleash the deadly concoctions of necromancers, transforming the southern front into a harrowing landscape of death. Edwin, as the prince, expressed his unwavering commitment to doing whatever it took to safeguard Hector's people. The weight of decision-making then shifted to Roman, prompting Edwin to inquire about Roman's stance. Would Roman choose to stand alongside Hector, facing the precipice of impending doom? or would he opt for negotiation? The fate of this fragile alliance now rested in the hands of Cairo, casting a shadow of uncertainty over the unfolding narrative. As Roman pondered this critical choice, Edwin's identity emerged as a familiar presence in his investigations into the Southern Front. Edwin Hector, unlike his father, distinguished himself as a competent leader, earning acknowledgement both within and beyond the kingdom. While Roman acknowledged Edwin's exceptional qualities, he detected a veiled threat in Edwin's words. Responding with swift brutality, Roman kicked Thompson, one of Hector's soldiers, who screamed out in pain. Edwin, alarmed by this sudden act of violence, sought an explanation from Roman. With a detached calmness, Roman justified his actions, explaining that he had eliminated Thompson. Edwin, bewildered, questioned the reasoning behind such a drastic measure. In response, Roman revealed his indifference to the complex struggles faced by Hector. He urged Edwin not to misconstrue the situation emphasizing that the war had already begun and that Hector, by crossing certain lines, forfeited any expectation of humane treatment from Roman. In Roman's eyes, the harsh realities of war had stripped away any semblance of obligation to mercy or understanding. Roman asserted his commitment to pursuing what he believed to be the right course of action. He cautioned Edwin against attempting to tether him, issuing a stark warning that he wouldn't spare any of Hector's soldiers. Even if Hector were to raise a white flag and attempt to escape, Roman pledged to relentlessly pursue them, ensuring that each and every member of Hector's forces would face the consequences. Identifying himself unequivocally as Roman Dimitri, he emphasized that his resolve was unwavering. In a chilling proclamation, Roman conveyed to Edwin that, should he choose to embrace death and resist until the bitter end, their paths would inevitably cross again. Edwin, taken aback by this declaration, was left contemplating the true extent of Roman Dimitri's danger a realization that exceeded his previous assessments. In the unfolding events, Jackson pressed Edwin for his next move. Edwin responded decisively, instructing Jackson to swiftly mobilize the forces of Hector and form a strategic encirclement around the location of the communication device. This command, laden with urgency, was fueled by a deep sense of responsibility toward Thompson, who had met a painful end. Edwin, driven by a personal vendetta, declared his intention to personally confront Roman Dimitri. Upon receiving Edwin's orders, Jackson, understanding the gravity of the situation, rallied the soldiers. He urged them to persist in their ascent up the mountain, even in the face of fallen comrades. The overarching objective was to cut off the enemy's retreat route, sealing Roman and his forces in. 
The air was charged with a palpable tension as Hector's soldiers prepared to execute Edwin's directives, each step a testament to their commitment to avenging Thompson and safeguarding their kingdom. Meanwhile, the scene shifted to Roman, who began unraveling the intricacies of the environment to his soldiers. He revealed that seemingly insignificant rocks and branches held innate mana, imperceptible to the human eye. Roman expounded on the potential of artificially manipulating this mana to control space, introducing a concept he termed trap formation. As Roman explained these mystical principles, Chris, one of Roman's soldiers, was taken aback. The application of the trap formation left him feeling as if his senses had been abruptly denied. Roman's mastery over space unfolded like a cosmic chessboard, hiding his presence from plain view. In the midst of this mystical display, Chris grappled with the surreal nature of Roman's techniques. The trap formation seemed to play tricks on perception, leaving Chris bewildered by the hidden dimensions of Roman's strategy. Returning to the Hector soldiers, the intensity of the charge was met with swift and calculated opposition. Chris, embodying the newfound strength derived from his training under Roman, executed a single, decisive strike that showcased the effectiveness of the trap formation. It became evident that the Hector army, unaware of Chris's presence due to the spatial manipulation, fell into what Chris discerned as a trap formation, a strategic disadvantage that compromised their ability to detect and counter their adversaries. In a resounding voice, Chris commands the Roman soldiers to unleash their assault upon the enemy forces, capitalizing on the advantage of their trap formation, which cunningly conceals Chris from the adversary's detection. Chris, however, was no ordinary soldier. His transformation after engaging in single combat with Roman had propelled him into a realm of martial prowess previously unattainable. Dedication and relentless training with Roman had enabled Chris to absorb the teachings of the top martial masters, placing him among the elite warriors. The blue aura enveloping Chris was a testament to his newfound abilities, as he effortlessly dispatched multiple opponents with a lightning-fast technique known as the lightning flash. With the belief that they had successfully executed Roman's orders, Chris assessed the situation and decided to act prudently. Fearing a potential influx of Hector soldiers, Chris swiftly commanded his comrades to retreat and regroup at the next designated point. This strategic move aimed to avoid unnecessary confrontation and maintain the element of surprise. In different regions, parallel battles were unfolding. Kevin, enveloped in a foreboding red aura, methodically dismantled a few Hector soldiers. His demeanor exuded confidence as he stood before the remaining Hector forces, contemplating the perceived invincibility of his liege's methods. Meanwhile, elsewhere, Pucky and a contingent of Roman soldiers executed their mission with precision, successfully eliminating Hector soldiers in diverse areas. The surprise attack, orchestrated by four distinct groups, unfolded simultaneously, achieving its intended success. As events progressed, the focus shifted from the battlefield to the mountain descent, where an injured Hector soldier approached Edwin with unsettling information. The soldier conveyed a conviction that a mage was concealed within Cairo's camp on the mountain. The soldier detailed instances where Cairo's forces appeared mysteriously, launching surprise attacks on Hector soldiers even in well-lit areas. Jackson, sharing this information with Edwin, speculated that Hector soldiers had fallen into a cunning enemy trap. Edwin, contemplating the soldier's revelation, weighed the possibility of magic being employed to transport soldiers. However, he quickly dismissed the idea that high-circle magic scrolls, capable of such feats, could be the culprit. These scrolls were strictly controlled by the Magic Tower, a neutral organization known for its regulation of magical resources. Considering the resource-strapped Southern Front, Edwin found it improbable that such high-level magical items could be in their possession. This led him to a startling deduction. There might be a mage in the South, operating independently of the Magic Tower. Edwin's skepticism deepened as he contemplated the rarity of mages, emphasizing that they were even scarcer than Aura Swordsmen. Most mages, gifted with mana manipulation abilities, aligned themselves with the Magic Tower. This neutral organization actively sought out talented individuals across the continent, offering a repository of magical knowledge. The allure of this organization left little room for mages to operate independently. The prospect of a high-circle mage operating clandestinely in the South challenged Edwin's understanding of the unfolding situation. Mages were typically aligned with the Magic Tower, and the idea of one acting outside those bounds seemed unlikely. Edwin found himself grappling with the recent surge in Magic users, a departure from the historical scarcity of such individuals in each country. He couldn't shake his skepticism, 
convinced that the sudden influx of magic users couldn't be authentic. Despite the curiosity tempting him to investigate personally, Edwin chose to exercise caution. The soldiers were currently entrenched in a perilous battle against the forces of the Cairo Kingdom, and Edwin recognized that this wasn't the opportune time for him to risk his life. Instead, he opted to bide his time, patiently waiting for the right moment when Roman Dimitri would unwittingly fall into Edwin's carefully laid trap. Shifting focus to the mountains, Roman's ongoing confrontation with Hector soldiers took a dramatic turn. Roman successfully vanquished another Hector soldier, but this time, his opponent utilized a peculiar artifact. With each of Roman's movements, the artifact emitted fragments of light in all directions, effectively turning Roman into a conspicuous target. This unexpected twist exposed Roman's location like a firefly illuminating the night. Hector soldiers swiftly disseminated this crucial information, guiding their comrades toward Roman's now-revealed position. The second and third squadrons mobilized, driven by the collective desire to avenge their fallen comrades. As they prepared to launch a joint attack on Roman, expectations ran high among the Hector soldiers. However, Roman, ever the cunning strategist, had an ace up his sleeve. Unleashing his second move of the heavenly demon arts, he deftly incapacitated all approaching Hector soldiers. The surprising efficiency of Roman's counterattack left the Hector soldiers astounded, caught off guard by the unexpected turn of events. Despite Roman's success, the toll on his stamina became apparent. Taking a moment to gather himself, Roman was approached by an injured Hector soldier who questioned the feasibility of Roman's escape. The soldier pointed to the daunting reality of thousands of Hector soldiers surrounding the mountains, emphasizing that no matter how formidable Roman was, his demise seemed inevitable at the hands of the overwhelming forces closing in. In response, Roman calmly revealed a strategic revelation to the injured soldier. He disclosed that Hector's soldiers had unwittingly fallen into his trap. Countless reinforcements were converging on the mountain, charging recklessly in a desperate attempt to halt Roman's progress. The sheer audacity and recklessness of Hector's soldiers, hoping to stall Roman for mere minutes or even seconds, didn't escape Roman's notice. A wry smile played on Roman's lips as he marveled at the ironic twist of fate, where Hector's forces, in their pursuit, had become more careless than ever. Roman chuckled with a nonchalant demeanor, expressing his intention to toy with Hector's soldiers for as long as Hector desired. He emphasized that there was ample time until the sun would grace the horizon, signaling the dawn of a new day. However, his leisurely moment was abruptly interrupted as Jackson emerged from behind, proclaiming that the end had come for Roman. Roman turned to face his unexpected challenger and recognized the soldier with light equipment and a face adorned with scars. A realization struck Roman. This must be Jackson, the captain of the ranger unit. Roman mused that Jackson's energy was undeniably formidable, rating it a solid four stars. The encounter left Roman contemplating whether Hector had intentionally concealed such potent information. A charged atmosphere enveloped the scene as both Jackson and Roman emanated their respective auras. The clash of their swords resonated with full force, the sound echoing through the mountainous terrain. The intensity of their gaze and the energy emanating from their clash conveyed a fierce determination on both sides. In the heat of the moment, Jackson roared with conviction, declaring that he had finally cornered Roman. Amidst the dense foliage of the forest, Jackson, a skilled swordsman carrying a four-star rating without an official ranking within the Hector Kingdom, played a pivotal role as the leader of the Ranger Corps in the eyes of the outside world. This apparent disconnect between Jackson's known capabilities and his official status created an air of mystery surrounding his true strength. The ongoing clash between Roman and Jackson unfolded against this backdrop, illuminating the forest with a vibrant blue glow. In the midst of their fierce confrontation, Jackson found himself astounded by Roman's unwavering resilience. The anticipated impact of Jackson's attacks failed to push Roman back as expected, prompting Jackson to confront the realization that he had underestimated Roman Dimitri. Reflecting on the past reports that labeled Roman as a mere three-star swordsman, Jackson pondered whether these accounts were a deliberate deception. In Jackson's estimation, individuals ranking four stars and above were considered walking disasters on the battlefield. The revelation of Roman's true strength shed light on why Hector soldiers had struggled against him. Roman, seemingly impervious to Jackson's strikes, retaliated with his own calculated moves. As Roman countered Jackson's attacks, the ranger leader couldn't help but acknowledge the strength displayed by his opponent. Roman's strategic use of aura allowed him to deliver a powerful strike, pushing Jackson back. 
In this moment of recognition, Jackson grudgingly accepted that Roman was indeed a formidable adversary. However, Jackson remained confident in the outcome of the battle. He decided to retreat and blew a whistle, signaling the arrival of Hector soldiers who swiftly surrounded Roman. Jackson, believing victory was within his grasp, confidently urged Roman to surrender. To everyone's surprise, Roman responded with a nonchalant smile, suggesting that the Hector soldiers were operating under misconceptions. Roman proceeded to dismantle the false assumptions surrounding him. Firstly, he revealed that artifacts, such as the one Jackson had employed, would never adhere to him against his will. In a bold and defiant move, Roman destroyed the artifact before Jackson's eyes. The unexpected act left Jackson in shock, realizing that Roman possessed an uncanny ability to resist the influence of magical devices. Secondly, Roman asserted his confidence in escaping any encirclement, dismissing the notion that the sheer number of soldiers could subdue him. This claim defied conventional wisdom, leaving Jackson and the surrounding Hector soldiers to grapple with the audacity of Roman's statement. The dynamics of the confrontation shifted as Roman's strategic brilliance continued to confound his adversaries. In a sudden twist, Roman exhibited his agility and speed by appearing behind Jackson. This unexpected maneuver caught the ranger leader off guard. Roman taunted Jackson, drawing attention to the absence of Edwin Hector's support in that critical moment. The realization dawned on Jackson that he had been outmaneuvered by Roman's cunning tactics. As Roman vanished from sight, leaving the Hector soldiers bewildered, Jackson raised the alarm. He urgently shouted for the soldiers to pursue Roman immediately, emphasizing the imminent danger Prince Edwin faced. As Roman charged towards the location where Edwin Hector was stationed, the weight of strategic contemplation burdened his thoughts. In the face of a smaller fighting force, he believed in a singular approach to end the war, eliminating the enemy's commander. The idea resonated in his mind as he followed the invisible thread of mana emanating from Edwin's communication device, leading him closer to the heart of Hector's camp. The journey brought them to the base of a mountain, the camp sprawling beneath. Roman's agility and precision took them down with alarming speed, leaving no room for retaliation. Closing in on Edwin, the gravity of the impending confrontation pressed upon Roman. His plan hinged on the assumption that striking down the enemy's commander would cripple their forces. However, Edwin had other tricks up his sleeve. As Roman poised to deliver the decisive blow, Edwin unleashed a surprising display of fire magic. The flames danced with an otherworldly grace, catching Roman off guard. The revelation of Edwin's magical prowess shattered Roman's preconceptions. The mana flowing through Edwin seemed to follow a different rhythm. In the crucible of conflict, Edwin unleashed a spell named Inferno, a torrent of magical flames hurtling towards Roman. Instinctively, Roman raised his defenses, attempting to ward off the fiery onslaught. However, Edwin was not finished. Swiftly transitioning, he cast another spell, Entangle, causing tree roots to surge from the ground below Roman. Roman, however, proved resourceful. With a deft stroke, he severed the ensnaring roots, reclaiming control of the situation. Yet, the respite was short-lived. A swordsman emerged, his form surrounded by a pulsating yellow aura. The swordsman's attack was relentless, a testament to a power that transcended the ordinary. In the clash of blades, Roman managed to block the assault using his own sword as an impromptu shield. The identity of this formidable swordsman soon unraveled. Butler, the captain of the Hector Kingdom's second-ranking royal knight order, a five-star swordsman. Romans realizing that Edwin had orchestrated a multifaceted plan to subdue him. Butler's aura exuded an overwhelming strength, a force to be reckoned with. In the midst of this unfolding chaos, Edwin observed with satisfaction as Butler joined the fray. The alliance between a fourth circle mage and a five-star swordsman seemed insurmountable. Edwin, confident in their combined might, believed Romans did no chance against their coordinated assault. With a sense of impending doom, Edwin conjured wind blade magic, directing it towards Roman. Simultaneously, Butler lunged forward, his sword ablaze with an aura that echoed his formidable prowess. Roman found himself caught between the elemental onslaught and the razor-sharp strikes of Butler's sword. In a desperate attempt to defend against both incoming attacks, Roman, to his surprise, faltered in blocking Butler's strike. The impact sent shockwaves through the air, resulting in a resounding explosion that left Roman injured and on his knees. Amidst the chaos, Roman's thoughts raced, reflecting on the twist that had unfolded. He had expected challenges, but the revelation of Edwin Hector's magical prowess in the presence of Butler, a five-star swordsman masquerading as a common soldier, caught him off guard. Rather than succumbing to despair, 
Roman found an unexpected thrill in facing adversaries he hadn't anticipated. The unexpectedness of the situation seemed to invigorate him. Standing amid the aftermath, injuries notwithstanding, Roman sported a triumphant smile. The proximity to death brought about a surge of vitality and a renewed appreciation for the pulse of life. On the other side of the battlefield, Butler grappled with the astonishing resilience displayed by Roman Dimitri. A seasoned five-star swordsman himself, Butler struggled to comprehend how someone in their mid-twenties could endure the combined might of both him and Prince Edwin. The encounter raised questions about Roman's origins and the nature of the formidable force he represented. Edwin, sensing Roman's fatigue, seized the opportunity to urge Butler to finish off their worn-out adversary. However, Roman defied the dire circumstances. Initiating a bold maneuver, he unleashed the heavenly demon technique, double-casting break hold. Closing the distance with remarkable speed, Roman prepared to unleash a devastating strike on Edwin. Witnessing Roman's approach, Butler swiftly positioned himself in front of Edwin, shielding him from the imminent blow. As Roman's strike descended upon them, Butler summoned all his skill to barely block the attack, saving Edwin from the full force of the blow. The display of Butler's prowess surprised Roman, acknowledging the marked difference in the abilities of a five-star swordsman. However, Roman's physical limits had been pushed to the brink after employing the demanding Heavenly Demon Sword technique twice. Recognizing the necessity of a strategic retreat, Roman made the decision to withdraw from the battlefield. Before departing, he left Edwin with a chilling warning, foretelling that if their paths were to cross again, Edwin wouldn't survive as he had today. Edwin, stunned by the unexpected turn of events, grappled with the implications of Roman's warning. As Roman's form dissipated in front of Butler, a palpable sense of humiliation swept through the Hector army. The impact of a single individual had nearly resulted in the loss of their esteemed commander, a stark reality that Hector found difficult to reconcile. The truth unfolded before his eyes, challenging the very core of his leadership. Meanwhile, Edwin, burdened with guilt, took responsibility for the unfolding disaster, blaming his own overestimation and misguided judgment. The decision that had seemed like the lesser of two evils at the time had now become the worst-case scenario. Edwin grappled with the weight of the outcome, viewing the battle not as Hector's defeat but as a personal failure. The bitter taste of regret lingered, born from the miscalculations that had led them to this point. The narrative shifted to the following day, where soldiers descended from the mountain with heavy hearts. Edwin extend heartfelt apologies to the soldiers for the consequences of Edwin's misjudgment. Despite the gravity of the situation, the soldiers demonstrated a remarkable understanding. They reassured Edwin that the blame did not rest on his shoulders alone. The adversary they faced had proven to be an exceptionally formidable force. Jackson, a voice of reason among them, echoed these sentiments, encouraging Edwin to lift his head high. The soldiers, he emphasized, held an unwavering belief in their commander. Edwin, comforted by Jackson's words, managed a smile. He acknowledged the resilience of his troops and addressed them with a newfound openness. Aware of the potential repercussions of his decisions, Edwin urged anyone who believed that his choices might lead to defeat to cast aside hierarchical constraints and inform him promptly. The soldiers, understanding the gravity of the situation, nodded in acknowledgement, their loyalty unwavering. In the face of uncertainty, Edwin made a strategic decision. He assigned Hector the crucial responsibility of managing the forefront defense camp within the next 10 days, a pivotal window before Cairo's main army would arrive. Beyond that deadline, the rear camp would transform into their base, marking a final stand against the impending threat. It was a calculated move, demonstrating Edwin's commitment to adapting to the ever-changing circumstances on the battlefield. Butler, curious about the looming challenge of Roman Dimitri, sought clarification from Edwin. Edwin, displaying a blend of caution and confidence, admitted Roman's dangerous capabilities. However, he highlighted the crucial distinction between fighting on the advantageous terrain of the mountains and the more conventional plains. Edwin intended to leverage this geographical advantage, expressing a belief that while he, personally, might have suffered a defeat, but the Hector have yet to be defeated. Jackson pressed Edwin on Hector's prospects for obtaining the desired compensation from Cairo through resistance. Edwin, contemplating the larger picture, disclosed his intention to negotiate a deal with the Kronos Empire. The shift in focus transported the narrative to the regal halls of the Cairo royal palace, where Count Adjur brought unsettling news to King Daniel. Adjur detailed the Cairo royal family's significant investments in the Eastern Front, driven by frequent provocations from Kronos in the past year. However, he painted a stark financial reality, 
asserting that meeting all of Hector's conditions would deplete Cairo's reserves. When King Daniel suggested raising taxes, a juror cautioned against it, citing the risk of public unrest since taxes had been increased just six months prior. The dilemma prompted Daniel to consider rallying support from Cairo's nobles, even as he acknowledged the potential threat to the royal family's authority. As desperation mounted, Daniel directed a juror to reach out to the nobles of the central government for an urgent meeting to navigate the financial conundrum. However, the urgency was interrupted by a soldier bringing surprising news from the southern front. The enemy had been repelled. Daniel, taken aback by this unexpected turn, promptly gathered other nobles for a meeting to share the news and strategize a response. The assembled nobles grappled with the revelation, questioning how the southern front, armed with fewer soldiers, managed to drive away Hector's formidable force of 10,000. The perplexity among the nobles grew, contemplating the improbable nature of the victory. In this moment of uncertainty, Daniel saw a glimmer of hope and the potential for a breakthrough in their predicament. Count Denver speculated that Roman Dimitri, a figure whose reputation loomed large, might be the key to this unexpected triumph. The incredulity surrounding Roman's prowess in the face of overwhelming odds pervaded the room. To ascertain the truth, the soldiers were directed to establish an immediate connection to the southern front. As the anticipation built, Henry emerged on the call, potentially holding crucial information about the recent turn of events. As the king inquired about Henry's identity and affiliations, Henry, with a sense of formality, revealed himself as the second son of the esteemed House of Albert. The mention of the House of Albert sparked recognition from Marquis Benedict, who acknowledged its historical legacy of producing outstanding individuals and its influential standing within the central government. However, setting aside this acknowledgement, Marquis directed a more pressing question to Henry, inquiring about the whereabouts of Roman and expressing curiosity as to why Henry was answering instead of Roman. Henry, in a composed manner, explained that he had aligned himself with the corps led by Sir Roman. Intriguingly, Roman had requested some alone time, prompting Henry, as the only noble present, to respond to the call. Marquis Benedict, although evidently irritated by this diversion from the expected chain of command, allowed Henry to elaborate on the unfolding events. Thus began Henry's account of the recent happenings. Marquis, seemingly impatient, urged him to get to the point. Henry, undeterred, began to convey his perspective, emphasizing the critical need to establish a connection with Roman before the name of Sir Roman became widely recognized across the continent. This set the stage for a revelation of Roman's pivotal role in the success of a recent mission. Henry detailed how Roman, with keen perception, swiftly discerned Hector Kingdom's impending attack on the South training camp and their strategic aim for the warp gate. Roman, displaying strategic acumen, wasted no time in climbing the mountains to establish a secret camp. The implication was clear. Roman's foresight and decisive actions could have potentially altered the course of events had the Southern Front commander heeded his advice. The revelation left the king and other nobles visibly surprised. The narrative shifted as Henry continued to express his frustration at those who had disregarded Roman's counsel. His deliberate choice of a loud and assertive tone was a conscious effort to ensure that Roman subordinates in the vicinity heard his words of praise. Henry, it seemed, was not merely providing a report but crafting a narrative that underscored Roman's prowess and the significance of his contributions. With conviction, Henry shared that he had fought alongside Sir Roman until dawn. In the face of overwhelming odds, with only 200 soldiers against an enemy force over 10 times their size, they had emerged victorious. With infectious enthusiasm, Henry boldly declared his readiness, along with his soldiers, to engage in a war against the Hector Kingdom. The proclamation resonated with a sense of determination that caught the attention of King Daniel. The monarch expressed his delight, commending Roman Dimitri for displaying unwavering resistance despite being severely disadvantaged. In a stark contrast, he highlighted how the executives of Cairo had been prepared to concede defeat prematurely. Marquis Benedict echoed the king's sentiments, acknowledging the executive's mental surrender when Hector seized the warp gate. However, Marquis was quick to recognize the strength of the forces from the Cairo kingdom, particularly highlighting the heroic actions of Roman Dimitri in the southern front. This acknowledgement laid the foundation for a shift in perspective, from a posture of defeat to one of strength and resilience. Count Gregory, displaying a proactive stance, urged King Daniel to swiftly dispatch additional soldiers to the southern front, condemning the audacity of the Hector Kingdom for encroaching upon Cairo's territory. The king, embodying a newfound resolve, declared an end to negotiations with Hector, 
expressing Cairo's determination to reclaim its pride. He entrusted Count Gregory, Count Denver, and Marquis Benedict with the responsibility of rallying their family vassals, equipping them with vital information about the developments on the Southern Front. Within the meeting of central government nobles, an initial facade of concern for the safety of the Southern Front veiled a collective objective that became increasingly apparent, the unanimous desire to secure the alliance of Roman Dimitri. The families, recognizing Roman's pivotal role and extraordinary capabilities, had aligned on the crucial decision to recruit him to their respective factions. As the call concluded, Henry's thoughts swirled with anticipation. He envisioned a post-war scenario where Roman, having proved his mettle, would inevitably become a sought-after asset for the central government. Recognizing this as a unique opportunity, Henry envisioned a path where aligning himself with Roman could lead to significant personal growth and success. Post-call, Henry approached Chris, offering a gesture of camaraderie through the sharing of high-quality food. However, Chris, astute and perceptive, saw through the veneer of Henry's actions. In a candid moment, Chris challenged Henry to shift his focus from seeking approval to demonstrating reliability on the battlefield. The notion of trust echoed in Henry's mind, prompting him to reflect on its profound significance in the complex dynamics of camaraderie and alliances. Turning to Kevin, Henry, in a more casual moment, extended an offer to share the high-quality food. The directive from the royal family echoed through the ranks of the southern defense line a strategic move to bolster Roman and buy precious time until the main force from Cairo could reinforce the south. The focus then shifted to the third defense line of Cairo, where Commander Baron Vasili contemplated the recent outcome of a skirmish. Rumors circulated that Hector's army, purportedly defeated by fewer than 200 men, might not be as formidable as initially perceived. Engaging in a conversation with a fellow soldier, Vasili couldn't help but wonder if Hector's forces were weakened possibly due to a recent famine. The soldier shared similar musings, and Vasily saw an opportunity in this apparent vulnerability. Three years in this remote post had left Vasily craving a chance to make a significant impact. Viewing it as a cosmic opportunity bestowed upon him, Vasily felt an urge to contribute to Roman's cause, convinced that whatever a young upstart like Roman could do, he could match. Deciding to employ guerrilla tactics, Vasily instructed the soldier to gather forces promptly. The plan was to showcase the strength of the third defense line and surprise Hector's army, which had split up to conquer the defense lines individually. The specific unit targeting the third defense line consisted of 3,000 soldiers. Fueled by Vasily's ambitious desire to achieve a notable war feat, his forces lay in ambush, ready to strike. As the ambush unfolded, reality deviated from Vasily's expectations. Hector's army, contrary to Vasily's assumptions, displayed resilience and strategic prowess. The soldiers were not the weakened, famine-stricken force Vasily had anticipated. The agitated state of Hector's army, which Vasily had hoped to exploit, had calmed. The comfort that Vasily's troops had taken in the southern defense line proved insufficient against the unexpectedly formidable Hector forces. In a moment of realization, Vasily understood that the victories on the mountains owed much to Roman Dimitri's tactical brilliance. The young and resourceful Roman had played a crucial role in the success of the southern defense line, a fact Vasily could no longer overlook. Unfortunately, Vasily's ambitions came at a cost. His forces were overpowered, and the commander himself was taken down by Hector's soldiers. The news of Vasily's demise reverberated to the royal palace of Cairo. A somber-faced soldier informed the king that Baron Vasily, the valiant commander of the third defense line, had been reported killed in battle with the enemy. As chaos engulfed the defense lines, news arrived that the third and fourth defense lines were under simultaneous attack, intensifying the urgency of the situation. A distressing call from the second defense line revealed a grim reality. Sustaining their current state for another ten days was deemed impossible, and a desperate plea for reinforcements echoed through the communication. King Daniel, confronted with the swift collapse of the defense lines within a single day, grappled with the severity of the challenge. It dawned on him that the strength of Cairo alone wasn't sufficient. Rather, the decisive factor in their overwhelming victory was the existence and influence of Roman Dimitri. This revelation left the king in a state of vulnerability, prompting an immediate inquiry about Roman's current location. The scene transitioned to a secluded cave, where Roman engaged in rigorous training. Amidst the physical exertion, Roman's thoughts delved into the mysteries of the world, particularly the enigma of magic. Drawing a parallel with Murim, Roman contemplated magic as a fusion of absorbing natural energy, akin to a tree with roots, 
and further advancing martial arts. The realization struck that if Edwin Hector wielded greater magical prowess, Roman's escape might have been thwarted. Contemplating his martial prowess as a heavenly demon, Roman acknowledged a lack of recovery. The consequences of impulsive decisions weighed heavily on his mind, especially in light of Edwin's strategic traps. Recalling the recent clash with Edwin and Butler, Roman recognized the need for a strategic reassessment. The combination of Edwin's magical abilities and Butler's prowess as a five-star swordsman posed a formidable challenge. Despite the odds, Roman found exhilaration in facing such formidable foes. He envisioned a scenario where risking everything became imperative, relishing the idea of confronting adversaries who pushed him to the brink. His refusal to settle for a comfortable life echoed loudly in his thoughts. Roman delved into mental simulations, strategically exploring how he could defeat both Edwin and Butler simultaneously. In the aftermath of his mental duel with Edwin, Roman confidently declared that he had completed his war preparations. The shift in focus led us outside the cave, where Henry and Chris anxiously awaited Roman's emergence. Henry, unsure of Roman's whereabouts, conveyed the urgency of the royal family search for him. In response, Chris stood firm, refusing entry to anyone until Roman chose to reveal himself. This mysterious behavior left Henry questioning the nature of Roman's activities within the secluded cave. As Roman finally emerged, Henry couldn't help but inquire about his rugged appearance. Roman, undeterred, explained that he had spent the time preparing for the impending war. Chris, acting as a messenger, reported the alarming news from the front lines. The third and fourth defense lines had crumbled within a single day and the enemies had seized control of the second defense line. Hector, having secured all the war supplies, had regrouped in the rear camp, signaling the preparation for a decisive confrontation. Henry, perturbed by the turmoil within the royal family, suggested letting the main force handle the situation moving forward. However, Roman had different plans. Expressing his desire, Roman instructed Chris to establish a connection with the royal family. The subsequent connection brought Roman face-to-face -face with King Daniel, who, aware of the fallen defense lines, sought an explanation for Roman's actions during this critical period. Roman, maintaining honesty in his responses, clarified that he had dedicated the entire week to preparing his strategy. Despite King Daniel commending Roman for his war feats, there was an underlying concern about the southern defense lines falling into enemy hands. The king, seeking insight, questioned why Roman hadn't intervened sooner. In response, Roman candidly admitted leaving the outcome of the battle with Hector de Luck. He emphasized that, had they met the enemy on an open field, his intervention might not have altered the outcome significantly. Hector had placed everything on the line for this war, and Roman's confirmation that Butler, Hector's strongest warrior, had joined the fray added to the gravity of the situation. To King Daniel's shock, it was revealed that Hector's commander, Edwin Hector, was a mage. Roman explained to the king that mages wield overwhelming power, especially in open fields prompting his decision to wait for Cairo's main force before engaging Hector. Marquis Benedict concurred with Roman's judgment, acknowledging that the Southern Front faced an uphill battle with their current troops. Count Denver expressed disbelief at Butler's involvement, signaling to the nobles that Hector was fully committed to the conflict. Marquis suggested to King Daniel that further interrogation of their war hero, Roman, was unnecessary, a sentiment echoed by other nobles. King Daniel, respecting this consensus, assured Marquis that he wouldn't question Roman any further. King Daniel then informed Roman that Cairo's main force was on the verge of arriving at the southern front. Acknowledging Hector's completion of siege defense preparations in the rear camp, the king urged Roman to join them after they concluded their own preparations and were ready to launch an attack. Reflecting on Hector's resilience despite the breakdown in negotiations with Cairo, Roman apologized to King Daniel emphasizing that time was not on Cairo's side. Pressed by the king to clarify, Roman revealed that they had at most three days after Cairo's main force arrived. If they failed to destroy the rear camp within this time frame, Hector would likely seek external support, possibly involving the Kronos Empire. King Daniel, surprised, sought Roman's guidance on Cairo's next steps. Roman, smiling, proposed the only viable solution, a full frontal attack. He asserted that defeating Hector within the three-day window was their sole way out of this predicament. Edwin found himself engaged in a magical conversation with Count Hardit, a prominent figure from the formidable Kronos Empire. Edwin suggested to Count Hardit the idea of collaborating with Hector to traverse the southern gate of Cairo. Despite the apparent attractiveness of the proposition, 
Count Hardit hesitated to accept it immediately. He acknowledged the benefits of securing the Southern Front but expressed concerns about potentially provoking Cairo's wrath. Count Hardit tentatively agreed to the deal, contingent on the preservation of the rear positions over the next month. This condition left Edwin frustrated and incredulous, as he couldn't fathom Count Hardit's attempt to profit from the precarious situation. However, Hector had no other viable alternatives, and Edwin reluctantly accepted Count Hardit's terms. The gravity of the situation prompted Edwin to take swift action. He instructed Jackson, a key member of their alliance, to immediately contact Hector's family. Through the warp gate, Jackson was tasked with securing manpower and supplies to sustain Hector for the challenging month ahead. Jackson, understanding the urgency, affirmed his commitment to the mission. In Edwin's contemplation, he envisions Hector's warp gate, estimating the temporal linkage to span at least three days. With conviction, Edwin believes that Hector will endure until that juncture, nurturing the assurance that upon his return, he will bring with him a renewed sense of hope for Hector. The scene transitioned to the world outside. In a tent, Viscount Parchus, a commanding figure from the noble faction, held a meeting with Viscount Thales, the Kronos Empire Commander-in-Chief, and Baron Brahim, the Valhalla Empire Commander-in-Chief. Their anticipation centered around the arrival of Roman Dimitri. Viscount Parchus, contemplating the significance of this war with seemingly no real benefits, questioned the involvement of high-ranking individuals from the central government. He pondered whether securing Roman Dimitri's support held the key to the success of their endeavors. The uncertainty of their situation heightened as they awaited Roman's arrival. When Roman finally entered the scene, Viscount Parchus greeted him warmly, acknowledging him as Cairo's hero. Viscount Parchus recalls Marquis Benedict's candid admission that he harbors no concern for the unfolding events on the southern front. Benedict, in a straightforward manner, advises Parchus on the crucial steps he must take. Foremost among them is the imperative task of securing the favor of Roman Dimitri. Furthermore, the weight of responsibility for a potential defeat against Hector in Cairo's war is predicted to fall squarely on the shoulders of the royal family. And also, Benedict forewarns that if Roman is enticed away by rival aristocrats, the delicate equilibrium of power may teeter toward collapse. Viscount Parchus grappled with the unconventional nature of Roman's background. Despite being from a commoner family, Roman wielded considerable strength and influence, especially considering his youth in his mid-twenties. Parchus perceived the potential in attracting such a talented individual to his cause, envisioning a scenario where Marquis Benedict, whom he served, would reward him with a more significant position. As the scene shifted, Viscount Parchus guided Roman to his seat, introducing himself and highlighting his allegiance to Marquis Benedict. He relayed the Marquis's personal connection of Roman to the Southern Training Camp, a gesture that showcased Marquis Benedict's consideration for Roman's well-being. Moreover, Marquis Benedict requested Parchus to express his apologies for the unforeseen circumstances that had unfolded. Roman, Unfazed by the unexpected turn of events, reassured Viscount Parchus that all was well, understanding the complexities of the situation. Parchus, in turn, sought Roman's time for a special gift, hinting at the potential rewards for aligning with his cause. However, before the exchange could progress, Viscount Thales interjected, informing Roman of Count Gregory's anticipation of a call with valuable information. Baron Brahim chimed in indicating that Count Denver had dispatched men from his family to aid Roman on the battlefield. The intentions of the commanders became the subject of Roman's inquiry. Viscount Thales, expressing surprise at Roman's astuteness, found himself confronted by Roman's insight. Roman acknowledged the shared interest in his prowess, but redirected the conversation to the pressing issue at hand. In the midst of their deliberations, the enemy had boldly planted a flag on Cairo territory, a defiant act that demanded immediate attention. Roman, with a profound sense of purpose, deemed it inappropriate to discuss his future ambitions in the midst of this threat. He unveiled his post-victory aspirations, envisioning himself as Cairo's greatest swordsman and challenging the established rankings. Until that victorious moment, Roman urged the commanders to focus on the imminent situation, pledging to prove himself and offering his sword to only one deserving leader. Roman's proposal resonated, diffusing the tension in the air and paving the way for a more formal meeting. The imminent clash between Hector and Cairo stood poised to bring down the castle. The decision-making process was fraught with uncertainty, and no definitive solution emerged. Hector, utilizing the warp gate's link, granted Cairo a three-day window before they had to confront the impending attack. Viscount Parchus engaged Roman in a conversation, 
proposing a direct confrontation with Hector's forces, estimated to be around 10,000 strong. The notion was that Cairo, with its amassed troops, could potentially gain the upper hand in a head-to-head -head match. Roman, however, injected a dose of reality into the discussion. While acknowledging that Cairo could tip the balance with sheer numbers, he emphasized the formidable presence of Hector's mages. This magical component, Roman argued, prevented Cairo from claiming overwhelming power. Despite the challenges posed by Hector's magical forces, Roman hinted that there might be a way out of the predicament. The narrative then shifted to Hector's base, where the soldiers sounded the alarm as the enemy approached. The main army of Cairo, led by Roman and other Viscounts, advanced towards Hector's forces. In a dramatic moment, Roman, with sword raised high, addressed Hector, proposing a head-to-head -head battle between their kingdoms. The unexpected proposal left Edwin, an observer in this unfolding drama, bewildered about Roman's intentions. Roman's plea for a ceasefire stemmed from a desire to avoid further senseless sacrifices on both sides. He believed that Edwin, too, wished to spare lives. Roman suggested a straightforward resolution. If Hector emerged victorious, Cairo would accept his terms. However, if Roman triumphed, Hector must withdraw from Cairo. Edwin, grappling with shock and uncertainty, questioned Roman's motivations. Given Roman's perceived inferior skills against Butler, Edwin wondered if this bold move was a trap. Roman clarified that should Hector reject the proposal, he would take drastic action by destroying the rear camp. To add urgency to the decision-making process, Roman granted Hector a mere 10 minutes to decide. The gravity of the situation was not lost on Edwin, who recognized the complexity and lack of easy solutions. As the tension escalated, a surprising turn of events unfolded. Butler, Hector's formidable warrior, agreed to engage in a duel with Roman. Edwin, uncomfortable with this decision, felt compelled to voice his disapproval, sensing the potential risks involved. Butler reassures Edwin, urging him to trust that Butler will defeat Roman Dimitri and return to find a way for the Hector kingdom to endure. Edwin, however, expresses his trust in Butler but raises concerns about Hector losing 700 soldiers under Roman's influence throughout the night. Edwin believes in Butler, yet he suspects that Roman Dimitri might have hidden intentions. In response, Butler expresses confidence, assuring Edwin that Butler will dismantle any plans Roman devises. Having lived alongside Hector's king throughout his life, Butler rejects the notion that he is a coward who shies away from potential traps. Edwin, still cautious, implores Butler to promise one thing. If Butler notices any unusual signs, he must ensure his escape. Butler agrees, leaves with the promise of returning with victory, and contemplates the uniqueness of Roman. Butler acknowledges encountering many eccentric individuals in his life, but Roman stands out. Uncertain about the traps Roman may have set, Butler commits to doing his best. As they face each other, Roman reveals that since the moment he struck Butler with a sword on the mountain, he desired a full-fledged match with Butler until the end. Roman assures Butler that there is no trap and invites him to showcase his skills. Roman encourages Butler to give his best effort, explaining that if Butler kills him here, Butler can attain his desires. Butler, angered by Roman's seemingly maniacal approach, gears up for the battle. The two adversaries charge at each other with full force, initiating a fierce confrontation. As the battle between Butler and Roman unfolded, the significance of reaching the five-star level loomed large. Achieving this status transformed an individual into a formidable force within the continent, capable of reshaping the outcome of a battlefield. Butler, sensing the weight of the kingdom of Hector hanging in the balance, unleashed his explosive aura, a manifestation of the pivotal stakes at play. From the onset, Butler harbored no intention of prolonging the confrontation. His objective was clear, to conclude the battle decisively in one fell swoop. With resolute determination, Butler launched a full-force strike at Roman, driven by the urgency of the kingdom's fate. To the surprise of onlookers, Roman, displaying remarkable skill and agility, managed to block Butler's formidable attack. However, the repercussions of their clash became evident as the ground beneath Roman began to fracture, a spectacle that sent shockwaves through the spectators, Edwin, Hector's soldiers, and the Cairo commanders. Undeterred by the unexpected turn of events, Butler pressed on with his relentless assault. Roman, demonstrating exceptional defensive prowess, dodged Butler's subsequent attack and retaliated in kind. Yet, Butler's mastery revealed itself as he seamlessly maneuvered behind Roman, delivering a forceful swing of his aura-infused sword. Roman, displaying considerable skill, successfully parried Butler's strike. However, 
The aftermath of the clash left an intense aura slash extending into the ground behind him, adding an additional layer of awe and concern among the onlookers. Amidst the unfolding battle, Viscount Parchus found himself wrestling with worry. He had inadvertently agreed to this fight, driven by his desire to stand by Roman. Now, the potential consequences of Roman's defeat threatened to undermine Parchus' efforts to recruit him. The weight of this realization settled heavily on his shoulders. Viscount Thale shared Parchus' unease, pondering the possibility of Roman's defeat. As the Hector soldiers observed Butler's prowess, a swell of cheers erupted in support of the formidable warrior. The tide of battle seemed to shift as Roman found himself on the defensive, earnestly blocking Butler's relentless onslaught. However, Roman, not one to be easily subdued, transitioned from defense to offense, launching a counterattack against Butler. As the clash of their blades echoed on the battlefield, Hector's soldiers rallied behind Butler, their cheers amplifying the intensity of the moment. In the midst of the battle, Butler recognized a shift in Roman's tactics. Roman's interception of Butler's strikes became swifter, indicating a heightened level of anticipation and strategic insight. Rather than merely deflecting Butler's sword paths, Roman appeared to be reading them with increasing accuracy. This realization stirred frustration within Butler, who couldn't help but wonder if Roman was testing his abilities. Meanwhile, in Roman's contemplation, a profound revelation emerged. Despite his past victory over a four-star swordsman like Homerus, Roman acknowledged the absence of a face-off with a five-star opponent. The ongoing battle with Butler, a seasoned and powerful warrior, became Roman's test to determine his standing in this new world. As the intense duel between Roman and Butler unfolded, the dynamics of power and strategy took center stage. Roman, determined to ascend to the next level, decided to demolish the barrier in front of him. Charging at Butler with unwavering resolve, he aimed to assert his prowess in a clash that held profound implications for the fate of the kingdom. Butler, however, grew increasingly irritated as he confronted Roman's relentless assault. Utilizing his aura-infused sword, Butler retaliated simultaneously. Roman, with a keen analytical mind, observed the aftermath of the aura explosion. He recognized the inherent randomness in the impact of energy, a consequence of swordsmen with auras lacking precise control over mana. Their auras erupted like explosions, leading to an uneven distribution of strength along the blade. Roman seized upon this vulnerability, understanding that not all parts of the sword were equal in power. If, for instance, the blade possessed 120% of the aura, both sides could only wield 80% of its strength. With this strategic insight, Roman crafted his plan. He resolved to read the flow of Butler's mana and target the weak point in the aura structure. Executing two consecutive strikes, Roman's attacks were met with Butler's expert defense. Yet, amidst the clash, Roman discerned the weak point in Butler's defense. The next move would be crucial, and Roman unleashed the heavenly demon sword skill, the third movement. The surprise attack caught Butler off guard, breaking through his defenses. The impact was palpable as Butler, a formidable five-star swordsman, found himself pushed back. The battlefield, witnessing this unexpected turn, was thrown into a state of shock. Both sides, allies and adversaries alike, struggled to comprehend the reality unfolding before them. A three-star swordsman, Roman, was not only holding his own against a five-star swordsman like Butler, but was also gaining ground in the duel. Edwin, observing the spectacle, was shocked and conflicted. He recognized the stakes involved, understanding that if Roman emerged victorious, Hector would not only lose their strongest combatant but also be forced to withdraw from the rear camp. The potential fallout for Hector loomed large, and Edwin could only place his trust in Butler, hoping that there was more to Butler's abilities yet to be revealed. Returning to the duel, Butler found himself grappling with the unexpected reality of Roman's tenacity. Initially suspecting that Roman was merely using the fight as a pretext for setting traps, Butler now understood the genuine nature of Roman's intent to defeat him. This revelation shook Butler to the core, as the seemingly flawless plan crafted by Hector began to crumble under the unexpected strength and unorthodox tactics of Roman. Butler, acutely aware of the potential repercussions, deemed it imperative to prevent Roman from leaving the southern front alive. Butler foresaw a future where Hector's kingdom might be forced to confront a formidable adversary that they could not withstand if Roman were allowed to roam freely. In light of this ominous vision, Butler resolved to take decisive action and decided that Roman must be eliminated on the spot. Bracing for an intense battle, Butler geared up to face Roman with every ounce of strength he possessed. His aura, tinged with a vibrant yellow, 
signaled his readiness as he prepared to charge at Roman. A luminous ball of yellow aura materialized above Butler's head, a visual manifestation of the impending clash. Historically, only two individuals had successfully thwarted Butler's strikes, one being the strongest duelist within the kingdom of Hector, and the other holding a distinguished position on the continent's list of formidable fighters. With a lethal gleam in his eyes, Butler unleashed a technique known as the Sunstroke, directing the formidable attack towards Roman. Caught off guard by the brightness and intensity of Butler's assault, Roman swiftly shifted his focus to defense. Anticipating that this could be Butler's most potent strike, Roman summoned the strongest shield in his arsenal, the heavenly demon Baked Jong's Iron Shield. A dark aura enveloped Roman as Butler's sunstroke collided with the formidable defense of the Iron Shield. The clash between Butler's striking force and Roman's impenetrable shield became the focal point, determining who among them held the upper hand in strength. The collision resulted in a colossal explosion, shrouding the dual ground in a cloud of chaos. The battlefield unfolded with unexpected twists as Edwin, the commander on the southern front, watched in stunned amazement. Roman Dimitri had successfully blocked Butler's formidable attack. Butler, a seasoned five-star swordsman, hadn't anticipated anyone, let alone a swordsman of lower rank, being able to thwart his strike. Fatigue had visibly taken its toll on Butler, who had exhausted all his mana in the preceding assault. Sensing an opportunity, Roman charged forward, determined to exploit Butler's momentary weakness. Despite his weariness, Butler resolved not to give in and summoned the strength to block Roman's oncoming attack. However, much to everyone's astonishment, Butler's defense proved insufficient, and he found himself being pushed back by Roman's relentless assault. This unprecedented sight shocked even Butler, a warrior well acquainted with the rigors of battlefield clashes. The idea that a young combatant in his twenties could overpower a seasoned swordsman like himself defied all expectations. Nevertheless, Butler, driven by unwavering determination, counterattacked, refusing to surrender even if it meant pushing himself to the brink of death. To Butler's astonishment, Roman unexpectedly placed his hand on Butler's head and forcefully drove Butler into the ground. With resolve etched on his face, Butler channeled his remaining mana, creating an explosive burst intended to take Roman down with him. Despite the ferocity of Butler's desperate maneuver, Roman remarkably withstood the force of the explosion. His resilience and unyielding spirit became evident as he declared his intention to remember Butler's unwavering resolve. However, just as the duel seemed poised for its conclusion, Edwin, the Southern Front commander, intervened. Edwin, employing his rune flare magic, directed a powerful attack towards Roman. In a swift and agile move, Roman dodged Edwin's assault, showcasing not only his combat skills but also his strategic acumen. With the situation escalating, Edwin issued a command to his soldiers. As the soldiers rushed to rescue their fallen captain, Hector, the kingdom Butler served, faced a critical decision. In choosing to prioritize Butler's well-being over adhering to the established rules of the duel, Hector left the fortress gate wide open. The ramifications of this decision were profound, potentially shaping how the world viewed Hector and influencing the dynamics of the ongoing conflict. Following that, the narrative transitions to the meeting in Cairo camp, where Viscount Parchus queries Roman about the hypothetical scenario of a miraculous triumph and victory against Butler. Parchus inquires into Cairo's course of action should such an outcome transpire. Roman, drawing on his observations after the mountain duel with Hector, revealed a strategic insight. He highlighted Edwin Hector's tender-hearted nature, emphasizing the poignant act of Hector's soldiers collecting and honoring their fallen comrades after a night of fierce clashes. Roman, perceptive and shrewd, saw an opportunity in leveraging the compassion within Hector's leadership. Roman asserted that Butler would serve as the catalyst leading to Edwin Hector's eventual failure in judgment. The intricacies of Roman's strategy hinged on the dual nature of his intentions, bringing down Butler without delivering a fatal blow thus fulfilling the requirements of the first plan. Roman's tactical finesse involved rendering Butler incapable of further combat, strategically dismantling a key asset for the opposing forces. Returning to the heat of battle, Roman deftly executed his plans. His focus shifted to thwarting the efforts of soldiers attempting to rescue the incapacitated Butler. As the chaos ensued, Roman couldn't help but share his candid thoughts on Edwin Hector's leadership. While acknowledging Edwin's qualities as a ruler, Roman asserted that the battlefield was no place for someone of Edwin's caliber. This sentiment underscored the harsh realities of war and the demands it placed on those thrust into its midst. 
a few soldiers managed to breach Roman's offensive and reach Butler. Viscount Parchus, observing the events unfold, found himself in awe as everything unfolded exactly as Roman had predicted. The precision with which Roman's plans materialized led Parchus to contemplate Roman's significance as a strategic asset. The realization dawned upon Parchus that Roman, with his uncanny foresight, was indeed the greatest talent that Cairo had produced. In the grander scheme of political maneuvering, Parchus now understood the strategic value of recruiting Roman, as emphasized by Marquis Benedict. Roman's potential extended beyond the immediate battlefield, offering a potential advantage in the broader geopolitical landscape. Parchus, astounded by the unfolding events, gave orders for his soldiers to advance and implement the ambush, fully embracing the strategic advantage Roman's plans afforded them. As the ambush played out, Edwin Hector grappled with the consequences of his decisions. Frustration and self-deprecation colored his reflections as he admitted his own perceived inadequacies. Edwin recognized the pivotal moment when Butler fell as the turning point that seemingly stripped him of his ability to make sound decisions. The weight of command, rationality, and the harsh reality of warfare converged within Edwin's internal struggle. Despite the internal turmoil, Edwin remained resolute. He recognized that the situation was not irreparable, and there remained a potential avenue for victory. The key, as he contemplated, lay in Hector's ability to save Butler and close the fortress gates. It was a precarious hope, but Edwin clung to the belief that such a strategic move could tip the scales in their favor. In a bid to seize control of the narrative once more, Edwin unleashed his runeflare magic, launching an attack on the Cairo forces. Simultaneously, Hector's mages added their arcane prowess to the assault. This unexpected collaboration between magical forces surprised Parchus, prompting quick thinking and adaptive orders to his soldiers. The need to capitalize on the fleeting opportunity presented by the open fortress gates. If the fortress gate were to close, more lives among the Cairo soldiers would be lost. Witnessing the urgent need to act, a frustrated Hector Knight named Kellen recognized the necessity of swiftly shutting the fortress gate. In response, a soldier informed Kellen that Captain Butler was approaching, prompting Kellen to emphasize the importance of closing the gate promptly. Kellen directed the soldier to ensure that once the gate closed, Hector's mages should activate the defense spell without delay. Sensing an opportunity, Roman seized the moment and charged towards the gate, aiming to enter before it closed. The soldiers under Hector were shocked by Roman's advance and desperately tried to prevent him from entering. Undeterred, Roman employed his second form of the heavenly demon technique, effectively breaking the gate completely. In the aftermath of this decisive move, Roman shouted triumphantly, declaring that the gate was now wide open. Seizing the advantage, Roman swiftly commanded the Cairo army to charge forward without hesitation. Viscount Parchus issued a decisive order, commanding the Cairo army to eradicate the remnants of Hector's forces. The ensuing clash marked the convergence of the Cairo and Hector armies, soldiers from both sides falling in the heat of the battle. Meanwhile, Roman found solace in the belief that the operation to open the castle gate had triumphed, leaving the Cairo army with a singular goal, the elimination of Hector's commander. As Roman confronted Hector on the battlefield, Edwin Hector, the lone survivor, grappled with the weight of his perceived failures. Edwin's initial strategy, focused on attacking and occupying the enemy's rear bases, seemed flawless until the arrival of Roman Dimitri. Frustration welled within Edwin as he laid blame on Roman for the capture of the fifth line of defense and guerrilla operations in the mountains, resulting in the loss of a thousand Hectorian soldiers. Edwin, burdened by the enormity of the situation, questioned the divine orchestration of his existence. Why God had deemed him the star of Hector and sent Roman Dimitri into the heart of the Cairo kingdom. Roman, standing resolute before Edwin, acknowledged their reunion. Edwin reciprocated with a stern expression, warning Roman that if he perished on that battlefield, Roman would follow him into the afterlife. In an attempt to vanquish Roman, Edwin merged his fire and wind spells, unleashing a formidable assault. However, Roman's deft maneuvers allowed him to block Edwin's onslaught with skillful precision. Observing the unfolding struggle, Hector's ore-infused soldiers rushed to Edwin's aid, coordinating a relentless strike against Roman. Despite their synchronized efforts, Roman, utilizing his heavenly demon technique, swiftly incapacitated all three soldiers with a singular, masterful stroke. Undeterred by the setback, Edwin launched a dual assault, Entangle and Fire Spell Inferno, aiming to overwhelm Roman. Yet, Roman, seemingly impervious, effortlessly cut through Edwin's attacks. As Roman closed in, Edwin unleashed a barrage of lightning spells, landing a direct hit on his adversary. In that moment, 
Edwin believed he had secured victory, only to be caught off guard as Roman, with uncanny swiftness, materialized behind him. Roman's declaration signaled the culmination of their conflict. Just as he prepared to deliver the final blow, in the chaotic aftermath of the battlefield, Kellen, the soldier who had bravely closed the gate, found himself standing between Edwin and Roman. Without hesitation, he made the ultimate sacrifice, laying down his life to shield Edwin from impending danger. The scene unfolded with a tragic, leaving Edwin in shock as he witnessed his loyal comrade fall before him. Roman, the ominous figure approaching Edwin, had malice in his eyes. However, just as Roman was about to strike, a sudden surge of activity erupted. Jackson, accompanied by a group of resolute soldiers, rushed to Edwin's aid. Their timely intervention created a diversion, distracting Roman and allowing Jackson to swiftly grab Edwin. As they retreated from the immediate danger, Jackson implored Edwin to regain his composure. In the midst of the chaos, Jackson questioned Edwin's resolve. Did he truly intend to meet his end on the battlefield, labeled as a cowardly loser? The urgency in Jackson's voice emphasized the gravity of the situation. Edwin, still reeling from Kellen's sacrifice, began to grapple with the harsh reality of the war unfolding around him. With Edwin in tow, Jackson continued to offer guidance, reminding him not to let the sacrifices made by those who gave their lives for the prince be in vain. As they moved away from the front lines, Jackson's words took on a paternal tone. He implored Edwin to survive, emphasizing that his survival was crucial not only for himself, but for the memory of those who had fallen in his defense. As the group retreated, Jackson gave orders for the soldiers to abandon the castle. The decision to withdraw was a strategic one, aimed at ensuring Edwin's safety. The soldiers rallied, creating a protective barrier around Roman, who was momentarily held at bay. Their coordinated efforts were a desperate attempt to buy time for Edwin and Hector Prince to escape the imminent threat posed by Roman. However, Roman, displaying a formidable prowess, unleashed his full force upon the soldiers. In a swift and brutal display, he overpowered each defender in his path. Edwin, already wounded and witnessing the carnage, couldn't help but view Roman as a monstrous force, an embodiment of the brutal nature of war. Amidst the chaos, an injured soldier confronted Roman. In a last-ditch effort, the soldier declared that Cairo had already won the fight and implored Roman to cease his assault. Roman, unyielding and resolute, dismissed the soldier's plea. He asserted that he had warned Hector about the consequences of their war and vowed to dismantle all of Hector's forces. Roman coldly admonished the soldier not to adopt the role of a victim before decisively defeating him. As the dust settled, the Cairo army commander announced the victory. However, the arrival of Roman had not gone unnoticed. The main force of Cairo, with their commanders in tow, entered the scene, greeted by the shocking sight of Roman. His presence had single-handedly overturned the trajectory of a losing war a feat unparalleled in its audacity. The value of Roman Dimitri, once shrouded in mystery, soared high into the sky, leaving an indelible mark on the wake of the war. Roman, with a sinister yet triumphant smile, observed the arrival of the army inside the gate. The victory was not just for Cairo, but a testament to the enigmatic and formidable force that was Roman Dimitri. Cairo reveled in the glory of a grand victory, a triumphant moment that echoed through the city streets. However, before the joyous news could reach the capital, unsettling reports spread among the populace. Whispers told of the Hector Kingdom breaching Cairo's borders, launching an attack on the southern front line. The information, gathered from southern merchants, painted a bleak picture of the current situation in the south. An air of concern hung heavy as people feared that Cairo might be hesitant to increase taxes in the face of war's looming shadow. Amidst this atmosphere of uncertainty, the narrative shifted to the hallowed halls of the Cairo Royal Academy, where the D-Class engaged in a heated match. The contenders were William Castro and Lorin Dimitri, the younger brother of Roman. The clash began with William charging at Lorin with unbridled force, a display of determination etched on his face. Lorin, barely able to fend off William's relentless attacks, found himself cornered and frightened. In a desperate attempt, Lorin blindly struck back, but William, swift and strategic, outmaneuvered him. The final blow left Lorin sprawled on the floor, marking William as the victorious combatant. The aftermath of the duel unfolded in a conversation between Lorin and the stern instructor. Lorin's motivation for joining the Cairo Royal Academy was to master the art of swordsmanship. However, his inability to face an opponent's swinging blade, compounded by the act of closing his eyes during combat, revealed a critical flaw. The instructor, in no uncertain terms, declared Lorin lacking in talent. 
An ominous warning followed. If Loren failed to improve in upcoming exams, he faced the grim prospect of being demoted to the E-class. The weight of this pronouncement struck Loren with shock in the realization that being placed among 15-year-olds at the age of 18 would be a stinging humiliation. Seated on a bench, contemplating his uncertain future, Loren became the recipient of unexpected words from William. Walking with an air of casual confidence, William approached Loren. He recounted his childhood belief that everyone in the Dimitri family was extraordinary, only to discover that some are born with inherent limitations. William, candid and matter-of-fact, expressed that miracles, like the birth of someone as remarkable as Sir Rodwell into a normal family, rarely occurred twice within the same lineage. As these words settled on Loren, a sense of sadness enveloped him, realizing that the name Rodwell would cast a long shadow over his aspirations. William's friends, observing the interaction, remarked on the lack of amusement in the situation. In their speculation, they questioned the validity of the rumor circulating about Roman Dimitri's supposed victory over Homeros. William confidently dismisses the rumors circulating about the Dimitri family. He asserts that the tales are mere fabrications, strategically spread by the family to divert attention from their eldest son's reputation for being somewhat dim-witted. William, adopting a candid tone, goes on to express his straightforward observation that, in his eyes, Loren, as the third son of the Dimitri family, appears to be less than competent. As Loren meanders through his thoughts, he contemplates the validity of the rumors surrounding his elder brother, Roman. Although Loren doesn't recall Roman as a negative influence, William's insistence that Roman lacks the strength to defeat Homeros, a claim that Loren deems an obvious falsehood, leaves him somewhat skeptical. The plot thickens as Loren notices a commotion near the entrance of the Cairo Royal Academy. Intrigued, he approaches the gathering to eavesdrop on the conversations. The crowd is abuzz with rumors about the southern front line of Cairo, teetering on the brink of succumbing to Hector's forces before a miraculous reversal occurred. Roman Dimitri, the youngest ranker, emerges as a central figure in this unexpected turn of events. The rumors swirling around Roman intensify, painting a portrait of extraordinary feats. It is suggested that Roman not only defeated Hector with a mere 200 soldiers, but also triumphed in a one-on-one -on -one battle against a renowned five-star swordsman named Butler. Loren, grappling with disbelief, wonders if these tales refer to the Roman Dimitri he knows, his older brother. The exaggeration in these rumors, with Roman single-handedly besting Hector and a skilled swordsman, seems almost fantastical to Loren. Amid the murmurs, a soldier interrupts, calling for people to make way for the hero of the South, Roman Dimitri. The scene unfolds dramatically as Roman, mounted on his horse, makes a grand entrance. Loren, caught off guard by his brother's unexpected presence, can't help but be shocked by the turn of events. The narrative then transitions to the royal palace, where King Daniel extends a warm and appreciative welcome to Roman. The king expresses his joy at finally meeting Roman, attributing a considerable debt of gratitude to him for saving the southern front. In the king's eyes, Roman's actions have not only preserved the integrity of the southern front, but also served as a testament to the unwavering will of Cairo. King Daniel, genuinely moved by Roman's heroics, goes a step further, offering to fulfill any desire Roman may have. This gracious offer is accompanied by the king's assurance that he will grant Roman's request, provided it falls within the realm of the king's capabilities. King Daniel unfolds a surprising revelation to Roman. Count Nicholas, the captain of the royal knights and deemed the strongest swordsman in Cairo, is in search of a successor. To Roman's astonishment, the king extends an unexpected offer, the position of vice-captain for Roman, along with unrestricted access to the royal family's repository. Furthermore, King Daniel grants Roman exemption from his remaining duties at the border. As the royal proposition is laid out, Roman senses the king's strategic maneuvering. Roman, contemplating the circumstances, reflects on King Daniel's ascension to the throne at a young age following the untimely demise of the previous monarch. The king's motive becomes apparent. By aligning Roman with the royal faction, King Daniel seeks to fortify his position against potential threats, even from the influential aristocratic faction. Despite being labeled a seemingly weak monarch, Daniel recognizes the need to secure his reign, understanding the complexities of political dynamics within the kingdom. Marquis Benedict, however, is quick to voice concern. He contends that the king's offer imposes a heavy burden on Roman, a young and talented individual with a bright future. Benedict urges King Daniel to reconsider, echoing the sentiment that rewarding someone with additional responsibilities is not a true reward. 
The other nobles in attendance align themselves with Benedict's perspective, believing that the king's proposal is an unfair imposition on Roman's future. Yet, King Daniel stands firm in his decision, emphasizing that he has already outlined the reward he wishes to bestow upon Roman. In a surprising twist, the king leaves the final choice to Roman, an unexpected move that startles the assembled nobles. Roman, interpreting the king's gesture, discerns a lingering regal essence within Daniel, despite the perceived weaknesses. Grateful for the honor associated with the position of a royal knight, Roman asserts that he feels no obligation to come to the aid of the Cairo royal family. He candidly expresses the need for time to prepare himself before deciding on his future. Roman admits to feeling like a small entity within the confines of his country and reveals a desire to step into the larger world at his own pace. The unexpected revelation unfolds as Roman unveils a personal plan to challenge the open-ranking competition of the Cairo Kingdom, testing his limits by challenging ranks from 99 to 1 once his preparations are complete. The revelation of Roman's desire to participate in the open-ranking battles catches King Daniel off guard. These battles, characterized by endless challenges, allow participants to fight until defeat or until their opponent is brought to their knees. If victorious, the challenger ascends to the position of the vanquished. Concerned for Roman's well-being, King Daniel cautions that such battles could even cost someone their life, recognizing that this conversation requires a more careful and private discussion. Acknowledging the gravity of the situation, Roman assures the king that he comprehends the risks involved. Despite the potential pursuit of wealth or fame, Roman has chosen to forego these opportunities in favor of a new and formidable challenge. The king, in turn, admires Roman's decision, interpreting it as a testament to his unwavering confidence. The nobles in the room join in the praise, hailing Roman as the hero of Cairo and expressing eager anticipation for the impending ranking battles. Roman's reputation, especially for defeating Hector's formidable swordsman, Butler, precedes him. Marquis Benedict, Reflecting on Roman's rejection of the king's proposal to become a royal knight, discerns a deeper motive. He surmises that Roman, seeking to establish his own worth, has opted for the ranking battles. Benedict, contemplating Roman's decision, sees no reason to intervene. With Roman still in his mid-twenties, the ranking battles present an opportunity for the faction nobles to witness and assess Roman's true capabilities. Benedict believes that Roman's journey through these battles will unfold organically allowing him to carve out his own path. Roman, addressing the king, expresses confidence that he will prove himself in the near future. He envisions a time when, after the ranking battles conclude, he will no longer be a subordinate sword, but will instead emerge as a new player in the game. This declaration signifies Roman's aspiration for self-discovery and independence beyond the confines of loyalty to any particular faction or role. The narrative then shifts to Marquis Benedict in his room, engaging in a reflective conversation with Roman. Benedict acknowledges the unpredictable nature of life, revealing that he initially sent Roman to the southern front line for what he believed was Roman's benefit. However, the unexpected declaration of war by Hector altered the course of events, transforming Roman into the hero who thwarted Hector's plans. Roman, displaying gratitude, recognizes the experience as valuable, a crucible that has shaped his character and capabilities. Marquis finds himself taken aback as Roman unfolds his plans for the future. Reflecting on his experiences during the war with Hector, Roman shares that it has opened his eyes to the vastness of the world beyond Cairo. In a bid to gauge his strength within the kingdom, Roman expresses his intent to partake in the open ranking battles. His ultimate goal is clear. Once he establishes himself as the strongest in Cairo, he envisions venturing into the broader world to achieve greatness. In response to Roman's declaration, Benedict, too, shares his past dreams of venturing into the expansive world. However, upon realizing the enormity of the world, Benedict chose contentment with his present life. The Marquis then divulges a personal aspect of his life. He has a daughter. Since the untimely demise of her mother, Benedict has invested considerable effort into raising her. The unexpected takes another turn as Benedict surprises Roman with an unconventional proposal. Drawing parallels between Roman and the formidable individuals he encountered in his youth, Benedict sees in Roman the potential for extraordinary growth. He acknowledges that Roman, despite lacking innate talents, possesses a unique ability to match those born with exceptional abilities. Aware of Roman's decision to break off his engagement, Benedict expresses his desire to offer his daughter to Roman. Benedict's offer, however, comes with a thoughtful caveat. He assures Roman that he won't coerce his daughter into marriage 
emphasizing a commitment to ensuring her happiness and autonomy in the matter. Benedict proposes arranging a meeting between Roman and his daughter, underlining that the decision rests on mutual feelings. The Marquis makes it clear that he won't rush Roman into meeting his daughter, allowing the two to develop a natural connection. Benedict's heartfelt revelation about watching over Roman both in the past and the present adds a layer of sincerity and care to their relationship. Encouraging Roman to consider joining him on a journey in the future, Benedict extends an offer that promises Roman the fulfillment of any desires within the Cairo kingdom. Benedict contemplates the significance of Roman's existence, recognizing it as a force capable of disrupting the delicate balance of power in the Cairo kingdom. The factions vying for control, the four powerful entities that dominate Cairo, harbor intense desires to secure Roman for themselves. Count Gregory and Count Denver, representatives of these factions, have gone so far as to extend startling proposals to Roman. Yet, Roman, also known as the heavenly demon Beak Jung, stands firm in his resolve, unwilling to serve under any other faction. The scene transitions to Roman's room, where Hans is taken aback by the unexpected presence of Roman. Overwhelmed with relief, Hans's concern for Roman's well-being prompts him to inquire if Roman is injured. His tears of joy flow freely as he realizes that Roman has returned unharmed. This emotional reunion highlights the genuine and deep connection between Roman and Hans, emphasizing the impact of Roman's safety on those who care for him. Days later, Roman is found in a moment of repose, calmly sipping tea. Hans, the ever-attentive confidant, suggests that Roman meet with young Master Loren. This suggestion stems from Hans's recent encounter with Loren after Roman's relocation to the capital. Having raised both young masters since their youth, Hans keenly senses that Loren is grappling with undisclosed troubles. Rather than prying, Hans patiently awaits Loren's willingness to share his concerns. Encouraging Loren to speak his mind freely, Hans listens as Loren inquires about Roman's recent exploits. Loren had caught wind of rumors circulating in the capital regarding Roman's return, guarded by a group of individuals, and his alleged victory against a Hector Ranker. Confirming the authenticity of these rumors, Hans divulges the tumultuous events within the Dimitri family. This includes the termination of Roman's engagement with Lawrence, the conflict with the Barco family, the defeat of Omeros, and Roman's pivotal role in securing victory on the southern front line. Loren, confronted with the reality that all the rumors were indeed true, is visibly shocked. Hans further reveals that, due to the positive changes in young Master Roman's behavior, the Baron has found contentment in recent days. Urging Loren to meet with Roman in person, Hans informs him that Roman is expected to arrive at the accommodations later that night. Loren reassures Hans that he's okay and quietly departs. In reflecting on the three Dimitri brothers, Hans contemplates their distinct personalities. Among them, young master Loren stands out with his delicate and sensitive nature. Returning to the room, Hans confides in Roman, expressing concern that Loren might be facing bullying at the academy. Hans senses that Loren may be seeking help, but is hesitant to broach the topic directly. Upon hearing this, Roman considers the situation. Loren, the youngest among the Dimitri brothers, may not require Roman's protection solely based on their familial ties. Nevertheless, Roman assures Hans that he will personally meet with Loren. Hans's joy is evident, although Roman wonders if his agreement stems solely from Hans's request. The narrative then shifts to Viscount Parchus who contemplates the apparent delay in recruiting Roman Dimitri. Undeterred, Viscount Parchus believes there's an alternative route to gaining favor with the Baron. Despite the indefinite delay in recruiting Roman, this man remains confident that pleasing the Baron is still within reach. Viscount Parchus, a discerning noble, perceived a hidden truth amidst the prevailing focus on Roman within the realm. While Roman was the central figure of attention, Parchus recognized the exceptional talents that lay within Roman's loyal subordinates. A keen strategist, Parchus envisioned the potential of recruiting these individuals, anticipating the joy it would bring to Marquis Benedict, particularly with regard to a certain individual named Chris. Chris, among Roman subordinates, possessed a talent so remarkable that it would be welcomed with open arms by any noble in the capital. However, this realization did not come to Parchus through hearsay or rumors. It emerged from his personal exploration on the southern front. The direct experience revealed to him that Roman subordinates were, without a doubt, worth recruiting. Parchus contemplated the possibility of bringing Chris and the other subordinates into the central government fold. If successful, it could expedite the trust-building process with Marquis Benedict. The strategic move had the potential to reshape alliances and elevate Parchus's standing within the political landscape. 
Shifting the narrative to Chris, we find him engrossed in rigorous training. Reflecting on the past, Chris recalled the initial encounter with Roman, a time when Roman seemed within reach. Back then, Chris harbored aspirations of surpassing Lord Roman, believing it to be an achievable goal. However, as time unfolded, Roman transcended into a realm beyond Chris's initial comprehension. A defining moment occurred during Roman's confrontation with Butler, where Chris witnessed feats that defied the bounds of possibility. The shock and awe of that battle left an indelible mark on Chris's perception of Roman's capabilities. The realization dawned that Roman had entered a whole different dimension, surpassing the conceivable limits that Chris had envisioned. Yet, amidst the shock, Chris found purpose and determination. Following Roman closely, observing his every move, Chris experienced exponential growth within the last six months. The journey with Roman became a catalyst for personal development, pushing Chris to new heights that even he found difficult to fathom. The resolve solidified within Chris. The pursuit of surpassing Lord Roman became a serious and unwavering goal. As Chris continued to hone his skills, Viscount Parchus entered the scene, extending greetings to the dedicated trainee. Dispensing with formalities, Parchus swiftly broached the topic at hand. He expressed a keen interest in recruiting Chris, recognizing the exceptional potential that lay within him. However, Chris, fueled by determination and loyalty to Roman, promptly declined the offer. Parchus, taken aback by Chris's quick refusal, sought to understand the rationale behind the decision. He emphasized the transformative nature of the opportunity, one that could completely alter the trajectory of Chris's life. In an attempt to address potential concerns, Parchus mentioned the substantial financial rewards that would accompany the allegiance to the central government, ensuring a lifetime of prosperity for Chris, a foretelling that Chris is destined for fame. Coupled with the opportunity to serve Marquis Benedict, the true force behind the central government was dangled before him. The promise was enticing. Anything Chris desired within the Cairo kingdom would be granted by the central government. Yet, despite the allure of such prospects, Chris remained unimpressed. Viscount Parchus, the bearer of this proposition, sensed Chris's hesitation and attempted to quell any concerns about potential betrayal to Sir Roman. Parchus assured Chris that Roman Dimitri would eventually align himself with Marquis Benedict, making Chris's preemptive move to the central government a strategic and sensible choice. Chris, however, arbored doubts about Roman willingly becoming Benedict's subordinate, given Roman's known character traits. Parchus, confident in the inevitability of Roman's alignment with Benedict, saw it as a natural course of action, given the overwhelming power that Benedict wielded. From Chris's perspective, though, Parchus seemed oblivious to the true nature of Lord Roman. Chris had witnessed Roman as a figure who wouldn't bow his head to anyone, a leader of unparalleled independence and resolve. Chris made it clear to Parchus that, regardless of the offers presented, he had no intention of leaving Roman's side. Roman Dimitri, in Chris's eyes, was irreplaceable, and no allure of fame or position could sever the bond of loyalty. This decision, while met with understanding from Parchus, left him bemused by what he perceived as Chris's refusal to grasp a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Undeterred, Parchus extended the same offer to other key figures in Roman's circle. Kevin, a devoted follower of Roman, flatly rejected the proposal, emphasizing that his entire life was dedicated to serving Roman. Parchus, shocked by the depth of Kevin's commitment, began to realize the profound loyalty that bound Roman's followers. Turning to Pucky, another stalwart in Roman's camp, Parchus encountered yet another refusal. Pucky, echoing Kevin's sentiments, couldn't fathom betraying Roman and remained resolute in his allegiance. The pattern repeated itself as Parchus approached each of Roman's comrades, revealing an unyielding unity among them. Their loyalty to Roman went beyond political calculations or the allure of power. As Parchus crossed paths with Henderson, one of Roman's trusted associates. As Parchus approached Henderson for a conversation, the unexpected occurred. Henderson, in a surprising move, covered his ears and swiftly retreated from the scene. The bewildering display of unwavering loyalty left Parchus in a state of shock, questioning the depth of commitment Roman subordinates held for their leader. Pondering the enigma of this allegiance, Parchus couldn't help but wonder what made Roman such a charismatic and revered figure among his followers. The narrative then shifted to the training ground, where Loren engaged in a solitary pursuit of mastering the art of swordsmanship. Frustration lingered in Loren's thoughts as he contemplated a recent conversation with Hans. The contrast between the Roman he remembered, once considered the fool of Dimitri, and the current hero of Cairo who defeated Butler perplexed Loren. 
Swinging his sword with increasing frustration, Loren couldn't escape the nagging question of why he seemed stuck in a stagnant state while Roman soared to new heights. In a burst of determination, Loren unleashed his full force on a training target. The physical exertion left him lying on the ground, gasping for breath. It was at this moment that Roman, unexpectedly, appeared from behind. Roman inquired about Lauren's presence and revealed that he had heard from Hans about Lauren's search for him. Roman, with an air of seriousness, urged Loren to speak up if there was anything on his mind. Loren, initially hesitant, attempted to brush off the matter as inconsequential. However, Roman, in his characteristic straightforward manner, labeled Loren as pathetic and began to leave. Undeterred, Loren found the courage to shout after Roman, declaring his intention to speak up and share everything. The abrupt halt in Roman's departure signaled a pivotal moment, inviting Loren to reveal the thoughts weighing heavily on his mind. Seated on a nearby bench, Loren opened up to Roman, expressing his initial disbelief upon hearing rumors of Roman's transformation. The Roman Loren remembered had little interest in swords, even delegating border duties to others. In stark contrast, the Roman of the present was hailed as the hero of Cairo. Loren sought clarity on the profound change in Roman's character and the events that led to this transformation. Loren questioned Roman about the experiences that shaped the significant shift, highlighting the shared struggles they faced in the past. Loren confessed his desire to emulate Roman, aspiring to become someone his father could be proud of. Loren yearns for authenticity in his relationship with his father. He refuses to adopt a facade of false contentment while reaching out to his father wishing instead to reveal genuine accomplishments. Overwhelmed by this emotional honesty, Loren breaks into tears. Roman, observing Loren's vulnerability, acknowledges that at barely 18 years old, Loren might not be equipped to bear the weight of harsh realities just yet. Contemplating how to navigate Loren's fragility, Roman reflects on the acceptance he received from the people in Dimitri. They embrace the new version of Roman, relinquishing the outdated image and affording him a second chance. Realizing the significance of this approach, Roman decides to extend the same understanding to his family members, Loren and Rodwell included. He resolves to evaluate them based on present experiences rather than clinging to memories of the past. Roman addresses Loren, expressing his aversion to seeing anyone bearing the Dimitri name being looked down upon. He emphasizes the potential repercussions on both the Dimitri reputation and his own if Loren were to face such disdain. With a firm belief in Loren's qualifications, Roman encourages him to prove himself in the Academy's upcoming swordsmanship exam. This marks a departure from Roman's previous life, where survival often meant facing life-or-death challenges with his brothers. In this new existence, Roman extends a gesture of opportunity and support to Loren. The dawn of the next day brings with it the anticipation of the swordsmanship exam. The teacher takes charge, commencing the evaluations as students engage in spirited matches. In the midst of the bustling activity, Loren reflects on Roman's challenge, a call to prove his worth if he sought answers to the questions swirling within him. Now, it is Loren's turn to face the exam, and standing across from him is William, exuding confidence and eager to settle their previous encounter with finality. The teacher sets the tone for the assessment, emphasizing that the results won't hinge on mere victories or defeats, but rather on the student's mastery of techniques. Fatal moves are explicitly discouraged emphasizing a focus on skill and understanding. As the teacher signals the beginning of the match, William charges at Loren with an unwavering force. Loren, however, demonstrates a deft ability to block William's initial assault, showcasing a commendable defense. Despite Loren's initial success, William, relying on his speed, attempts to exploit any opening and strike Loren down. In a moment hanging in the balance, Loren recalls Roman's words, a directive to use the swordsmanship exam as a platform to showcase his true capabilities and silence those who doubted him. In a surprising turn of events, Loren seizes the opportunity and swiftly strikes William in the face. The unexpected maneuver catches William off guard, prompting a momentary pause in the match. Inspired by the desire to emulate his brother Roman and assert his own competence, Loren launches a counterattack. The clash intensifies as Loren and William engage in a series of strikes and maneuvers each aiming to gain the upper hand. As the confrontation unfolds, William, frustrated by Loren's resilience, attempts to land a decisive blow. Simultaneously, Loren, drawing strength from his determination, retaliates with a striking blow of his own. The clash reaches a crescendo as both combatants find themselves hitting each other in a synchronized exchange of blows. The narrative then shifts to Loren waking up, 
his consciousness returning to the present. The teacher, impressed by the intense and closely contested match, acknowledges Lauren's resilience and quick reflexes. Despite William's aggressive onslaught, Lauren's ability to evade the attack with swift precision becomes a focal point of admiration. The teacher's praise extends beyond the current exam, recognizing Lauren's latent talent that had, until now, remained overshadowed by fear. The teacher reflects on Lauren's past matches, acknowledging that fear had frozen him, preventing him from showcasing his true capabilities. However, today's performance, coupled with the previous match, reveals a Lauren who is not only competent but also capable of overcoming his own inhibitions. The teacher's decision to match Lauren against William was deliberate, rooted in the belief that William posed a formidable challenge for Lauren to overcome. Startled by this assignment, Lauren sought clarification, asking the teacher if they truly meant what they said. The teacher reassured Lauren, emphasizing their commitment to honesty with students. Encouraging Lorin to have more confidence in himself, the teacher pointed out the similarities between Lorin and William, urging him not to let fear hold him back. Grateful for the encouragement, Lorin absorbed the advice as the scene transitioned. On the other side of the match, William seethed with anger over the unexpectedly close bout with Lorin. Unmoved by attempts from his friends to calm him down, William was resolute in his frustration, asserting that Lorin had dared to challenge him with his eyes. Fueled by this resentment, William declared his intention to take matters into his own hands, rallying his friends to join him in physically harming Lorraine. Despite warnings from his friends about potential repercussions, including strained relations between their families and the involvement of Roman Dimitri, William remained defiant. Undeterred, William highlighted his status as the eldest son of the Castro family and his father's close ties with Marquis Benedict. He boasted of his untouchable status in Cairo, dismissing the significance of Lauren's familial background. According to William, true authority overshadowed everything, and he aimed to assert this dominance over Lorraine. Confidently, he instructed his friends to fetch Lorraine immediately, setting the stage for a confrontation. In a dramatic turn of events, Roman emerged from the shadows, challenging William to repeat what he had just said. Roman, the hero of Cairo, demanded an explanation for the threats against his brother. William, initially confident, found himself facing an unexpected adversary. Roman confronted William, insisting on clarification regarding his intentions toward Lorraine. The friends accompanying William, taken aback by Roman's sudden appearance, bore witness to the unfolding confrontation between the two imposing figures. In a moment of unwavering confidence, William boldly declared that he would repeat himself if Roman desired to hear it again. However, before William could articulate another word, Roman closed the distance between them swiftly gripping William by the neck. With a commanding presence, Roman conveyed his intent to showcase that the stature of William's family held no significance when confronted with genuine authority. Elevating William off the ground, Roman admonished him not only for bullying Lorraine, but also for the derogatory remarks aimed at the Dimitri name. Roman demanded immediate action, instructing William to escort him to the Castro family estate. This unexpected turn left William visibly surprised, grappling with the sudden escalation orchestrated by Roman. Roman, having released his hold on William, asserted the importance of accountability, emphasizing that parents should bear responsibility for their children's mistakes. The narrative then transitioned to the grandeur of the Castro family palace, where Viscount Parchus conveyed to Count Castro that all attempts to recruit Roman subordinates had met rejection. Parchus framed the rejection as a failure to recognize a road to success portraying the decision as a consequence of the limited perspective attributed to those with humble origins. Count Castro, seemingly amused by this revelation, chuckled and questioned Parchus about Roman's purported greatness. Parchus, seeking to affirm Roman's exceptional qualities, disclosed Marquis Benedict's earnest efforts to secure Roman's allegiance. The Viscount hinted at a significant possibility, Marquis Benedict contemplating Roman as a potential son-in-law. Count Castro, intrigued by this revelation, expressed a desire to meet Roman in person, contemplating a future encounter. He instructed Parchus to arrange a meeting should the opportune moment arise. The scene then shifted back to the dynamic between William and Roman, who had entered Count Castro's office. Eager to present his perspective, William informed his father about Roman's alleged threats, emphasizing the audacity of a commoner daring to challenge the eldest son of the Castro family. Frustrated by his son's disrespectful behavior, Count Castro rose from his seat, instructing William to cease speaking. He sternly reminded William of the individual he had provoked, Sir Roman, a hero who had saved Cairo. 
Expressing his displeasure, Count Castro administered a swift slap to William, reproaching him for his disrespectful remarks. Count Castro then turned his attention to Roman, offering a sincere apology for William's actions and expressing his commitment to disciplining his son. Acknowledging the severity of William's transgression, Count Castro assured Roman that he would administer a stern punishment to ensure that such disrespect would not be repeated. He beseeched Roman to accept his apologies and to assuage any lingering anger. Count Castro extended an invitation for Roman to share a cup of tea, hoping to forge a positive relationship. In Count Castro's mind, this unexpected situation presented a fortuitous opportunity to build a connection with Roman, and he was optimistic about the potential benefits. However, Roman, maintaining a serious demeanor, questioned Count Castro's actions. He emphasized that the decision to accept or reject the apology rested solely with him and wasn't within Count Castro's purview. In the midst of escalating tensions, Roman pointed the accusatory finger squarely at Count Castro, asserting that the root cause of the current predicament lay squarely at the feet of the enigmatic nobleman. The catalyst for this discord, according to Roman, was none other than William. The situation took a dire turn when William brazenly confided in Roman, openly revealing his sinister intention to break Lauren's arm. To Roman, these words were more than a mere threat. They were as good as an impending act of violence. Count Castro, caught in the crossfire of this brewing conflict, confronted Roman about the situation. The Count queried Roman on his intentions, probing whether Roman harbored thoughts of retaliatory violence against William. Attempting to steer the narrative towards a more amicable resolution, Count Castro suggested engaging in a reasonable negotiation, one that could salvage the fragile threads of their future relationship. In a bid to defuse the tension, Count Castro inquired about Roman's desired course of action. In response, Roman outlined a stringent set of conditions for peace. He demanded that William publicly kneel and offer a heartfelt apology to Lorin in front of a scrutinizing audience. Furthermore, Roman insisted that William voluntarily withdraw from the academy, driven by a fervent desire to keep his brother, a figure of familial significance, far removed from the undesirable influence of someone like William. The ultimatum hung in the air, a stark choice between compliance and the ominous specter of war with the formidable Dimitri family. Roman, with a solemn demeanor, emphasized that the ball was now firmly in Count Castro's court. The Count, however, dismissed those of lowly birth as a perpetual headache. In a pointed retort, he questioned whether Roman's perceived greatness stemmed solely from the Marquis Benedict's attention. Count Castro asserted that Roman wasn't even worthy of occupying the same room as the esteemed Marquis. With unwavering determination, Count Castro vowed to showcase the might and influence of the central government nobility, seizing the opportunity to put Roman in his place. The tension between the two noble figures reached a critical juncture as Count Castro turned to Viscount Parchus a witness to the entire unfolding drama. Count Castro implored Parchus to testify before the Marquis, leveraging his account to bolster the Count's perspective on the matter. Count Castro, sensing the need for authoritative intervention, declared his intention to mete out appropriate punishment to Roman for what he deemed a crossing of the line. However, Viscount Parchus, nicknamed the Raccoon of Cairo among nobles, known for his exceptional abilities and survival instincts, while many people have exceptional abilities, the ones who make it through to the end, who endure and thrive, are the ones with qualities similar to Parchus. Parchus emerges as a key player with a discerning eye for the current state of affairs. His strategic acumen allows him to cultivate acquaintances and broker deals with individuals whose interests align with his own, positioning him as a formidable force despite his family's lack of significant bearing in the grand hierarchy. Conversely, Count Castro boasts a lineage steeped in prestige, forging a close friendship with Marquis Benedict from a young age. However, the unfolding conflict pits Count Castro against Roman Dimitri. Ordinarily, Parchus might be expected to align with Count Castro, yet the intricacies of Marquis Benedict's character introduce an unexpected twist. Marquis Benedict, known for his pragmatic approach that prioritizes victory over personal connections, is actively pursuing Roman as a potential son-in-law. This strategic move adds a unique dynamic to the clash between Count Castro and Roman Dimitri, forcing Parchus to reconsider his allegiances. In a surprising turn of events, Parchus advises Count Castro to address any wrongdoing committed by his son, William, rather than attempting to conceal the young noble's mistakes. This counsel catches Count Castro off guard, especially considering Parchus's reputation as Cairo's raccoon, a strategic thinker who calculates every move. 
Parchus has foreseen that supporting the Dimitri side would bring more significant profits, compelling him to make an unexpected recommendation. Count Castro, aware of the potential consequences of going to war against Roman without the backing of the central government, recognizes the need to prioritize pragmatism over pride. Consequently, he extends a heartfelt apology to Roman, setting aside personal ego for the sake of his family. This unforeseen act of contrition shocks William, witnessing his father humbling himself before a perceived rival. From Roman's perspective, the incident sheds light on the inherent flaws within the nobility, who often harbor a misplaced sense of superiority. As Roman's influence in the kingdom grows, so does the threat posed by jealous and conceited individuals. Recognizing the potential dangers, Roman deems it necessary to assert his authority and set an example. While it might not be a terrible suggestion for that someone to be Count Castro, he acquiesces to Sir Roman's recommendation. Count Castro commits to having William apologize to Lorraine, Roman's brother, and to voluntarily withdraw from the academy. William, taken aback by this unexpected turn, is left in a state of shock. In response, Roman offers a subtle smile and gracefully departs, signaling the conclusion of the matter. Expressing gratitude for Roman's generosity, Count Castro acknowledges the resolution. Meanwhile, William, now reflecting on the consequences of his actions, wonders about the gravity of the figure he has provoked. In the quiet confines of Lauren's dorm room, the atmosphere shifted abruptly as William's friend barged in. With a grave expression, he relayed distressing news to Loren. His brother Roman had been involved in a heated altercation with William. The cause? William's anger over a hit he had received from Loren during their scuffle. Shock washed over Loren as he absorbed the gravity of the situation. According to William's friend, tensions escalated when William expressed his desire to break Lauren's arm, a threat that Roman had overheard. The revelation sent a chill down Lauren's spine. As if that weren't enough, William had whisked Roman away to meet with Count Castro following the confrontation. The mere mention of Count Castro sent Lauren's thoughts spiraling into a realm of apprehension. Realizing the potential danger his brother faced, Lauren's mind raced with concern. Guilt nodded him. If anything befell Roman because of his actions, Lorraine knew he would never forgive himself. It was a burden heavy enough to crush even the stoutest of hearts. Driven by a surge of panic and determination, Lorraine wasted no time. He bolted out of his room, his footsteps echoing down the corridor as he raced to find help. The urgency of the situation weighed heavily upon him as he contemplated the ominous implications of Roman's encounter with the formidable Count Castro. Desperate to ensure his brother's safety, Lorraine reached for the only lifeline he could grasp, the magic call. With trembling hands, he summoned his father, his voice quivering with emotion as he relayed the dire circumstances. Roman, his beloved brother, was in peril, potentially ensnared within the labyrinthine machinations of the powerful Castro family. On the other end of the magical conduit, Romero, Lauren's father, received the distress call. Shock and fury mingled in his veins as he listened to his son's trembling voice. This wasn't a mere triviality, it was a cry for help, a plea born of genuine fear and anguish. Romero's hand slammed against the table in a display of righteous indignation. It was a testament to the depth of his concern for his sons, a primal instinct to protect his kin at all costs. Romero Dimitri pondered over Lauren's unexpected call. He couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to it than met the eye. Lauren, typically reserved, wouldn't break down like that unless something grave had occurred. Turning to his wife, Romero voiced his concerns, seeking her counsel in this moment of uncertainty. She understood the intricacies of their family's ties with the powerful Castros, deeply intertwined with the central government and the influential Marquis Benedict. Should we involve ourselves? Romero inquired, his voice heavy with worry, knowing full well the potential ramifications of their actions. His wife's response was swift, tinged with urgency. Do you truly doubt the gravity of the situation? Our eldest son's safety hangs in the balance. Our allegiance to the central government can wait. The Dimitris are not so feeble as to cower in fear. Gratitude flooded Romero's heart as he embraced his wife's wisdom. With newfound resolve, he issued commands to his loyal vassals, summoning them to the Dimitri palace without delay. There was no time to waste. Roman's life hung in the balance, teetering on the precipice of uncertainty. As the vassals gathered, Romero addressed them with a sense of solemn urgency. He informed them of Roman's perilous predicament, emphasizing the gravity of the situation. The clash with the Castro family had thrust their family into the throes of danger, and swift action was imperative to ensure Roman's safety. In the unfolding saga of Roman's plight, a dire situation has arisen. He has been forcibly taken to the powerful Castro family. 
However, this formidable adversary is no ordinary foe. It is intricately linked with the central government. In the face of this ominous threat, Romero Dimitri, Roman's father, refuses to be a passive observer. The gravity of the situation prompts him to seek the approval and support of those around him, recognizing the potential widespread rejection of his proposed course of action. Romero, fully aware of the risks of going up against the central government, is prepared for the arduous task that lies ahead. However, to his surprise, Jonathan, the captain of the Dimitri Knight Order, emerges as a staunch ally. Jonathan acknowledges the perilous nature of opposing the central government but underscores the urgency of protecting Roman, the eldest son of the Dimitri family. He boldly pledges not only his own life but the lives of his knights to ensure the safety of young Master Roman. The rallying cry extends beyond the realm of knights to the master of the blacksmiths, Hendrik. Hendrik asks Romero Dimitri to inform him about how much supplies the soldiers will need for the war. Hendrik expresses that young Master Roman is crucial for the future of the Dimitri family and disregards any concerns about the Castro family. He insists that Dimitri must protect Roman at all costs. Hendrik believes that everyone, including miners, iron mine workers, and residents of Dimitri territory, will support the decision to safeguard Roman. Romero is surprised by this overwhelming support, especially considering the Dimitri family's usual preference for peace. However, he realizes that now Dimitri must take on a leadership role in the Northeast region, united in their commitment to protecting Roman. The unanimous agreement to safeguard Roman extends throughout the Dimitri community, reaching even the iron mines. The news reverberates through the dark tunnels, reaching Jacob, who, upon hearing the urgency and the call to action, commands the miners to gather immediately. Despite their inability to directly participate in the impending conflict, Jacob urges his fellow miners to play a crucial role in preparing for war. The imperative is not lost on them. They must ready all necessary supplies and support those on the front lines. In a surprising turn of events, Moore can, entrusted with the safety of the miners, aligns himself with Jacob's fervor. Capital nobles have encroached upon the well-being of young Master Roman, and Morkin recognizes the need for an extraordinary response. He not only agrees with Jacob's directive but proposes an increase in production, advocating for a tireless work ethic even through the night. As the miners embark on this Herculean effort, their determination becomes palpable. Each swing of the hammer and every bead of sweat shed is a testament to their collective will to protect Roman. In this crucible of adversity, the Dimitri family, once known for its pursuit of peace, transforms into a united force ready to assert its influence as a regional power. As the urgency of Roman safety intensifies, a remarkable transformation takes hold within the Dimitri clan. In a matter of mere minutes, every member of the family shifts into action with a singular focus to ensure Romans return home unharmed. Yet, amidst this flurry of activity, those in the capital remain oblivious to the seismic shift occurring within the Dimitri family. Unaware of the bombshell that has been dropped, they continue with their own affairs, blissfully ignorant of the unfolding drama. After reaching out to his father for help, Loren emerges from his room, his mind swirling with a mix of apprehension and hope. He trusts that his father will intervene, but in the meantime, he grapples with the uncertainty of the situation. Determined to locate Roman, Loren steps outside, only to find a peculiar scene unfolding, a gathering of students murmuring amongst themselves. Confusion gnaws at him as he wonders why they're congregated. His bewilderment deepens when he spots Roman amidst the crowd. Roman beckons him closer, his expression serious. In a bold move, Roman demands that William publicly apologize to Loren for his mistreatment. There's an undercurrent of threat in his words, a warning of consequences should William refuse. It's a startling demand, and Loren watches, wide-eyed, as the events unfold. Count Castro, a figure of authority, steps in, adding weight to Roman's demand. With a stern tone, he instructs William to apologize swiftly. William offers a sincere apology to Loren, acknowledging his past behavior of bullying as a wrongdoing. With humility, William kneels before Loren and implores him to accept his apology. He expresses regret for his actions and takes responsibility for them. Additionally, William makes the decision to withdraw from the academy and assures Loren that he will not cross him path again. Loren's head spins with the sudden turn of events. He's torn between disbelief and relief, struggling to comprehend the swift resolution. Count Castro, sensing Loren's hesitation, urges him to accept William's apology. Assurances follow, as Count Castro promises that such behavior won't repeat itself. A gesture of humility comes from Count Castro himself as he bows an apology to Loren. Later, 
As the commotion settles, Loren seeks answers from Roman. His brother's explanation sheds light on the deeper significance of the confrontation. It wasn't just about Loren. It was a stand against the injustices suffered by the Dimitri family at the hands of the Castros. Roman's actions were driven by a desire to uphold the honor of their name, to assert their dignity in the face of oppression. Roman's words resonate with Loren, stirring a mix of emotions within him. He's moved by his brother's unwavering resolve and the courage it took to confront the powerful Castros. As Loren reflects on the events of the day, he's filled with a newfound sense of pride in his family's legacy. In a tender moment, Roman reminds Loren of their shared identity as Dimitris. He implores Loren to hold his head high, to embody the strength and resilience of their lineage. It's a poignant reminder of their bond, of the responsibility they bear to each other and to their family name. In the wake of the confrontation, a palpable shift occurs in the dynamics between the Dimitri and Castro families. The revelation of the Dimitri family's strength leaves Count Castro wary, dissuading him from any impulsive actions towards Loren. Loren, fueled by newfound enthusiasm, vows to heed Roman's earlier advice, refusing to let others mistreat him moving forward. A sense of resolution settles in the air, prompting a smile from Roman, who's relieved at the prospect of avoiding further familial discord. However, amidst the emotional aftermath, Loren's thoughts are abruptly interrupted by the recollection of his earlier call with his father. Realizing the potential repercussions of the situation, Loren implores Roman to swiftly contact their father. The urgency in Loren's voice reflects his concern for the unknown actions their father might take upon learning of the altercation. Meanwhile, at the Castro Palace, the repercussions of William's actions unfold. Count Castro, the patriarch of the Castro family, reacts with severity. A resounding slap echoes through the room as he chastises William for his grave mistake. Count Castro underscores the significance of Roman Dimitri and Cairo, highlighting the regard in which he is held by the influential powers of the city. Despite being the eldest son of the Castro family, William brought harm to Roman's younger brother. As a consequence, William found himself compelled to kneel before the public and offer a sincere apology. This unfortunate incident severely tarnished the reputation of the Castro family, as it became a subject of public discussion. The incident fueled perceptions that the Castro family lacked the insight to understand the dynamics within their kingdom, earning them the unwelcome label of being perceived as inept. Count Castro, frustrated by the turn of events, grappled with the fallout from William's actions. In the looming challenge of facing Marquis Benedict, a figure of considerable influence in the region, the damage inflicted on the Castro family's reputation becomes a point of deep concern for Count Castro, who laments the perception that they are incapable of understanding the prevailing sentiments within their own kingdom. Amidst this turmoil, a worker enters the room with unexpected news, a magic call from the Dimitri family. Count Castro finds himself in a state of astonishment and bewilderment upon learning of the situation. As he receives a call from Romero Dimitri, the latter asserts that while Count Castro, as a noble of the central government, may perceive Dimitri as weak, daring to interfere with one of the bloodlines of the Dimitri family is a grave mistake. Romero Dimitri makes it clear that he will not turn a blind eye to such actions, emphasizing the significance of the matter at hand. Count Castro is left in a state of bewilderment. He questions why Roman would escalate tensions over an incident that had seemingly concluded. With unwavering determination, Romero informs Count Castro that at the break of dawn, the Dimitri family will formally request a territory ward from the central government. This bold move signifies a direct challenge to the Castro family's influence and territorial claims. Furthermore, Romero declares that the Dimitri merchants will cease all transactions with the Castro family, cutting off a crucial source of supplies and revenue. This strategic maneuver not only weakens the Castros economically, but also sends a clear message of defiance. In a calculated move to further destabilize the Castro family, Romero announces his intention to collect on all outstanding debts owed by the Castros to the Golden Bank. This financial pressure adds another layer of complexity to the escalating conflict, placing additional strain on the Castro family's resources. But Romero's plans extend beyond mere economic warfare. He reveals that the Dimitri family has reached out to hostile factions opposed to the Castros, providing them with financial support and resources. This alliance with external adversaries amplifies the threat posed to the Castro family, as they now face opposition from within and without. Driven by a relentless determination to dismantle the Castro family's power structure, Romero is willing to resort to any means necessary. He acknowledges the potential risks and sacrifices involved, 
expressing a willingness to endure any hardship if it means achieving his ultimate goal of destroying the Castros. Count Castro, stunned by the severity of Romero's ultimatum, struggles to comprehend the magnitude of the situation. He is taken aback by the ruthlessness of the Dimitri family's tactics, recognizing shades of Romero's unwavering resolve in his son Roman's actions. The realization dawns upon him that he is facing an adversary who is equally determined and capable. Romero Dimitri issues a final warning to Count Castro, insisting that he release Roman immediately. Count Castro is taken aback by this demand, expressing confusion. He promptly assures Romero Dimitri that there must be a misunderstanding, as he is not holding any members of the Dimitri family captive at the moment. In a desperate attempt to defuse the escalating conflict, Count Castro assures Romero that the issue with Loren, which sparked the confrontation, has been resolved. He cites William's apology to Loren as evidence of their willingness to make amends. Upon hearing this, Romero Dimitri feels a pang of embarrassment. Count Castro reassures Romero that the issue concerning Roman has already been resolved, and he pledges to take every measure to prevent such incidents from occurring in the future. Acknowledging Count Castro's commitment, Romero Dimitri, feeling embarrassed, ends the call. As the scene shifts to the Dimitri territory, Romero reflects on the nature of leadership. He recognizes that true leaders are born with an innate ability to inspire and guide others, even in the face of adversity. Throughout the Dimitri territory, from the highest executives to the humblest artisans and miners, Roman has earned the affection and respect of all. As time passes, his father, Romero Dimitri, finds himself marveling at his son's growth. In a gathering of the Dimitri community, Romero surprises everyone by declaring that there will be no war. Instead, he announces a spontaneous celebration, urging everyone to revel as if there were no tomorrow. The prospect of a joyous gathering excites the crowd, injecting an air of anticipation and excitement into the atmosphere. The next day, the market buzzes with gossip about the recent events involving an apology from the eldest son of the Castro family to Loren, the youngest son of the Dimitri family. This unexpected display of humility from a member of the powerful Castro clan sends shockwaves through the capital, prompting speculation about a potential power shift in Cairo. Merchants who previously conducted business with the Dimitri family swiftly cut ties with the Castros in light of recent developments. Among them is Lucas, who takes it upon himself to educate the public about the implications of these actions. He explains that the Dimitri family's newfound favor among the elite has significantly altered the dynamics of power in the region. Despite initial skepticism about a border family challenging the entrenched influence of the Castros, what's even more alarming is that following the incident, all the major financial powers in Cairo began to favor the Dimitri family. Lucas explains that despite the clash between a central authority and a border family, the consensus has shifted in favor of the Dimitris. This turn of events has dramatically altered the standing of the Dimitri family, signaling a significant shift in their status. Then the scene shifts where Roman sits quietly, savoring a cup of tea. He reflects on his family's long-standing aversion to conflict and struggles to reconcile this with the recent turn of events. Roman finds it difficult to believe that his father, Baron Romero, would abruptly shift their stance on war solely for his sake. Instead, he realizes that the decision to pursue peace was a collective one, made by the core members of the Dimitri family. This revelation deepens Roman's appreciation for the bonds that bind them together and underscores the weight of their shared responsibilities. In the secluded society of Dimitri, a small community nestled in the borderlands, the decision was made to embark on a perilous journey to wage war in order to rescue Roman. Reflecting on his past life as a celestial being, where might dictated right and brutality was commonplace, Roman acknowledges the drastic changes he underwent. The experience molded him into someone far more extreme than he could have imagined. Yet, amidst these reflections, Roman finds solace in the realization that this life is different from his previous existence. Meanwhile, the scene shifts to the Hector Kingdom. Jackson and Butler are overjoyed to witness Edwin's awakening. Startled by his sudden return to consciousness, Edwin queries his whereabouts. Edwin's mind was consumed with thoughts of Roman Dimitri, a figure whose existence seemed to transcend the realms of possibility. He found himself pondering a hypothetical scenario. If he could turn back time, could he have prevented Roman's relentless advance? However, Edwin quickly dismissed this notion as fanciful. His actions had led to the catastrophic downfall of the Hector Kingdom, plunging it into an abyss of despair from which it seemed there was no escape. The weight of responsibility bore heavily on Edwin's shoulders as he contemplated the consequences of his decisions. The memory of Kellen's death haunted Edwin. 
Kellen had perished in Edwin's stead, a grim reminder of the toll his choices had exacted upon those he cared about. It was a stark realization that the kingdom now faced its darkest hour, a situation exacerbated by Edwin's own actions. Yet, amidst the despair, Edwin felt a flicker of determination. He knew he could not simply abandon his people to their fate. As Edwin grappled with his inner turmoil, he became acutely aware of the eyes that looked to him for guidance and salvation. The people of the Hector kingdom, in their hour of need, turned to Edwin as their beacon of hope. He could not bear to disappoint them, nor could he afford to succumb to despair. Suddenly, Edwin was roused from his thoughts by the sound of voices around him. Jackson and Butler stood before him, their expressions grave as they delivered news of the passing days. A week had slipped by since any word had been heard regarding the war, and the silence had only served to deepen the kingdom's sense of foreboding. The news from Cairo only added to their despair, with reports of the infamous Demon of Cairo wreaking havoc upon Hector soldiers and claiming the life of Knight Order Captain Butler himself. It was a devastating blow, a reminder of the cruel realities of their world. The people of Hector, reeling from the news, began to question their place in a world teeming with unseen dangers. They felt like insignificant beings, mere frogs in a well, unaware of the monsters lurking beyond their limited perspective. It was a sobering realization, one that filled them with a sense of profound unease. Amidst the chaos, Edwin found himself standing before his father, the King of Hector, in the grand halls of the palace. The king expressed concern for Edwin's well-being, acknowledging the burden placed upon his son's shoulders. Yet, he reassured Edwin that he would not sacrifice his son's life to solve the kingdom's problems. Edwin, in turn, apologized for any distress he had caused and shared his concerns about the ominous omen spotted in one of the villages. As Edwin surveyed the once thriving land, now tainted by an ominous black hue, and witnessed life itself wilting away, he couldn't shake the feeling that this was the work of a malevolent force, a curse conjured by a necromancer. The gravity of his words struck the king with astonishment, prompting Edwin to delve deeper into his unsettling revelation. Edwin postulated that the recurring famines tormenting the Hector kingdom were not mere acts of nature, but rather a deliberate orchestration by a mysterious figure. This malevolent force, as Edwin described it, wielded dark magic capable of influencing and afflicting the entire kingdom for years. The king, grappling with the implications of Edwin's revelation, sought clarification on whether this force had manipulated Hector into launching an assault on Cairo. Edwin confirmed the king's suspicion, detailing how the hidden instigator deliberately fanned the flames of war between Hector and Cairo for personal gain. The revelation underscored the severity of the situation, leaving both Edwin and the king to confront the unsettling reality that their kingdom had become a pawn in a sinister game. The king, recognizing the complexity of dispelling a curse that had entrenched itself across the entire kingdom, noted that Hector would need the services of an archpriest, a resource they could no longer afford. Edwin, however, recalled a pivotal moment from his past. He recounted how, in his youth, the tower master of the heavenly palace had offered him a deal, relinquish his title as prince and join the magic tower in exchange for any desire. In a moment of revelation, Edwin discloses his intention to trade his time to serve the enigmatic magic tower of the heavenly palace. The king's reaction is one of astonishment, his brows furrowing in concern. With a demeanor of utmost seriousness, Edwin meets his father's gaze and explains that committing to this path for a duration of a year is the only viable solution to resolve the pressing issue faced by Hector. Edwin's commitment to finding a solution, even at the cost of personal sacrifice, reflected his unwavering dedication to the well-being of his people. Meanwhile, at the Southern Training Camp, Mac Burney grappled with his own fate. Despite his desire to meet his end on the battlefield, the harsh reality of his lost arm cast a shadow of doubt on his prospects. It was in this contemplative moment that Roman, an unexpected figure, approached Mac Burney. Roman cut straight to the point, posing a proposition that could alter the course of Mac Burney's destiny. Join Dimitri. Mac Burney, appreciative yet pragmatic, acknowledged his gratitude for the offer but couldn't overlook the physical hindrance of his missing arm. Mac Burney stood before Roman, his doubts weighing heavily upon him. As a man who had lost his arm, he couldn't shake the feeling of being a liability rather than an asset to Roman's cause. He voiced his concerns aloud, questioning what use he, a crippled swordsman, could possibly be to someone like Roman. There was a fear gnawing at him, a fear that he would only hold Roman back in their endeavors. To Mac Burney's surprise, Roman's response was not one of dismissal, but rather a knowing smile. He remarked that Mac Burney's words didn't sound like a rejection to him. Instead, 
They seemed to hint at an underlying willingness, a spark of potential that Roman was quick to recognize. It was then that Roman shared a tale from the annals of history, the story of the legendary left-handed swordsman named Song Baek. Despite once serving as a royal bodyguard, Song Baek's life took a drastic turn when he lost his right arm in service to his country during wartime. Despite being showered with wealth and honor by the imperial family, Song Baek found himself unable to adapt to a life of peace. Instead, he harbored a burning desire to die as a true martial artist, to meet his end on the battlefield rather than in the comforts of civilian life. Determined to honor his warrior spirit, Song Baek embarked on a rigorous journey of self-discovery. He spent years training with his remaining arm, mastering the art of left-handed swordsmanship through sheer determination and relentless practice. With time, he developed a unique fighting style characterized by his slanted body orientation and irregular attack patterns. What others perceived as weaknesses, Song Baek transformed into strengths, using his unorthodox techniques to overcome formidable opponents in countless duels. Despite his prowess, Song Baek's journey ultimately led him to a fateful encounter with another skilled swordsman named Baek Jung Hyuk. In a climactic showdown, Song Baek met his end at the hands of his formidable adversary, fulfilling his lifelong quest to die as a martial artist on the battlefield. Roman's recounting of Song Baek's tale held a profound significance for Mac Burney. It served as a beacon of hope, a testament to the indomitable spirit of warriors who refused to surrender to their circumstances. Inspired by the story, Roman made MacBurney an offer that would change the course of his destiny forever. With unwavering determination, Roman pledged to teach MacBurney the art of left-handed swordsmanship. Moreover, he promised to utilize MacBurney's skills and talents to their fullest potential, surpassing any expectations that MacBurney might have harbored. It was a gesture of trust and camaraderie that resonated deeply with MacBurney, filling him with a newfound sense of purpose and belonging. In that moment, MacBurney felt a surge of hope coursing through his veins. He realized that Roman could be the salvation he had been seeking, the catalyst for his redemption as a warrior. Determined to prove his worth and reclaim his identity, MacBurney bowed before Roman and swore his allegiance to him. Amidst a whirlwind of change, figures like Edwin Hector, MacBurney, and the underestimated Henry Albert found themselves swept along. Henry couldn't help but feel overwhelmed by the sheer presence of Sir Roman, a figure he had weathered hardships with. He wondered why Roman couldn't have taken him along for the journey. Upon returning to the Albert territory, Henry anticipated a life of adulation from the locals. However, his expectations were shattered when he realized they celebrated his return as a hero of Cairo, despite his negligible role in the war against Hector. Merely being in Roman's company during the conflict elevated Henry's status significantly. To Henry's astonishment, an invitation from the Cairo Royal Academy arrived, requesting him to lecture on his experiences at the Southern Front Line. Viewing this as a chance to enhance his reputation, Henry eagerly accepted. He recognized that by praising Roman's virtues, he could boost his own standing among the nobility. As Henry embarked on his mission to spread Roman's renown, he found himself at a critical juncture in his seemingly insignificant noble life. Meanwhile, in Cairo's capital, Roman prepared to depart for Dimitri. A crowd gathered to bid him farewell, a testament to his burgeoning influence. Roman contemplated his next steps, knowing that upon his return to the capital, he would face pivotal decisions. Until then, he resolved to consolidate his power by pacifying the northeastern region, laying the groundwork for his eventual showdown with the central government. As Roman traversed through a forest en route to Dimitri, he stumbled upon a group of distressed farmers, their tear-streaked faces telling tales of ruined fields. Curious, Roman turned to Chris, seeking an explanation for their plight. Chris speculated that these individuals were likely farmers from the Dimitri territory. Roman questioned why they were in Conrad territory, prompting Chris to explain that Dimitri lacked sufficient cultivatable land, compelling some farmers to lease plots in Conrad territory. Learning this, Roman insisted on speaking with the farmers himself, eager to understand the details of their situation. As they approached, the farmers recounted a troubling ordeal. Despite having a 10-year lease agreement with the Conrad family, they were abruptly ordered to vacate the land just a week before the anticipated harvest. When they refused, Conrad agents destroyed their crops. The farmers pleaded their case to Roman, highlighting the injustice of being denied the opportunity to reap the fruits of their labor. Chris shares with Roman his understanding of the farmer's unfortunate situation, acknowledging its gravity. However, he gently underscores Roman's constrained role in offering direct assistance. Chris elaborates on the intricate dynamics, 
highlighting that the land leased by the farmers is under the ownership of the Conrad family. He emphasizes the potential ramifications, cautioning that any intervention could potentially exacerbate tensions between the two families, thus complicating matters further. Chris elaborates further, highlighting that the Conrad family has forged a crucial alliance with the nobles of the northeastern region. He describes this alliance as a collective effort, where several smaller groups have come together, resembling a protective fence. These groups, while individually not large, unite to shield each other from external threats. Chris draws a comparison, likening their collaboration to that of a bat, relying on mutual support for survival. Upon hearing this, Roman expresses concern, emphasizing to Chris that failure to take action could exacerbate the problem. Recognizing the need for action, Roman emphasized the importance of addressing the root cause of the issue before the Conrad family's power grew unchecked. Despite the risks involved, he was determined to confront the injustice and restore fairness to the farmers. As per the hierarchical structure, it falls upon the subordinate to abide by their superior's decisions. Therefore, Chris concurs with Roman. As they ventured into Dimitri territory, Chris fell into agreement with Roman's decision, recognizing the traditional obligation of subordinates to follow their lord's lead. Upon their arrival, Roman was greeted with fervent enthusiasm from the Dimitri people, who hailed him as the hero of Cairo and the pride of their land. Roman's father, Romero Dimitri, welcomed him with open arms, expressing his joy at seeing his son return. Roman, in turn, inquired about his father's well-being, prompting Romero to reassure him that all was well in Dimitri and that he had prepared a grand celebration to mark Roman's homecoming. However, before festivities could ensue, Roman requested a private audience with his father to address a pressing matter. They retreated to Romero Dimitri's office, where Roman broached the topic of the farmers in Conrad territory. Romero acknowledged his awareness of the situation but lamented the inevitability of the Conrad family reclaiming their land. He cautioned against interference, citing potential repercussions for the farmers' future prospects in Conrad territory. Roman, adopting a grave demeanor, posed a hypothetical scenario questioning whether the outcome would differ if Dimitri were aligned with the influential Benedict family instead. He proposed that Marquis Benedict's formidable authority would serve as a deterrent against any encroachment on their land. With the recent decline of the Barco family, Roman asserted that Dimitri now stood as one of the strongest factions in the northeastern region. While acknowledging the validity of Roman's perspective, Romero urged caution, emphasizing the importance of maintaining harmonious relations with neighboring factions. He advised against needlessly provoking conflict with their allied forces, stressing the significance of avoiding unnecessary entanglements. Roman approached his father with a determined air, adamant that action was necessary. He argued that Dimitri held true power in the northeastern region, a fact overshadowed by the complacency and arrogance of the Conrad family and other nobles. To them, Dimitri was merely another family, lacking the protection of a formidable entity like the central government as the Barco family once enjoyed. Consequently, the Conrad family's disregard for Dimitri's farmers was evident. With a furrowed brow, Roman pressed his father for his thoughts on this discrepancy. Despite the Conrad family's claims that Dimitri was the strongest in the region, their actions suggested otherwise. It was time, Roman asserted, for Dimitri to assert its dominance and prove to the Conrad family who truly held sway in the northeastern territories. Roman further elaborates to his father emphasizing that Dimitri holds both the power and the moral justification to come to the aid of their citizens. He questions why Dimitri is standing idly by while the Conrad family tramples upon their people's rights. Roman passionately implores his father to grant him the authority to take action, assuring him that he is prepared to shoulder the burden. He pledges to be the one to execute any necessary measures, even if it means getting his hands stained with blood. Later that day, the scene transitions to Dimitri seated in his chair deep in thought, pondering over Roman's words to Romero. He couldn't help but acknowledge Roman's growth, remembering the days when his son had toiled alongside him as a farmer. There was a soft spot in Romero's heart for Roman, born from their shared experiences. Perhaps, Romero mused, Roman's current demeanor was a response to being labeled a lesser noble. Deep in thought, Romero realized that what the Dimitri territory needed wasn't just power, but wise leadership decisions. Roman's impassioned plea signaled the dawn of a new era for Dimitri, one where the strength of character and strategic thinking would guide them forward. Days later, the Dimitri palace buzzed with activity as the family hosted a lavish party to welcome Roman back. Nobles from all corners of the northeastern region, 
including the esteemed Volt and Grizel families, gathered to pay their respects and offer congratulations. In the realm of nobility, acknowledgement of power often takes precedence over recognition of leadership. Such was the case in the northeastern region, where Dmitri's authority was disregarded by other noble families despite its undeniable influence. Amidst this dynamic, a chance encounter brought Lady Sophia of the Grizel family to Roman's attention. Recollecting their previous interaction, Roman recognized her, though he noticed a shift in Sophia's demeanor, suggesting she viewed him differently now. A notion that subtly lingered in her mind as she contemplated the prospect of marrying someone of Roman stature. The ambience altered once again as Viscount Conrad made his entrance, extending his respects to Roman, whom he hailed as the hero of Cairo. However, Roman's response to Conrad's greeting carried a weighty tone, as he introduced himself not just as Roman but as Roman Dimitri, a declaration infused with the pride and authority of his family name. Conrad, in turn, acknowledged Roman's impressive triumph over Butler, a renowned swordsman, expressing astonishment at Roman's youthfulness juxtaposed with his extraordinary achievements. He envisioned Roman's potential to ascend to even greater heights within the ranks of warriors, a sentiment echoed by many present. Yet, Roman's demeanor shifted subtly as he took control of the conversation, surprising Conrad with his perceptiveness, which defied the expectations typically associated with his humble origins. Conrad couldn't help but acknowledge Roman's acumen, recognizing the sharpness of his mind despite his commoner upbringing. He graciously encouraged Roman to pose any question he desired, unaware of the profound impact his response would have on the gathering. With unwavering resolve, Roman seized the opportunity to confront Conrad regarding his unilateral actions against the farmers of Dimitri, questioning the rationale behind the confiscation of their lands, a query that reverberated through the room, leaving those present stunned by its audacity. Conrad, caught off guard by Roman's boldness, attempted to justify his actions by citing the lucrative offer made by a merchant for the disputed lands. However, Roman's disappointment was palpable as he condemned Conrad's callous disregard for the livelihoods of the farmers, emphasizing the gravity of the situation amidst the festive atmosphere. As the tension lingered, Conrad sought to redirect the conversation, emphasizing his presence at the gathering to extend congratulations to Roman and partake in the festivities. Conrad, visibly perturbed, reminded Roman that the gathering was intended to celebrate his return, not to tarnish Conrad's reputation in front of their peers. Feeling slighted by Roman's actions, Conrad's facade of congeniality wavered, his smile replaced by a mask of discomfort. Conrad, eager to extricate himself from the situation, made a move to depart, only to be halted by Roman's firm command. Roman's tone left no room for negotiation as he cautioned Conrad against leaving abruptly, hinting at potential repercussions for Dimitri should Conrad choose to escalate the situation. With a commanding presence, Roman demanded Conrad's presence before him once more, unwilling to let the matter rest until it was addressed to his satisfaction. In the midst of the gathering, Viscount Conrad's utterances reverberated through the room, leaving an air of frustration in their wake. Visibly irked by the unfolding exchange, Viscount Conrad turned sharply towards Roman, delivering a spirited retort. He insisted that, although he had indeed driven away the farmers inhabiting the Dimitri territory, that particular expanse of land was unequivocally the rightful domain of the Conrad family. In his eyes, he was merely reclaiming what was inherently theirs, an act justified by the familial connection to the contested soil. Furthermore, Viscount Conrad made it clear that the Conrad family, not being subservient to the Dimitri, bore no obligation to seek Roman's approval or report their actions. This declaration, laden with familial pride and territorial entitlement, hung heavily in the room. The sentiment found resonance among other nobles present, who voiced their agreement in a chorus of supportive murmurs. Amidst the growing tension, the suggestion surfaced that Baron Romero Dimitri should take the reins and orchestrate a meeting to mediate the escalating discord between the two families. The nobles, questioning the appropriateness of Roman intervening, reminded him that the gathering was meant to be a celebration of his return, not a platform for territorial disputes. The implicit inquiry lingered. What right did Roman possess to arbitrate on this issue? In response, some nobles went a step further, emphasizing the position of Viscount Conrad as the head of the Conrad household, asserting that he deserved due respect. They admonished Roman for addressing Viscount Conrad in what they deemed an unruly manner, considering his familial standing. Roman contemplated whether the nobles would react similarly if the roles were reversed, envisioning a scenario where the Dimitri family were replaced by the Barco family. 
In his estimation, such a reaction would never materialize. He attributed this to the prevailing perception among countryside nobles, particularly those in the northeastern region, who historically regarded the Dimitri family as easily manipulable and subject to coercion. Roman faced a critical decision, whether to wield his authority to bring these nobles in line or to tread the path of coercion, transforming them into obedient subordinates of the Dimitri family. Contemplating these choices, he resolved to assert his intentions unequivocally. Stepping forward, Roman positioned himself squarely in front of Viscount Conrad, his gaze unwavering. With a measured tone, Roman addressed the heart of the matter. He questioned the ethics of one territory asserting dominance over the citizens of another, emphasizing the principles that govern the relationships between territories within the Cairo kingdom. He laid claim to the farmers disturbed by Conrad's actions, branding them as his people who dwelled within the Dimitri territory, dutifully paying taxes to Dimitri and pledging their unwavering loyalty. The atmosphere crackled with tension as Roman questioned the propriety of maintaining formalities while addressing Viscount Conrad. The Viscount's stunned expression betrayed his surprise at Roman's directness. Roman pressed on, revealing that the issue at hand had already undergone internal discussion within the Dimitri household. Furthermore, he asserted that Baron Romero had granted his approval for Roman to take charge of resolving the incident. There was no intention on Roman's part to sweep the matter under the rug. Viscount Conrad's disbelief was palpable in the air. Undeterred by Viscount Conrad's reaction, Roman persisted, pointing out the apparent reluctance of the Viscount to offer any form of apology. His words echoed throughout the gathering, commanding the attention of all present. Roman's warning reverberated. Any transgressions by individuals from other territories within Dimitri's domain would be met with swift and severe repercussions. With a wry smile, Roman challenged those who had previously criticized his stance, daring them to now downplay the significance of the matter. The other nobles in attendance were taken aback by Roman's unwavering resolve, realizing the potential ramifications should he follow through with his threats. Viscount Conrad contemplated Roman Dimitri's prowess not merely as a swordsman but likened it to the cunning of a fox. He admired Roman's ability to lay traps from which others found no escape, employing sheer force to overwhelm his adversaries. Viscount Conrad felt compelled to hold his ground. He viewed this confrontation as an opportunity to rally support from the Alliance Association. However, any hopes Viscount Conrad harbored of garnering support were dashed as Viscount Lawrence, a member of the Northeastern Alliance Association, stepped forward. His unexpected intervention sided unequivocally with Roman, laying blame squarely at Viscount Conrad's feet. Viscount Lawrence emphasized the paramount importance of adhering to proper procedures, especially when it pertained to the welfare of the citizens residing within Dimitri's territory. He questioned Viscount Conrad's unilateral actions, highlighting the absence of prior notification to Dimitri regarding his intentions. Viscount Lawrence's stern admonition left no room for ambiguity. Viscount Conrad was urged to acknowledge his misstep and extend a formal apology to Roman. Additionally, Viscount Lawrence subtly reminded Viscount Conrad of the lack of solidarity from the Conrad family during Lawrence's own trials against the Barco family. In the tumultuous aftermath of Viscount Lawrence's surprising declaration of allegiance to the Dimitri faction, the Northeastern Alliance Association found itself reeling. Viscount Lawrence's abandonment of their cause signaled a significant blow to their collective influence, leaving the once united front in disarray. As Viscount Lawrence called upon the other nobles to align themselves with Dimitri, a palpable unease settled over the room. Slowly, one by one, the nobles began to acquiesce, their initial resistance crumbling in the face of Lawrence's persuasive rhetoric. They voiced their agreement with Roman stance and demanded Viscount Conrad extend an apology, an unexpected turn of events that Viscount Conrad interpreted as a calculated maneuver to undermine his authority. Faced with the sudden shift in allegiance and the mounting pressure from his peers, Viscount Conrad found himself at a crossroads. He realized that continued defiance would only exacerbate his isolation within the noble circles. Swallowing his pride, he bowed before Roman, offering a begrudging apology and vowing to exercise greater caution in the future. Though the words left a bitter taste in his mouth, Viscount Conrad recognized the necessity of compromise and maintaining his standing within the aristocracy. Meanwhile, in Romero Dimitri's office, Roman's father expressed concern over the repercussions of his son's bold actions. He questioned the wisdom of antagonizing the Northeastern Alliance Association, fearing the potential backlash that could ensue. In a conversation with his father, Roman articulates the necessity of establishing a clear hierarchy. 
He explains that for this purpose, he requires his opponents to exert their utmost effort. Roman envisions a scenario where all adversaries gather, striving to challenge the Dimitri name to its fullest extent. Through this collective effort, the Northeastern Alliance would come to grasp their powerlessness in the face of the Dimitri family's distinction. Only then, Roman believes, can his overarching plan come to fruition. The scene then transitions to the meeting room of the Northeastern Alliance. As tensions continued to simmer within the Northeastern Alliance, frustration boiled over among its members. Roman's audacity in defying their authority sparked outrage, with accusations of arrogance hurled in his direction. The nobles lamented the potential damage to their reputation should they capitulate to Dimitri's demands, fearing that such acquiescence would render them a laughingstock in the eyes of the northeastern region. Viscount Conrad, grappling with the weight of his diminished influence, turned to his fellow members for guidance. Yet, faced with the enormity of the situation, they found themselves at a loss for viable solutions. Viscount Conrad openly questioned the effectiveness of the Northeastern Alliance Association, expressing doubt about its significance given Dimitri's overwhelming military strength. He acknowledged the prowess of Roman Dimitri, especially after his victory over the formidable butler of Hector. This acknowledgement led him to believe that conventional methods would fall short in challenging Dimitri's dominance. In light of this, another member suggested reaching out to the central government for assistance. Viscount Conrad agreed, seeing the potential in leveraging the central government's authority to exert pressure on Dimitri. He pointed out that since the downfall of the Barco family, the Northeastern Alliance had been diligently forging connections with the central government. He believed the time was ripe to capitalize on these connections to tip the scales in their favor. With this in mind, Viscount Conrad hoped to involve the central government in their conflict with Dimitri. Acting swiftly, Viscount Conrad initiated contact with Count Parchus, a prominent figure in the central government. Presenting his request, Viscount Conrad was met with an affirmative response from Count Parchus, who was open to hearing more. As Viscount Conrad began to explain the recent conflict with the Dimitri family and his desire to apply pressure with the central government's support, the call abruptly ended, leaving Viscount Conrad frustrated and bewildered. Determined to salvage the situation, Viscount Conrad instructed his assistant to reconnect the call promptly, fearing the consequences of Count Parchus's abrupt dismissal. After a brief delay, the call resumed, and Viscount Conrad wasted no time in apologizing for the earlier interruption, attributing it to unstable communication. However, Count Parchus's response was less than receptive. He chastised Viscount Conrad for his apparent ignorance, questioning whether living in the borderlands had dulled his senses. Count Parchus expressed disbelief at Viscount Conrad's request to pressure Roman Dimitri, dismissing it as misguided and out of touch. Viscount Conrad's frustration mounted as he attempted to defend his position, but Count Parchus remained unmoved. His refusal to entertain Viscount Conrad's plea served as a harsh reminder of the complexities of political influence and the challenges they faced in challenging Dimitri's authority. Count Parchus delivered a sobering message to Viscount Conrad, shedding light on Roman Dimitri's privileged position as Marquis Benedict's favored potential son-in-law. In light of this revelation, Viscount Conrad's plea for Count Parchus to pressure Dimitri seemed futile and misplaced. Count Parchus swiftly terminated the call, advising Viscount Conrad to redirect his efforts towards appeasing Dimitri rather than antagonizing him. Viscount Conrad was stunned by the news of Marquis Benedict's intentions for a political alliance with Roman Dimitri. The prospect of such a union underscored the complexity of the situation and prompted Viscount Conrad to reassess his approach. Suggesting an alternative strategy, the noble who had proposed contacting the central government recommended initiating an apology to Dimitri as a gesture of goodwill. Following this advice, Viscount Conrad extended apologies to the affected farmers and assured them of non-interference for the remainder of their contract period. As the scene unfolds, farmers express their gratitude to Roman for successfully resolving their issue. Their joy is visible upon learning of Roman's advocacy on their behalf. In a heartwarming moment, a farmer assures Roman that henceforth, they are at his service, pledging their unwavering support for any task he may require, regardless of its nature. With a gentle smile, Roman humbly assures the farmers that he merely fulfilled his duty as a member of the Dimitri family. Internally, he reflects on the outcome, noting the expected submission of the Northeastern Alliance Association. Roman surmises that while they may have contemplated seeking aid from the central government, the current circumstances dictate their acquiescence to his position. However, Roman sees the association akin to a flock of bats, 
foreseeing potential treachery in the future despite their apparent subservience. He understood the need to navigate the intricacies of noble politics with caution, preparing for potential conflicts with both friends and foes alike. As Roman departs from his encounter with the farmers, his mind delves into strategic contemplation. He muses that if the initial phase involves provocation, then the subsequent stage necessitates confronting stark reality. Later, at the palace, Roman made a public announcement regarding an upcoming swordsmanship competition to be hosted by Dimitri. The allure of a substantial prize, 100 gold. In the interest of fairness, Roman made it clear that neither he nor Captain Jonathan would be participating in the upcoming competition. The announcement sparked excitement among the crowd gathered, eager to hear more about the event. Expanding on the details, Roman revealed that the participants would be divided into six groups, with a total of six winners to be chosen. Drawing upon the knowledge gained from their experiences waging war on the southern front line against the Hector Kingdom, Roman emphasized how these trials had broadened their understanding of the world and strengthened their resolve. He intended to showcase this newfound strength through the competition. To ensure a fair contest, one of Roman's trusted subordinates would be assigned to each of the six groups. Roman declared that if anyone managed to defeat his subordinate and emerge victorious, they wouldn't just receive a reward, but also have one of their wishes granted by Roman himself. A voice from the audience interjected, questioning whether individuals from other families could participate. Roman responded affirmatively, stating that as long as someone could demonstrate their skill as a swordsman in the northeastern region, they would be welcome to compete. With the competition scheduled to take place in one month's time, Roman urged all present to make thorough preparations. He expressed his hope for a diverse array of challengers to test their mettle in the upcoming event, fostering a spirit of camaraderie and friendly competition among the attendees. The narrative then transitions to the conference room of the Northeastern Alliance Association. Within its confines, members engage in a discussion centering around a forthcoming swordsmanship competition hosted by the illustrious Dimitri family. Recognizing the potential advantages, Viscount Conrad articulates that should a swordsman from their association emerge victorious, the Northeastern Alliance Association stands to attain a wish as a prize. In a departure from merely seeking an apology, Viscount Conrad proposes a more gracious approach, urging a reconciliation and fostering collaboration between the Northeastern Alliance Association and the Dimitris. Such a strategic move, he contends, would not only mend the strained relationship but also elevate the association's tarnished reputation. The crux of the matter, however, lies in the association's ability to clinch victory in the competition. Members express concern, highlighting the diverse array of contenders beyond their association expressing interest. The specter of formidable opponents, such as Chris and Kevin, renowned for their single combat duels with the Barco family, participating adds an additional layer of complexity. Winning, they argue, would prove challenging. Viscount Conrad counters by proposing a tactical approach. He envisions the competition divided into six groups. Acknowledging the presence of formidable adversaries like Chris and Kevin, Viscount Conrad reasons that if the Northeastern Alliance Association strategically allocates its forces across the six groups, excluding those featuring the formidable duo, they stand a chance of securing victory in at least one group. The members, finding merit in this reasoned plan, express agreement with Viscount Conrad, recognizing it as a viable strategy for success. Viscount Conrad's voice resounded with urgency as he addressed the gathered members of the Northeastern Alliance Association. With a tone tinged with gravity, he impressed upon them the imminent nature of the competition, scheduled to unfold a mere month hence. He emphasized the significance of seizing this opportunity bestowed upon them by fate itself. In solemn words, he warned that failure to capitalize on this chance could spell doom for their association, consigning it to obscurity under the shadow of the formidable Dimitri forces. Underscoring the gravity of the situation, Viscount Conrad proposed a radical solution. An external combat expert hired clandestinely to masquerade as a member of their ranks. His directive was clear. They must secure at least one victor, even if it meant resorting to unorthodox means. In the heart of the Dimitri training grounds, the atmosphere buzzed with anticipation as Roman, the commanding figure of the Dimitri army, gathered his soldiers. The focus shifted to an upcoming swordsmanship competition, a revelation that caught the soldiers by surprise. With a commanding presence, Roman addressed his soldiers, ensuring they were aware of the impending challenge. He spoke with an air of confidence, declaring that in the coming month, every soldier would participate in a fierce competition. The stakes were high, as only six soldiers would be selected to represent the prestigious Dimitri army. Roman's directive was clear. 
past evaluations were irrelevant. The soldiers' performance in the coming month would define their ranks. The soldiers, initially taken aback by this unexpected turn of events, absorbed Roman's words. The announcement carried weight, resonating with the warriors who had returned from the front lines but now found themselves thrust into a new battle. Roman envisioned his subordinates as sharp swords, ready to be drawn at any moment. Roman emphasized the importance of his subordinates' pursuit of strength, making it clear that his current endeavors were aimed at instilling within them a fervent desire for self-improvement. Addressing the soldiers, he assured them that those who represented the Dimitri and brought honor to their name would receive suitable rewards. Furthermore, Roman announced that if any of the six chosen swordsmen emerged victorious in the upcoming competition, they would be granted the opportunity to learn advanced techniques. He reiterated his commitment to aiding his subordinates in their advancement, whether in cultivation or swordsmanship, promising to support them in reaching new heights. Pucky, a thoughtful soldier among the ranks, saw this as a chance for personal growth. The idea of acquiring knowledge directly from their esteemed leader, Roman, ignited a spark within him. He envisioned accelerating his growth and mastering advanced techniques that could set him apart on the battlefield. The sentiment echoed among the soldiers, they recognized Roman's prowess and viewed the opportunity as a life-changing prospect. While the soldiers contemplated the rewards, Roman delved into the deeper objectives of the competition. For him, it served a dual purpose. Firstly, he aimed to enlighten the northeastern nobles about the harsh realities of their situation. The competition would act as a showcase, revealing the true nature of their ongoing battle. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, Roman saw this as a comprehensive training opportunity for his subordinates. As the soldiers absorbed Roman's vision, the training grounds transformed into a crucible of ambition and aspiration. Roman envisioned a cohort of skilled and disciplined warriors emerging from the competition. He anticipated that, by the end of this intense period, his soldiers would not only elevate their skills but also gain a deeper understanding of the challenges they faced. With a sly smirk, Roman anticipated that the unfolding events in the northeastern region would indeed be a spectacle. As the soldiers commenced their myriad competitions, Roman contemplated the significance of the upcoming month. Reflecting on his past life as the heavenly demon Beck Jung Hyuk, he acknowledged that his very existence had been shaped by life or death crises. Despite his familiarity with navigating through crises, Roman recognized the imprudence of needlessly endangering himself. Acknowledging that the looming challenges weren't exclusive to his subordinates, he understood the imperative for personal growth within this month. While crises were not unfamiliar territory for Roman, he was determined not to underestimate the potential dangers. In his quest for strength, Roman sought to avoid unnecessary risks, realizing that self-improvement was a journey he had to undertake alongside his subordinates. In the midst of this, Lucas, now the leader of the Hao clan, approached Roman. Roman shared his intention to retreat into isolated training for the duration of the month, entrusting Lucas with a significant task. Handing over his sword, Roman instructed Lucas to sell it, renaming it Blaze in the process. However, Roman emphasized the necessity of secrecy, cautioning Lucas not to reveal the true identity of the sword's owner to any potential buyers. Lucas examined the sword with admiration, marveling at its craftsmanship and quality. He couldn't help but question Roman's decision to part with such a remarkable weapon. Nevertheless, he respected Roman's wishes and set out to find a suitable buyer. With Roman's permission to sell the sword however he saw fit, Lucas contemplated various avenues, ultimately considering the possibility of auctioning it anonymously. He was confident that those who recognized the sword's true worth would be willing to pay a high price for it. As Lucas pondered the best course of action, the scene transitioned to Adelian a bustling city characterized by flourishing business activities. Its prosperity was not solely a product of happenstance. Rather, it was greatly enhanced by the presence of the Warp Gate in the northeastern region. At the bustling auction center, Lucas, shrouded in a cloak to conceal his identity, hands over the sword to an attentive auction worker. With a trained eye, the worker examines the blade, immediately struck by its remarkable quality. A soft, azure glow emanates from the artifact, hinting at its extraordinary nature. Intrigued, the worker queries Lucas about his preferences for the upcoming auction. Maintaining secrecy, Lucas requests a free bidding process, opting to keep the seller's identity anonymous. The worker, well-versed in auction proceedings, explains that such a format entails a 10% processing fee but assures Lucas it's a standard practice. Accepting the terms, Lucas follows the worker into the depths of the auction house for the item's evaluation. Inside the appraisal room, Lucas encounters Morris, 
the esteemed manager of Adelian's auction house. The worker conducting the assessment commends the sword's craftsmanship, noting its unparalleled strength and sharpness. He muses on the rarity of such a finely crafted weapon in the market, estimating its value to be no less than 30 gold coins. Proceeding with the evaluation, the worker turns his attention to the sword's mana receptivity, a critical aspect of its worth. Mana receptivity, graded on a scale of 1 to 10, measures a sword's ability to absorb mana. Typically, a grade of 3 or higher denotes exceptional quality for artisan swords. However, as the worker tests the sword, astonishment spreads across his face. To his disbelief, the sword displays a grade 10 mana receptivity, an unprecedented revelation. The worker explains to Morris the significance of this finding. Not only does the sword absorb mana, but it also amplifies its power, a feat rarely seen even among the most skilled artisans. Morris, taken aback by the sword's unique properties, realizes the magnitude of what they are about to auction. As the scene transitions to the grand halls of the Adelian auction house, anticipation mounts among the eager attendees. With a commanding presence, the host called upon the assembled audience to seize the opportunity presented before them. Never had the auction house witnessed an item of such extraordinary caliber, setting the stage for an event that would be etched into the annals of its history. From wealthy patrons hailing from the countryside to the elite of the capital, the audience was a testament to the widespread intrigue that had been ignited by rumors swirling around this singular event. As the murmurs of excitement reverberated throughout the room, the host seized the moment to unveil the coveted centerpiece of the day's proceedings, the artisan sword known as Blaze. A palpable sense of awe descended upon the audience as all eyes turned towards the magnificent weapon displayed before them. The host's words resonated with the crowd as he underscored that Blaze was no ordinary sword. Its true value lay in its remarkable mana receptivity. To illustrate the significance of this, the host recounted a past auction where a rapier boasting a grade 7 mana receptivity had fetched a staggering sum of 300 gold. However, Blaze transcended all expectations with its unprecedented grade 10 mana receptivity, coupled with its unique ability to amplify absorbed aura. It was a revelation that sent a wave of anticipation rippling through the crowd, igniting a fervor of bidding frenzy. The host declared that while he had auctioned off numerous artisan swords in the past, none compared to the unparalleled uniqueness of Blaze. With an infectious enthusiasm, the host initiated the bidding at a modest 10 gold coins. The atmosphere crackled with excitement as bids quickly escalated, each increment bringing Blaze closer to its inevitable destiny. From 10 to 50 gold coins in mere moments, the bidding war unfolded with a feverish intensity, each participant eager to claim ownership of the coveted artifact. The auction hall buzzed with anticipation as the bids continued to climb, reaching a staggering 600 gold coins. Yet, just when it seemed that Blaze had found its rightful owner, a sudden hush fell over the crowd as number 53 boldly entered the fray with a bid of 1,200 gold coins. The auction host, momentarily taken aback by the audacity of the bid, could scarcely conceal his astonishment. Number 53 was revealed to be Marquis Valentino, a figure renowned for operating a merchant empire spanning the entire continent. With vast wealth amassed over the years, Valentino remained neutral in the political arena. However, when it came to acquiring exceptional items, he was known to pursue them with relentless determination. As his bid sent ripples through the auction hall, the true extent of Valentino's influence remained a mystery to the denizens of the Cairo kingdom. The auction host could barely contain his excitement at the prospect of such a formidable bidder. The auction hall crackled with anticipation as the auction host proclaimed Marquis Valentino's bid as unprecedented in the annals of the Adelian auction house. The announcement sent a ripple of astonishment through the assembled audience, each member taken aback by the sheer magnitude of the bid. Marquis Valentino contemplated the true worth of the renowned sword, Blaze, recognizing that its significance went far beyond mere mana receptivity. To Valentino, Blaze symbolized a revolutionary breakthrough, a representation of uncharted territory and the elusive mastery of the tenth stage, a realm untouched by any swordsman thus far. In the world of swordsmanship, a dichotomy often existed between famous swords and magic swords. While novice swordsmen favored enchanted blades for their efficiency, seasoned practitioners understood the necessity of wielding a pure weapon to fully unleash their aura. For those ranked as famous swordsmen, possessing a blade capable of harnessing their aura to its fullest potential held a measurable value. Such swords were deemed priceless treasures, worthy of any sacrifice, even if it meant relinquishing everything Valentino owned. Valentino contemplated the potential impact of the blacksmith releasing additional swords to the market. 
He believed that if the same blacksmith crafted a second or third sword, the value of Blaze would skyrocket, as it would retain its status as the original creation. Valentino understood that in the realm of artisans, possessing an item labeled as the first held significant recognition, elevating the entire collection to a higher echelon of prestige and value. Meanwhile, the other audience members, driven by their own desires for rarity and prestige, dared not oppose Valentino's bid. The allure of possessing such a coveted item outweighed any potential risks, and thus, the auction host declared Valentino the victor with his bid of 1,200 gold coins. Later, in the seclusion of a private room, Valentino wasted no time in finalizing the transaction. With a sense of eagerness, he handed over 1,300 gold coins to Morris, the attendant of the auction house, insisting that the extra 100 gold coins be considered a token of appreciation for Morris's service. Gratefully accepting the unexpected gift, Morris was visibly touched by Valentino's generosity. In return for his generosity, Valentino made a simple request, information about the blacksmith responsible for crafting Blaze. As Marquis Valentino expressed his desire to meet the swordsman responsible for crafting Blaze in person, Morris, the attendant of the auction house, couldn't hide his trepidation. He stammered, explaining to Valentino that arranging such a meeting would prove challenging. Apologizing profusely for the inconvenience, Morris's nerves were palpable. Upon hearing this, Marquis Valentino responded with disappointment. That's too bad, he remarked, acknowledging the situation. Valentino expressed his belief that it would be a natural decision for the auction house to make. He instructed Morris to notify him first if the blacksmith were to send another item for auction, emphasizing the importance of staying informed and maintaining a strategic advantage in future transactions. Later, as Marquis Valentino retreated to his carriage, clutching the prized sword in his hands, he couldn't help but marvel at its craftsmanship. The sword's flawless blade and its extraordinary manner reactive properties left Valentino in awe. Despite his vast collection of renowned swords, he had never encountered one quite like Blaze. Determined to uncover the identity of its elusive creator, Valentino resolved to spare no effort in his quest. Turning to his subordinate, Valentino instructed him to begin the search by investigating Dimitri's master blacksmith, reasoning that since Blaze's first trade occurred at the Adelian auction house, it was plausible that its origins could be traced back to Dimitri. Assured of his subordinate's compliance, Valentino prepared to embark on his quest, his heart brimming with anticipation. Meanwhile, at Dimitri's training grounds, Chris, engaged in a sparring match with Henderson, emerged victorious, signaling his prowess. As he contemplated the selection of soldiers for the upcoming competition, Chris's thoughts drifted to potential candidates, including himself, Kevin, Vulcan, and Pucky. However, uncertainty lingered over the remaining two slots. Suddenly, Chris's attention was drawn to a peculiar sensation, a disturbance in the sky that seemed to reverberate through the very air. Stunned, he gazed upwards, sensing an inexplicable turbulence that defied explanation. Meanwhile, Roman, immersed in his swordsmanship, reflected on a recent encounter with Butler. Contemplating the outcome had he engaged in immediate combat, Roman acknowledged the importance of preparation in securing victory. It was a lesson that resonated deeply as he honed his skills preparing for whatever challenges lay ahead. Without the luxury of ample preparation time, Roman acknowledged he wouldn't have been able to handle the Stage 5 aura. His decisions, still colored by the memories of his past life as Beck Jung Hyuk, revealed a lingering arrogance and a struggle to fully accept his current identity as Roman Dimitri. In his previous life, Beck Jung Hyuk had been a formidable force, capable of overcoming any opponent. But Roman understood that the same rules didn't apply in his current existence. Facing adversaries like Butler, Roman realized survival in such battles required unwavering resolve and unshakable determination akin to the unyielding cycle of day and night. Engrossed in the repetitive act of pounding steel before the furnace, Roman endured the scorching heat, his skin reddening and blistering. Despite the physical strain pushing him to his limits, Roman remained steadfast in his focus. He recognized the necessity for transformation, not just for himself but also for the blade he wielded a process of renewal and rebirth. Harnessing the technique of flame recreation, Roman absorbed the flames and channeled the mana within, using the fusion of sword and fire to mold his body closer to perfection. As he underwent his second metamorphosis, Roman emerged from his training chamber with a newfound confidence, laying the groundwork for his ascent to greater heights. Closing his eyes, Roman visualized facing two imaginary incarnations of Butler simultaneously, 
a mental exercise to hone his skills and prepare for future confrontations. He contemplated the intricacies of the heavenly demon sword, which divided into three stages, the first half trichotomy, mid-trichotomy, and second half trichotomy. Though Roman had only mastered the first half trichotomy thus far, he sensed a shift on the horizon. With his second metamorphosis completed, he anticipated unlocking new levels of power. Should he achieve the elusive third metamorphosis and gain access to the second half trichotomy, Roman vowed that no opponent would stand in his way. With the unwavering determination and conviction of Beck Jung Hyuk, the legendary heavenly demon, Roman was poised to become an absolute master. Now proficient in utilizing the mid trichotomy, Roman found himself capable of besting even two opponents like Butler simultaneously. However, a lingering uncertainty nagged at him. Was it truly right to emulate the actions of his past life? The operation of aura emitted by the wielder of his sword resembled an explosion, momentarily surpassing even the refined inner power of Miram. Roman pondered whether blindly adhering to the ways of his former self was the correct path. With the realization dawning upon him, Roman understood that he didn't need to conform to the norms of his current world. He resolved to challenge the common belief that the aura operation method of his present life was entirely flawed. Instead, he sought to forge a path that bridged the gap between his current existence and his past life. Summoning the techniques of the heavenly demon sword style mid trichotomy, Roman unleashed a colossal explosion of purple aura. With a single decisive strike, he vanquished the imaginary butlers that stood before him. In that moment, Roman realized the potential that lay within him, a fusion of both his past and present selves, forging a new path forward. The Roman sword glowed with an otherworldly purple aura, capturing the attention of its wielder, Roman. As the ethereal light enveloped the blade, Roman found himself reflecting on the unexpected twist of his current life. He had initially believed that after gaining another chance at existence, his reborn life would lack the extraordinary elements of his past. Little did he know, fate had different plans. Amidst the silent training grounds, Roman couldn't help but smile at the irony of his situation. In this new life, he mirrored the actions of his previous existence, finding joy and fulfillment in the familiar yet novel experiences. His thoughts meandered through the memories of his past life, and with a renewed sense of purpose, Roman realized the profound beauty of his current existence. The heavenly demon sword style, the very essence of his combat prowess, underwent a mysterious transformation. The familiar techniques now bore a completely different direction, leaving Roman both intrigued and exhilarated. With anticipation building within him, Roman unleashed a singular, mighty strike. To his amazement, the force created a colossal hole in the ground, a testament to the newfound power coursing through him. In the aftermath, Roman contemplated the untapped potential of the heavenly demon sword style. The realization dawned that the path of mastery stretched out before him, promising further progression. In this realm of possibilities, Roman yearned for unexpected events, challenges that would push him to the limits and test the very essence of his being. As Roman surveyed the landscape altered by his singular attack, he understood that the challenges of this world were not obstacles but stepping stones. Each trial became a driving force, a catalyst propelling him towards the zenith of his capabilities. Despite starting anew, Roman harbored an unwavering determination to ascend to the peak once again. The echoes of his feet reached the ears of his companions, Chris, Kevin, and Pucky. Concerned by the unfamiliar sound, they hurried to the training grounds, fearing an attack on their comrade. The sight that greeted them was beyond comprehension. Roman stood amidst the aftermath, a nonchalant expression on his face, as if creating a massive hole without magic was an everyday occurrence. Shocked and bewildered, Chris, Kevin, and Pucky questioned Roman about the spectacle. Roman dismissed their concerns, instructing them to return as he was unharmed. The trio, still processing the inexplicable event, reluctantly left Roman to his training. As they departed, Chris couldn't shake off the astonishment. In his eyes, Roman's achievement was a testament to an unyielding spirit and unmatched dedication. The once weak human, frozen in awe at insurmountable walls, now grappled with the realization that Roman had progressed yet another step beyond their comprehension. Chris, grappling with his frustration, contemplated the stark contrast between his own actions and Roman's ceaseless pursuit of improvement. The looming sword fighting competition intensified his resolve to not merely win, but to triumph with an overwhelming superiority over his adversaries. The trio left the training grounds. Feeling the urgency to bolster their strength, the narrative shifts forward by a month. Roman, having diligently toiled away, proudly presents his newly forged sword. 
Contemplating a suitable name for his creation, he seeks one that would resonate with his current self. Reflecting on his past swords, Salamander and Blaze, which symbolized fresh starts, Roma names for his third sword to embody his present essence, a weapon that strikes fear into the hearts of his adversaries. Thus, he settles on the name Darkness. Chris arrives with a detailed report on the month's activities. Over the preceding weeks, they and their soldiers engaged in battles at regular intervals, meticulously documenting each skirmish. From this rigorous training regimen, Chris identifies several standout swordsmen with impressive win records. Presenting the list to Roman, Chris points out the top contenders, himself, Kevin, Vulcan, Pucky, and the unexpected selections of McBurney and Henderson. Roman, though slightly surprised by the inclusion of the last two names, trusts Chris's judgment and endorses the choices. In a quiet moment between Roman and Chris, Roman shares his perspective on the concept of meaningful loss. He expresses to Chris his belief that such a notion doesn't truly hold weight in the grand scheme of things. With a glint of determination in his eyes, Roman emphasizes that the competition bearing his name serves as a platform to showcase the caliber of his soldiers. Chris nods understandingly, affirming his commitment to the cause. A faint grin graces Roman's lips as he eagerly anticipates the forthcoming challenges, knowing that they will only further validate the strength and prowess of his esteemed warriors. As the day of the competition draws near, all participating swordsmen assemble. Among them, a soldier with striking purple hair exudes confidence, vowing to demonstrate the skills honed on the front lines. Their companion, with features blurred by a veil of anonymity, expresses hope that the former will join Kevin's group, acknowledging Kevin's formidable reputation. The conversation turns to the strengths and weaknesses of various competitors, with Pucky and Vulcan emerging as notable adversaries. For some, the prospect of facing these formidable opponents evokes both apprehension and determination. The announcement of the competition's groupings elicits a range of emotions among the participants. Each grouping is scrutinized, with individuals assessing their chances against fellow contenders. Amidst the anticipation, Baron Liam, a nobleman from the Northeastern Federation, voices his unease at the prospect of facing Chris, recognizing the daunting challenge ahead. Within the Northeastern Alliance, Baron Liam grapples with a wave of apprehension as the day of the competition looms nearer. Yet, his fellow Alliance members rally around him, offering words of solace and reassurance. They remind him of the distinguished lineage of skilled swordsmen from which he hails, urging him not to succumb to despair. Count Conrad, in particular, delivers a stirring speech, imploring Baron Liam not to relinquish hope or motivation. With unwavering conviction, Count Conrad declares his belief that victory will inevitably grace the Conrad bloodline. This conviction is reinforced by the fact that one of his own members is set to face MacBurney, a renowned one-armed swordsman, instilling further confidence in their chances. Count Conrad underscores the paramount importance of the competition for the Alliance's survival, vowing to lead the Conrad bloodline to triumph. His impassioned words ignite a fervent sense of excitement among the Alliance members, who respond with resounding cheers and applause. As the day of reckoning arrives, the arena swells with anticipation as eager spectators gather to witness the unfolding spectacle. Inside, Baron Liam finds himself consumed by the weight of expectation, acutely aware of the scrutiny from the Federation. Turning to his loyal soldier, Max, Baron Liam offers words of caution, advising him to tread carefully and avoid unnecessary risks. Yet, Max's unwavering resolve offers reassurance, as he pledges his unwavering dedication to the pursuit of victory. Max acknowledges the formidable reputation of their opponent, Chris, but steadfastly maintains his own prowess as a two-star swordsman, bolstering Baron Liam's confidence in their capabilities. Encouraged by Max's steadfast determination, Baron Liam fervently implores him to face Chris on the battlefield without reservation. He offers his unwavering support and pledges to intervene if Max's safety is ever imperiled. Max, emboldened by the trust placed in him by Baron Liam, sees this as a defining moment to leave an indelible mark. As he steps onto the arena floor, Max is driven by a burning desire to prove himself not only to his lord, but to the watching audience as well. However, upon locking eyes with Chris, Max finds himself momentarily transfixed by the palpable aura of menace emanating from his opponent. Yet, summoning all his courage, Max steadies himself and focuses on the task at hand. As the clash of swords commences, Max charges forward with unyielding determination, his every movement fueled by an unwavering resolve. However, with a composed demeanor, Chris effortlessly maneuvers his sword, 
causing Max's weapon to slip from his grasp. In a swift motion, Chris strikes with precision, swiftly incapacitating his opponent. The first match concludes in a mere three seconds, with Chris from the Dimitri bloodline emerging victorious and advancing to the second round. Baron Liam, taken aback by the vast disparity in skill between Chris and Max, can only watch in shock. Meanwhile, Kevin, also hailing from the Dimitri bloodline, secures victory in his match, effortlessly advancing to the second round. Vulcan and Pucky follow suit, easily triumphing in their respective bouts and securing their places in the next round. The other participants are left astonished by the dominant performances of these four formidable contenders. Whispers spread among the onlookers, affirming the rumors of the unbeatable nature of Chris, Kevin, Vulcan, and Pucky. With these four seemingly invincible, the remaining participants pin their hopes on defeating Henderson and Mac Burney in the upcoming matches, recognizing them as their only chance to upset the balance of power. Then the scene shifts to, after the group announcements, the focus shifts to a cluster of soldiers who are taken aback by the revelation that Henderson is representing the Dimitri family in the competition. They knew Henderson as part of the Lawrence family, and his reputation as a mere farmer and capable of wielding a sword properly baffles them. They question how Henderson, with his humble background, managed to secure a spot in a prestigious swordsman competition. Among the six representatives of Roman, opinions vary, especially concerning Chris and Kevin, known respectively as the Flash and Devil of Cairo for their renowned skills. Participants are eager to avoid confrontation with these formidable opponents. Similarly, the intimidating physiques and mercenary past of Vulcan and Pucky make them formidable adversaries. In contrast, Mac Burney and Henderson, labeled as a one-armed swordsman and a former farmer, pale in comparison, with Henderson considered the weakest link among them. In the audience, whispers and mockery about Henderson's past embarrassments ripple through the crowd. Being grouped with Henderson is seen as an advantageous stroke of luck, sparking envy among the participants. The scene then transitions to Baron Romero Dimitri, who questions Roman about the necessity of organizing a competition solely to assert the Dimitri family's dominance in the northeastern region. Baron Romero suggests that while hosting such an event might project an image of goodwill from the Dimitri family, the nobles of the northeastern alliance harbor no true intention of submitting to Dimitri's authority. However, Roman provides insight to his father, explaining the vital importance of the competition. He argues that the Northeastern Alliance Association may be overly confident in their ability to challenge Dimitri independently. Roman believes that if they come to realize their inability to breach Dimitri's defenses, they may be more inclined to capitulate to Dimitri's rule without resistance. As the first round for Group 5 commenced, all eyes turned to the match between Henderson and Taylor. Henderson's opponent, Taylor, was known among the audience as an adept or a swordsman, prompting doubts about Henderson's chances. Despite the skepticism surrounding him, Henderson exchanged cordial greetings with Taylor. As Taylor engages in conversation with Henderson, reminiscences of their past encounters flood Taylor's mind. Taylor recalls the day spent aiding Henderson on the farm, never anticipating the drastic shift that would unfold. With a hint of disbelief, Taylor expressed astonishment at Henderson's transformation from a humble farmer to a formidable swordsman. Drawing his sword with a practiced hand, Taylor addresses Henderson, acknowledging their prior acquaintance. Taylor, having recently achieved a significant milestone by attaining a two-star status following a profound revelation, offers counsel to Henderson in their shared moment. With sincerity in his voice, Taylor conveys to Henderson that this encounter marks their final opportunity as acquaintances. He stresses the futility of engaging in a one-sided conflict that would only lead to senseless bloodshed. Urging Henderson to reconsider, Taylor implores him to abandon the impending fight, opting instead for a resolution devoid of unnecessary violence. Upon hearing Taylor's plea, Henderson responds with a firm resolve, urging Taylor to discard any preconceived notions of the Henderson he once knew. With a steely gaze, Henderson warns Taylor that any attempt to show leniency will be swiftly seized upon, exploited as an opportunity to secure victory. Undeterred, Taylor acknowledges Henderson's stance with a somber acceptance, expressing a heartfelt hope that Henderson will not come to rue the path he has chosen. As the match began, Henderson launched himself at Taylor with unrelenting force, his determination palpable in every strike. Taylor, taken aback by the sheer intensity of Henderson's attack, recognized the use of aura in his opponent's movements. Despite the initial surprise, Taylor remained composed, understanding the gravity of the situation. With a swift and decisive motion, Henderson unleashed the Azura Sword technique, 
infusing his blade with aura as he struck at Taylor with precision. In that crucial moment, Henderson's resolve shone through as he vowed to do whatever it took to honor his commitment to Lord Roman and surpass his former self. In the realm of aura manifestation, Henderson found himself trailing behind his peers who swiftly brought forth their aura. Sensing mana and materializing it demanded substantial effort and time from Henderson. The journey was akin to being a tortoise amidst hares, with him consistently at the back of the line. Despite this apparent slowness, Henderson remained diligent, pushing forward with unwavering determination. During the first round of Group 5, Henderson faced Taylor, an adept aura swordsman. Observers speculated that Henderson stood little chance against such a formidable opponent. However, Henderson's perseverance and hard work were about to redefine expectations. In the heat of the match, Henderson's relentless effort nearly led to Taylor's defeat, surprising everyone, especially Taylor. Even though Henderson's progress seemed slow, his resilience and commitment were undeniable. Taylor, astonished by Henderson's tenacity, couldn't fathom losing to him in this manner. Determined to conclude the fight decisively, Taylor employed his own aura to halt Henderson's charge. Despite not wanting to resort to aura against Henderson, Taylor knew it was time to bring the match to an end. With a yellow aura enveloping him, Taylor charged at Henderson with full force, setting the stage for a climactic confrontation. Amidst the clash of auras, Henderson's mind wandered to a conversation with Chris from a month ago. Chris, acknowledging Henderson's initial weakness, had witnessed a transformation within him. Henderson's newfound desire for victory, challenging himself instead of succumbing to defeat, had changed the course of his life. Chris assured Henderson of his worthiness to stand beside Lord Roman, a promise that resonated deeply with him. Returning to the present match, both Henderson and Taylor unleashed their auras, colliding in a clash that would determine the victor. In a surprising turn of events, Taylor found himself defeated on the ground, unable to anticipate Henderson's unexpected prowess. Seizing the opportunity, Henderson stood tall with his sword pointed at Taylor's head, securing his first win in the competition. The audience erupted in excitement as Henderson's triumph unfolded before their eyes. Cheers and chants of Henderson's name filled the arena. The unexpected victory over an aura swordsman by someone who once toiled as a farmer captivated the spectators. Within the Northeastern Alliance, disbelief and shock spread as they witnessed Henderson's unexpected triumph. Questions arose about Count Conrad's earlier assessment of Henderson as a weak link in the group of six. Count Conrad, however, urged his members to maintain composure, confidently stating that the ultimate winner would undoubtedly emerge from the Northeastern Alliance Association. Now, it's Group 2's turn, and Kevin steps into the arena, contemplative as he walks. He can't shake the feeling of being consistently slower than Chris by a whole five seconds. Whenever the question arises of who is the sword of Lord Roman, the unanimous answer is always Chris. Yet, Kevin harbors a stern resolve to prove his own value to Lord Roman in his unique way. His opponent, Miles, hails from the Northeastern Alliance. Miles regards Kevin as the Devil of Dimitri, anticipating a fierce battle. Without hesitation, Miles launches into an aggressive assault, charging at Kevin with full force. However, Kevin remains composed, swiftly evading Miles' attacks and delivering a precise punch to his stomach. Undeterred, Miles continues his onslaught, believing that persistence will eventually land him a blow. Yet, Kevin effortlessly dodges each strike, countering with a series of rapid attacks using his knife. As Miles struggles to keep up, his resolve wanes, and he ultimately surrenders. The members of the Northeastern Alliance are left in shock as they witness their fellow soldiers' defeat. Conversely, for Kevin, the victory solidifies his worth by shattering his opponent's will to fight. In that moment, Kevin proves that true strength isn't just about speed or aggression but also about determination and strategy. The scene unfolds before the commencement of the highly anticipated tournament, where Jonathan, the captain of the renowned Dimitri Knights, rallies his soldiers. They stand in disciplined formation, Jonathan addresses them with a grave tone. He begins, as you are all aware, this competition is hosted by none other than the esteemed young Master Roman. Jonathan continues, and among the competitors stands Chris, the ex-vice captain of the Knight Order, a formidable opponent. He implores his soldiers to watch Chris closely, to learn from his techniques and strategies, recognizing the opportunity to elevate themselves as Knights of the Dimitri Order. The soldiers respond in unison, their voices ringing out in affirmation, Yes, sir. In the arena, Chris, having already triumphed in the first round, prepares for his next challenge. Jonathan observes from the sidelines, a mix of surprise and admiration flickering across his features as he witnesses Chris's skill firsthand. 
He marvels at how Chris has grown stronger since his days in the Night Order. Meanwhile, Chris stands poised and focused, seeing himself not just as a participant, but as a representation of Lord Roman's authority. He is determined to vanquish any opponent who dares to stand in his way, ensuring that none shall question the supremacy of his lord. As the rounds progress, Chris's dominance becomes increasingly evident. With each victory, he pushes himself further, feeling a relentless drive to excel. Yet, despite his remarkable performance, he remains unsatisfied, craving more challenges to overcome. Jonathan watches in astonishment as Chris dispatches his opponents with breathtaking speed and precision. He wonders silently how Chris has attained such formidable strength, pondering the influence of young Master Roman on his protege. Meanwhile, among the other participants, a sense of resignation begins to spread. Some soldiers, faced with the daunting prospect of confronting Chris, choose to concede defeat rather than risk humiliation. They rationalize that it is better to withdraw gracefully than to suffer a humiliating defeat on the battlefield. However, one soldier, Farrell, refuses to yield to despair. Despite his doubts about his ability to defeat Chris, he resolves to face him head-on, if only to prove his worth. Farrell sets himself a modest goal, to last just one minute against the formidable opponent. As the match begins, Farrell braces himself for the inevitable onslaught. But before he can even mount a defense, Chris charges forward with unparalleled speed, delivering a devastating blow that ends the match in a matter of seconds. The arena falls silent as Jonathan and the other spectators watch in awe at Chris's unparalleled skill. Chris's dominance in the tournament was nothing short of extraordinary. After securing victory in the first round, he proceeded to blaze through the following rounds with astonishing speed. In a mere 27 seconds, he had conquered five rounds, leaving spectators in awe and opponents in dismay. The Northeastern Alliance Association could only watch in horror as Chris's unstoppable momentum seemed to defy all expectations. As Chris surged ahead, other competitors also showcased their formidable skills. Kevin's ferociousness earned him victory in Group 2, while Vulcan and Pukey relied on their immense physical strength to overpower their opponents in Groups 3 and 4. Henderson, against all odds, surprised everyone with an unexpected victory in Group 5, further adding to the intrigue of the tournament. Yet, amidst the flurry of victories, there remained one last hope for the Northeastern Alliance Association, facing off against Mac Burney in Group 6. The scene then shifted to Count Conrad, who, with a keen eye, assessed the readiness of his knight, Gabriel. Gabriel, displaying unwavering confidence, assured Count Conrad of his peak condition, a testament to the rigorous training he had undergone since childhood under the Conrad family's guidance. Count Conrad reflected on Gabriel's journey recognizing him as the family's secret weapon. As a three-star swordsman, Gabriel possessed unparalleled skill and expertise. Despite the absence of aura, prohibited in the competition, Gabriel's prowess was undeniable, setting him apart from his competitors. As Count Conrad observed Mac Burney's advancement to round three, he couldn't help but attribute it to mere luck. However, he was certain that the end was nigh for Mac Burney, or rather, for Roman Dimitri. Addressing Gabriel, Count Conrad reminded him of the fate that had befallen all other swordsmen of the Northeastern Alliance Association, leaving Gabriel as the sole contender standing. He cautioned Gabriel against any sense of pity, emphasizing the need to relentlessly crush Mac Burney, despite his one-armed status. Gabriel, upon hearing Count Conrad's words, resolved that there was no conceivable way he could lose to a one-armed opponent. As Gabriel entered the arena, his gaze fell upon Mac Burney whose diminished sense of balance betrayed the loss of his limb. Gabriel pondered how a commoner knight like Mac Burney, who had once seemed incapable of ascending to knighthood even with two arms, could now vie for victory in a competition that epitomized a knight's honor and pride, despite his newfound handicap. As the match commenced, Gabriel charged forward, confident in his abilities and choosing not to rely on Aura to prove his superiority. He launched a barrage of attacks, each aimed at overwhelming Mac Burney. Yet, to Gabriel's surprise, Mac Burney skillfully blocked every strike that came his way. Gabriel's keen anticipation led him to predict Mac Burney's next move, a necessary dodge to the right to evade the impending attack. As Gabriel had foreseen, Mac Burney swiftly shifted in the anticipated direction, unwittingly leaving one side vulnerable. Recognizing the opening, Gabriel seized the moment, swiftly launching his strike toward Mac Burney's exposed flank. But Mac Burney, defying expectations, managed to thwart Gabriel's attack with ease. This unexpected defense left Gabriel puzzled, struggling to comprehend the unorthodox movements of his opponent. Mac Burney relentlessly countered, 
launching a barrage of strikes at Gabriel, who skillfully parried each blow. Witnessing Gabriel's unwavering defense, frustration seeped into his veins. In a moment of impatience, Gabriel summoned his inner strength, channeling his aura to forcefully repel Mac Burney backward. In that charged moment, Gabriel's mind churned with a realization. Mac Burney's journey to the third round wasn't a stroke of luck. It was a testament to his cunning. Despite the apparent imbalance caused by the absence of an arm, Mac Burney wielded it to his advantage, leveraging it as a strategic tool rather than a hindrance. The scene then shifted to a memory of Roman, imparting wisdom to Mac Burney. Roman emphasized the fundamental importance of balance in swordsmanship, revealing the existence of the left arm sword art, a technique devised by a one arm swordsman. Roman marveled at the creator's resilience and determination, contrasting it with Mac Burney's initial sense of hopelessness. Through flashbacks, Mac Burney's journey unfolded, a journey fraught with feelings of inadequacy and despair. He grappled with his disability, struggling to find purpose and meaning in his life. However, as time passed, Mac Burney refused to succumb to despair. Instead, he clung to a flicker of hope, a hope that ignited a fire within him, propelling him to overcome his limitations and master the left arm sword art. In a solemn oath to his lord, Roman, Mac Burney vowed to emerge victorious in the competition, declaring that his life as a swordsman was far from over. Returning to the present moment, Mac Burney skillfully parried Gabriel's attack before swiftly launching himself into the air. With precision, he delivered a decisive strike to Gabriel's chest, bringing him down with a triumphant smile. In that moment, Mac Burney credited Roman for granting him a newfound sense of purpose and vitality, breathing new life into his journey as a swordsman. The arena echoed with the resounding victories of Dimitri's swordsmen, each triumph solidifying their dominance over the Northeastern region. Their success left the members of the Northeastern Alliance Association at a loss for words, their defeat glaringly evident. Count Conrad, a key figure in the association, found himself stunned by the turn of events. The once formidable reputation of the Alliance now lay shattered at their feet, shattered by the overwhelming might of Dimitri. As Count Conrad grappled with the realization of their defeat, he couldn't help but wonder when Dimitri had become so formidable. Shocked and shaken, he questioned the nature of the adversary he had provoked, realizing that even with the support of the central government, victory against Dimitri was far from assured. The other members of the alliance looked to Count Conrad for guidance, seeking direction in the wake of their crushing loss. Acknowledging the defeat of all their swordsmen, Count Conrad grimly accepted the harsh reality that the alliance would now be reduced to mere followers in the region. With a heavy heart, they made the decision to withdraw from the arena, their hopes of reclaiming their former glory dashed by the overwhelming strength of Dimitri. Meanwhile, among the spectators, whispers of astonishment and speculation filled the air. Many marveled at the sudden rise and strength of Chris and his comrades, pondering the role of Roman Dimitri in their transformation. Among them, a brown-haired soldier offered insight into the significance of leadership within a reputable swordsman family. He explained that every such family had a standout leader, whose skill and leadership abilities propelled them to greatness. In the case of Dimitri, it was Roman Dimitri himself who had risen to become the preeminent swordsman, elevating the family's status through his own strength and leadership. This revelation shed light on the clear direction in which the swordsmen of the northeastern region were now headed. To succeed in the competitive world of swordsmanship, the soldier emphasized, one had to pledge their loyalty to Dimitri. It was evident that the once-dominant force of the Northeastern Alliance Association had been eclipsed by the rising power of Dimitri, and those aspiring to greatness as swordsmen would need to align themselves with the formidable family. The scene then shifted to Roman himself, who stood tall amidst the jubilant participants from Dimitri. He offered his congratulations to each of them, recognizing their outstanding performance in the tournament. Roman acknowledged that among those who had sworn loyalty to him, there were those who did so out of necessity driven by the need for strength, while others did so out of genuine respect for his leadership and prowess. Amidst the myriad complexities of human relationships, Roman harbors a distinct aversion to entanglement. While recognizing that some may find themselves with limited options, Roman maintains a preference for simplicity. Emotions, Roman believes, can forge a bond as tight as any, yet his vision of an ideal relationship transcends mere sentimentality. For Roman, the pinnacle of companionship lies in a reciprocal exchange, where both parties bring something of value to the table. In Roman's realm, this reciprocity ensures a steadfastness that endures the test of time. The soldiers under Roman's command yearn for something from their leader, and in turn, Roman seeks something from them. 
It's a symbiosis that fortifies their connection, enabling it to weather even the most prolonged passages of time. Roman holds in high regard the ambition of his soldiers to grow stronger, viewing it as a testament to their dedication. He implores them never to lose sight of this pursuit. After all, each soldier is handpicked by Roman himself, a testament to his unwavering faith in their abilities. Just as Roman has never doubted their capacity for victory, he urges them to harbor the same unyielding belief in themselves. In a gesture of appreciation and recognition, Roman generously rewarded the victors of the competition with ten gold coins and three days of well-deserved respite. He hoped that they would relish their rewards, expressing heartfelt gratitude for their unwavering dedication and allegiance. The scene transitions to Roman's office, where Lucas delivers his findings on the Alliance Association's movements. He informs Roman that, in line with his expectations, the Association has abandoned any plans to confront Dimitri. Lucas asserts that they are unlikely to challenge Dimitri again unless a golden opportunity presents itself. Roman acknowledges the inherent limitations of control in the world. He reflects on the inevitability of dissent, even under the rule of a wise leader. With the uncertainty surrounding Dimitri's potential conflicts with the central government, Roman stresses the importance of minimizing losses in the northeastern region. Thus, he deems the Northeastern Association Alliance a necessary evil. Considering his strategy, Roman concludes that he has successfully provoked the alliance, forcing them to confront reality. He resolves that the next step is to employ power to overcome power. With determination, Roman instructs Lucas to proceed with the plan. Meanwhile, the narrative shifted to the northern outskirts of Cairo, where Count Douglas, a prominent figure with a reputation to uphold, found himself seething with frustration. His anger was directed at his workers, who, despite their efforts, had failed to apprehend a group of bandits and retrieve a crucial slush fund. The worker explained to Douglas that although the bandits in the vicinity had been subdued, locating the hidden fund proved elusive. The origin of this fund traced back to Count Barco, who, foreseeing potential conflicts like the one with the Lawrence family, had gathered funds from sources beyond the Golden Bank. Barco, backed by financial support from Count Douglas and other allies, had prepared for unforeseen situations, bringing along a powerful ally named Homeros as his ace card. However, the tides turned against Barco in the conflict with Roman, resulting in his defeat. Barco's escape attempt in the dead of night led to his demise, leaving Douglas with the grim reality that the only person who could recover the borrowed money had vanished from the world. In a moment of despair, Douglas recalled confidential discussions over meals with Barco. From these conversations, he gleaned information about the hidden slush fund. Driven by desperation, Douglas enlisted the services of the Black Moon, a clandestine group, to locate the fund. Yet, their efforts were thwarted when a group of audacious bandits intercepted the transport, making off with the valuable gold bars. The audacity of a mere bandit group absconding with such a significant treasure confounded and frustrated Douglas. Despite the setback, Douglas remained resolute in his determination to reclaim the stolen funds. He issued an impassioned decree to his men, demanding an exhaustive search throughout the northeastern region until the gold bars were recovered. As frustration loomed large, a breakthrough emerged. A worker rushed in, announcing the arrival of the Black Moon and the revelation of the gold bar's whereabouts. Anxious to expedite the recovery process, Douglas instructed his men to bring in the members of the Black Moon immediately. Among them stood Donovan, a figure draped in a cloak, and the leader of the Black Moon. Donovan bore news of a significant development. Through patient surveillance of the black market, he had uncovered the identity of those responsible for pilfering the gold bars. Douglas, fueled by impatience and a thirst for retribution, demanded that Donovan disclose the identities of the perpetrators without delay. Donovan's revelation left Count Douglas reeling with disbelief. The perpetrators of the audacious theft weren't mere bandits, but members of the Northeastern Alliance Association. As Donovan meticulously unraveled the intricate sequence of events, Initially, it seemed like a routine encounter with bandits, but fate intervened when the bandits crossed paths with soldiers from the Alliance Association. Exploiting the chaos, the soldiers swiftly overwhelmed the bandits and seized the horse carriage containing the stolen gold bars. Donovan asserted with conviction that the soldiers were cognizant of the carriage's ownership, implicating the association in the brazen heist. To substantiate his claims, Donovan presented a damning piece of evidence, a gold bar discovered within the black market. Its distinctive markings match those of Barco's slush funds, confirming the association's involvement. Further investigation revealed the damning connection. The servant responsible for the illicit sale was affiliated with the alliance. 
Donovan reflects on the pivotal moment when he divulged crucial information to Count Douglas, realizing the pivotal role he played in thwarting what could have been the Alliance Association's perfect crime. Yet, he acknowledges that their descent into crisis was largely self-inflicted, stemming from their ill-advised decision to make him their adversary. Contemplating the shifting dynamics within the Northeastern Alliance Association, Donovan muses that Count Douglas and his cohorts could never have fathomed the magnitude of change that unfolded within the ranks of the Black Moon. As if adding a twist to an already intricate tale, the once-renowned Intelligence Guild has now been assimilated into the House sect under the leadership of Hu Lucas. In its new incarnation, the Black Moon operates as a formidable entity, faithfully executing the directives of Roman Dimitri. Enraged and frustrated, Count Douglas wasted no time in mobilizing his forces. He issued urgent orders to his men, commanding them to contact the Alliance Association without delay. Vowing to ensure that the perpetrators faced swift and severe consequences, Douglas's determination burned with an intensity that matched the fury of a raging inferno. Meanwhile, within the hallowed confines of the Alliance Association's meeting room, an air of palpable tension hung heavy. The members, acutely aware of Count Douglas's fearsome reputation as the Beast of the North, trembled at the prospect of incurring his wrath. Uncertainty not at their collective conscience as they grappled with the magnitude of their involvement in the theft. Attempting to alleviate the mounting anxiety, Count Conrad, a voice of reason amidst the chaos, addressed the assembly. He implored them to consider the broader implications of their actions, emphasizing that Barco's slush fund did not solely belong to Count Douglas, asserted the association's rightful claim to the slush funds lent to the Barco family. He reminded the members that they were creditors with a stake in the matter, and therefore, they should not acquiesce to Count Douglas's demands without question. This stance challenged the notion that Count Douglas held unilateral authority over the funds. Some members expressed apprehension about challenging Count Douglas, known as the formidable Beast of the North. They feared the potential consequences of defying him. However, Count Conrad dismissed their concerns, emphasizing the importance of unity and assertiveness in facing Douglas's unjust claims. Despite their reservations, the members reluctantly agreed to support Count Conrad's approach. They understood the necessity of presenting a united front against Count Douglas's overreach, even if it meant confronting a powerful adversary. Their discussion was interrupted by a worker delivering news of a communication request from the Douglas family. Count Conrad, preparing for a potentially confrontational exchange, accepted the call. On the other end of the line, Count Douglas's anger was palpable as he demanded an explanation for what he perceived as theft. In response, Count Conrad maintained his composure, acknowledging Count Douglas's frustration while reminding him of the shared responsibility for the slush funds. He argued that the funds belonged to all creditors, not just to Count Douglas. Furthermore, he pointed out Count Douglas's own questionable actions, suggesting that Douglas had initially attempted to claim the funds for himself. Count Conrad believed he had presented a compelling case against Count Douglas's claims, hoping to reason with him. However, to his surprise, Count Douglas's anger only intensified. Count Douglas vehemently asserted his family's exclusive right to the funds, rejecting Count Conrad's arguments outright. Despite Count Conrad's attempts to assuage Count Douglas's anger, his efforts fell on deaf ears. Count Douglas adamantly declared his intention to contact the central government and initiate a territorial war against the entire Northeastern Alliance Association. He vowed to expose the perceived weakness of the Alliance in the aftermath of Barco's demise, painting a grim picture of their vulnerability without Barco's protection. Frightened by Count Douglas's words, Count Conrad quickly informed the other members that the Alliance Association was facing serious trouble. The scene transitions to Roman's office where Lucas conveys the news to Roman that, as Roman had anticipated, Douglas has declared war against the Alliance Association. Roman, maintaining his composed demeanor, remarks to Lucas that Count Douglas is a man who stands firm once he has spoken. He reassures Lucas that everything is proceeding according to Roman's meticulously devised plan. Acknowledging Count Conrad's meticulous nature, Roman explains that if Douglas were to take more drastic measures, Conrad would inevitably surrender even if it means relinquishing his pride. Roman instructs Lucas to initiate the spread of rumors immediately, emphasizing the importance of cornering Conrad, leaving him no room to retreat or avoid the impending conflict. Roman believes that when Conrad finds himself backed into a corner, he will likely discard his pride as a survival strategy. The scene then shifts to northern Cairo, a vibrant marketplace where an elderly food seller shares with a customer the palpable tension prevailing in the territory. 
The Northeastern Alliance Association's preparations to attack Count Douglas's country stir surprise among the market goers. Subsequently, a beggar, adorned in a worn cap, spreads the confirmed rumors derived directly from a Conrad family servant. The beggar recounts the aftermath of Conrad's call with Douglas, describing Conrad's fit of rage that resulted in the destruction of furniture. According to the beggar, Conrad is resolute in his determination to crush Douglas. The rumors of the Northeastern Alliance Association's alleged ill intentions against Count Douglas begin to circulate widely. The originators of these rumors are identified as merchants and servants, residing in the lowest echelons of society, all affiliated with the secretive house sect. The scene then shifts to Count Douglas, visibly angered by the circulating rumors, setting the stage for the unfolding political drama. Count Douglas, his voice resonating with authority, commands the presence of all his family officials, his demeanor heavy with determination. With unwavering resolve, he swears upon his family name that he will never forgive the Alliance Association for their perceived transgressions. During the magic call with Count Conrad and Count Douglas, the air hummed with tension as Count Conrad sought to soothe his companion's agitation. He reminded Count Douglas to maintain composure, emphasizing that the Alliance Association had not taken any aggressive actions. In fact, they were considering compensation in the form of monetary restitution as a gesture of reconciliation and to implore Count Douglas for forgiveness regarding the unfortunate incident. Count Conrad's voice carried a gentle insistence as he urged Count Douglas to quell his rising agitation, assuring him that the rumors swirling around did not align with the true intentions of the Alliance Association. In response, Count Douglas's tone bristled with indignation, dismissing Conrad's words with a rhetorical question about his perception. He made it clear that his purpose in contacting Conrad was not for negotiation but to declare war on the Alliance Association. Count Douglas scornfully labeled them as pathetic bats driven solely by self-interest, expressing his resolve to crush the association completely. His words echo with defiance, leaving little room for negotiation or compromise. With a decisive conclusion to the call, Count Conrad disconnects, leaving a palpable sense of concern among the other members. They express their apprehension to Count Conrad, acknowledging the gravity of the situation. They recognize the potential consequences of Count Douglas's actions, realizing that innocent civilians may become unwitting casualties in the brewing conflict. Faced with the daunting prospect of confronting Count Douglas alone, they entertain the idea of seeking assistance from the central government. Count Conrad, desperate to avert disaster, reaches out to the central government of Count Parchus in search of support. However, his plea for assistance is met with reluctance. Count Parchus acknowledges the severity of the situation but emphasizes the central government's inability to intervene. He urges Count Conrad to resolve the matter internally, leaving the Alliance Association to fend for themselves. As the weight of their predicament bears down upon them, the members of the Alliance Association grapple with the harsh reality of their circumstances. With external support out of reach, they resign themselves to the inevitability of war. The specter of conflict looms large, casting a shadow of uncertainty over their future. Just when all hope seems lost, a glimmer of opportunity emerges in the form of a surprise communication from Roman Dimitri. Upon receiving the call, Roman addresses Count Conrad, expressing his awareness of the Alliance Association's predicament. Upon hearing the unexpected call from Roman, Count Conrad's initial reaction is guarded, suspecting it to be an opportunity for Roman to ridicule the Alliance Association's plight. However, as Roman's tone proves genuine and his intent to uncover the truth apparent, Count Conrad's skepticism gives way to a sense of intrigue and cautious optimism. Roman's unexpected sincerity prompts Count Conrad to recount the escalating tensions with Count Douglas. Roman, sensing the gravity of the situation, expresses his concern about the impending clash in the northeastern region. He queries Count Conrad about his intentions in this critical moment. With a northeastern force poised to breach their borders, Roman feels a moral obligation to intervene, driven by a desire to prevent further escalation and bloodshed. Count Conrad, surprised by Roman's offer of assistance, questions the motives behind his sudden willingness to aid the Alliance Association. He wonders whether Roman's actions are purely altruistic or if there are ulterior motives at play. Nevertheless, Count Conrad remains open to the possibility of cooperation, recognizing the potential benefits of pooling their resources and strengths. Roman. In response to Count Conrad's inquiries, elucidates his stance. He explains that despite any past grievances between Dimitri and the Alliance Association, he cannot stand idly by his trouble brews in the Northeast. Roman's concern extends beyond personal vendettas, 
he is motivated by a broader commitment to maintaining peace and stability in the region. Count Conrad, realizing the sincerity behind Roman's words, begins to see the potential for collaboration. He acknowledges that Roman's concern for the region's stability aligns with his own interests. With a northeastern force looming on the horizon, Count Conrad recognizes the urgency of the situation and the need for swift action. Putting aside pride and past differences, Count Conrad extends an olive branch to Roman, offering the Alliance Association's cooperation in exchange for assistance. He pledges the Association's willingness to comply with any of Roman's requests, recognizing that their shared goal is to minimize losses and avert further conflict. Roman, weighing his options carefully, deliberates on the potential risks and rewards of extending aid to the Alliance Association. While he acknowledges that there may be short-term gains to be had by refraining from involvement, Roman ultimately prioritizes the long-term stability and unity of Cairo's political landscape. In the northeastern region, the need for cooperation between Dimitri and the Alliance Association becomes increasingly apparent. Count Conrad, initially surprised by Roman's genuine assistance to the Alliance Association, ponders the implications of this unexpected gesture. Roman's request is straightforward. He urges Dimitri and the Alliance Association to reconcile their differences and demonstrate a willingness to collaborate moving forward. He promises assistance to the Alliance Association if Count Conrad agrees to this proposition. Count Conrad, however, finds Roman's proposal somewhat absurd. After all, Dimitri's origins as a commoner family were once a source of disdain for him. Nevertheless, he acknowledges the need to deliberate on the matter thoroughly before offering a response. Several days later, all the Douglas soldiers convene, signaling the gravity of the situation at hand. An official reminds Count Douglas of the necessity to establish clear terms for the post-war landscape. Count Douglas, understanding the weight of the moment, readily agrees, showing his commitment to addressing the aftermath of the conflict. Count Douglas reflects on the recent fall of the Barco family, a development that has left the northeastern region fractured and vulnerable. He recognizes the opportunity presented by this power vacuum understanding the importance of seizing control of such a valuable territory. Amidst the discussions, Count Douglas's officials express their enthusiasm for the prospect of claiming power in the northeastern region. Despite the perception that Douglas is merely a brute devoid of strategic thinking, he proves otherwise by refraining from reckless attacks on his adversaries. Douglas operates with calculated precision, ensuring that any confrontation maximizes his odds of success. This calculated approach has been key to Douglas's survival thus far. He understood the futility of rash action against Barco while they enjoyed the protection of the central government. However, now Douglas is confident in his ability to rally even the territorial lord of the north to his cause, a testament to his strategic acumen and growing influence. Recognizing the weakened state of the Northeastern Alliance Association without Barco's backing. With the absence of their former protectors, the Alliance Association appeared vulnerable their territory ripe for the taking. As Count Douglas confronted the Alliance Association forces, he demanded to speak with their commanding officer, eager to assert his dominance. However, the Alliance Association insisted that it wasn't the designated time for negotiation and asked Count Douglas to wait patiently. Count Douglas, growing impatient, questioned the logic of delaying when all their forces were already assembled, insinuating that they were squandering their efforts on a futile endeavor. Suddenly, a soldier alerted Count Douglas to an approaching figure. Anticipating reinforcements for the Alliance Association, Count Douglas was astonished to see the flag of Dimitri and Roman Dimitri himself leading a troop. His surprise was palpable as he struggled to comprehend Roman's unexpected presence on the battlefield. As Roman steps forward, he presents Count Douglas with a compelling argument regarding Dimitri's sudden appearance on the battlefield. Much like how Count Douglas has rallied the Lords of the North to his cause, Roman suggests that he, too, is mobilizing his forces to aid the Alliance Association, a revelation that stunned not only Count Douglas but also the northern lords who had gathered alongside him. The realization dawned upon Count Douglas that Roman had astutely manipulated the situation, leveraging Count Douglas's call for assistance from other lords to justify his involvement in the war. Feeling blindsided, Count Douglas pondered the implications of Roman's strategic maneuver realizing that his plan had backfired spectacularly. Meanwhile, the northern lords expressed their frustration at not being informed of Roman's participation, lamenting that they would have reconsidered joining the battle had they known about it beforehand. Amidst the rising tension, Count Conrad, ever the voice of reason, urged Count Douglas to prepare for engagement, 
emphasizing the need to proceed with caution. Count Douglas, feeling a surge of frustration and uncertainty, grappled with the sudden turn of events. Just as the situation seemed to teeter on the brink of conflict, Roman intervened, offering the Northerners a choice, engage in close combat or opt for an all-out battle. Count Douglas found himself stunned at the unexpected turn of events. Roman Dimitri, a figure of formidable repute, was joining the fray. The declaration of war had left Count Douglas feeling compelled to stand firm, yet the prospect of engaging Roman's forces head-on seemed to spell certain defeat. Even considering the alternative of close combat filled him with trepidation. While Count Douglas boasted superior numbers compared to the Northeastern Alliance Association, Roman's prowess as a warrior cast a shadow of doubt over their chances of emerging victorious. Count Douglas was at a loss, grappling with the daunting task of devising a strategy to navigate the impending conflict. With a flourish, Roman presents Count Douglas with a bold proposal. He offers to engage in combat with three swordsmen simultaneously. Should Count Douglas remain concerned, Roman is open to increasing the number of soldiers to five. Count Douglas is taken aback by the audacity of the suggestion. While he acknowledges Dimitri's strength, the notion that Roman would propose something so outrageous leaves him incredulous. Roman voices his earnest wish for a conflict resolution with minimal turmoil, expressing hope for a peaceful settlement. Turning to Count Douglas, he awaits his response. Count Douglas, needing a moment of reflection, requests time to consider the matter. The scene transitions to a tranquil forest clearing, where Count Douglas stands among five northern lords. After careful consideration, he presents his decision to embrace Roman's proposal. He reasoned that with five soldiers from their side, they stood a fighting chance against Roman, despite his fearsome reputation. Count Douglas posited that the combined strength of their forces could potentially overcome Roman's formidable skill in combat. However, two of the northern lords voiced apprehension, citing the danger of underestimating Roman's capabilities. They pointed to Roman's previous triumph over Butler, a testament to his prowess as a swordsman, as evidence of the peril they faced. Despite the reservations expressed by some of the northern lords, Count Douglas remained resolute in his conviction to confront Roman head-on. He argued that their options were limited, as regardless of their decision, they would inevitably find themselves locked in battle with Roman. Drawing upon the past successes of his twin swordsmen against a four-star opponent, Count Douglas expressed confidence in their ability to hold their own against Roman. While acknowledging the rumors surrounding Roman's strength, Count Douglas remained steadfast in his belief that they could rise to the challenge. The unfolding events presented Count Douglas and the Northern Lords with a strategic opportunity. They viewed Roman's impulsive decision to engage in combat as a chance to exploit his overconfidence. Count Douglas saw a potential route to victory. If they could eliminate Roman during his boastful display of strength, they could seize control of the entire northeastern region. With unanimous agreement from the Northern Lords, they resolved to implement Count Douglas's strategy, determined to make Roman regret his arrogance. As the battle commenced, an observer from the central government arrived to oversee the proceedings, further intensifying the stakes. Now, the odds were overwhelmingly against Roman, with five adversaries poised to confront him. As the scene unfolds just before the impending battle, two twin soldiers, Vinton, the elder brother, and Vintel, the younger, strategize with the other three soldiers. They outline a plan where Vintel and Vinton will approach Roman from opposing sides, targeting his vulnerable blind spot. While the twins divert Roman's attention, they instruct the other soldiers to engage him. Confident in their coordinated attack, the twins assure the group that despite Roman's prowess, their strategy will create openings for a fatal strike. Promising shared fame and wealth, they urge the supporting soldiers to assist them in securing victory. With everyone poised in their positions, the duel commences. The twins channel their energy and charge at Roman in unison, their determination palpable. However, despite their synchronized assault, Roman swiftly incapacitates them with a single, decisive strike. Count Douglas and the Northern Lords watched in stunned silence as their allies fell before Roman's overwhelming strength. After swiftly incapacitating the twins, Roman turns to Count Douglas and the Northern Lords. With a composed demeanor, he reveals his inner turmoil since learning of Count Douglas's declaration of war. Roman recounts the days when negotiation was favored during the reign of the Barco family. He questions why dialogue was never attempted with Dimitri in the Alliance Association. Coming to a somber realization, Roman concludes that the Northern Lords, including Count Douglas, underestimated the significance of Roman Dimitri's family legacy. This revelation deeply unsettles him. 
In a solemn tone, Roman offers Count Douglas and the Northern Lords a final opportunity to reconsider their stance on the impending conflict. He proposes an alternative, either they withdraw from the battle altogether or opt for a conventional engagement. Count Douglas is taken aback by this unexpected proposition. Contemplating the options, he realizes that in a standard war scenario, numerous soldiers under his command would inevitably perish. Faced with this grim prospect, Count Douglas weighs his choices and concludes that he would prefer to minimize casualties, opting instead to sacrifice only the five soldiers involved in the current strategy. Determined to uphold the rules they had set, Count Douglas resolved to see their decision through to the end. Accepting Count Douglas's resolve, Roman agreed to proceed as planned. However, the remaining three soldiers from Count Douglas's faction recognized that the battle was effectively over. They hesitated, contemplating ending the fight then and there. Observing their reluctance, Roman anticipated their surrender, viewing it as an act of cowardice. In an attempt to level the playing field, Roman dropped his sword, opting to fight unarmed. With unwavering confidence, he invited the soldiers to continue their attack. The soldiers, mindful of the dishonor that would accompany their retreat, decided to press forward. Believing they could overcome Roman now that he was unarmed, they charged at him with determination. In a swift and decisive move, Roman shatters a soldier's sword with a powerful punch, the impact landing squarely on the soldier's face. With fluid precision, he incapacitates the other two soldiers as they attempt to surrender. Ignoring their pleas, Roman relentlessly pummels them into submission, leaving no room for mercy. After subduing the soldiers, Roman fixes Count Douglas and the other northern lords with a stern gaze, his expression unyielding. With a tone heavy with authority, he demands if there are any objections. Count Douglas and the other lords, their heads bowed in acknowledgement, murmur in unison that there are no objections to be made. Returning to Count Conrad, Roman received a gesture of gratitude as Count Conrad bowed and expressed appreciation for Roman's assistance in the war. Roman assured Count Conrad of his commitment to their partnership moving forward. Count Conrad reflected that had the Alliance Association opted for an all-out war against Dimitri, they would have suffered defeat instead. True to Roman's plan, the hierarchy of the northeastern region had now been established clearly. A few days later, the scene shifted to the conference room of the Northeastern Alliance Association. Count Conrad and other members sat around the table, with Roman Dimitri occupying the central seat. Roman announced that his father had granted him full authority in the matter at hand. He inquired if anyone had any objections, but silence prevailed. With a smile, Roman declared that he had news to share with everyone present. As Roman surveyed the faces around the table, his inquiry hung heavy in the air like a veil of uncertainty. Do you believe that the Cairo Kingdom is charting the right course? He asked, his voice carrying the weight of contemplation. It wasn't the invasion by Hector that plagued Roman's thoughts the most, but that alone was a cause for concern. No, what nodded him were the fissures within Cairo itself. The lack of trust from the commanders of the Southern Front echoed louder in his mind than the clash of swords on distant battlefields. Meanwhile, in the hallowed halls of the central government, needless power struggles raged like storms on a turbulent sea. Were it not for Roman and his valiant soldiers, the southern front would have crumbled like a sandcastle before the tide, leaving Cairo at the mercy of Hector's forces. Roman's gaze hardened as he continued, each word etched with a resolve forged in the fires of adversity. Should another conflict arise, at that moment, the central government will not hesitate to conscript soldiers from every corner of our realm casting them into the fray like pawns on a chessboard. And while the nobles mourn their fallen warriors, the aristocracy of the central government will only tighten their grasp on power, their influence swelling like a tide of self-interest within the kingdom. As the tension thickened around the table, it became evident that facing the harsh realities of their situation was imperative. Each count listened intently to Roman, their expressions a canvas of surprise painted with strokes of concern. Addressing them with a measured tone, Roman underscored the necessity for change. We must acknowledge the root cause of this conflict, the unjust treatment we endure, he asserted. His proposal hung in the air like a beacon of hope amidst the storm. Just as the nobles and the capital leveraged the central government for their own gain, why can't we, the northeastern region, band together and protect each other? Roman contemplated the unfolding scenario, recognizing the impending shift in dynamics once Dimitri initiated action. He understood that the central government would seize the opportunity to limit his maneuvering time. It was imperative for Roman to consolidate the northeastern region, unifying its factions. Such unity would not only fortify his position but also serve as a deterrent against hasty actions from the central government.
Jonathan's voice cut through the tension, probing the depths of Roman's plan. But will our unity grant us true influence, even in the face of the central government's power? He questioned, voicing the doubts that lingered in the hearts of many around the table. Yet, if Jonathan were to exclude territories like Lawrence's from the fold, the northeastern expanse would reveal its stark reality, a landscape teetering on the edge of desolation. Most families in these lands rely heavily on imports from neighboring regions to sustain themselves. Jonathan elaborated, emphasizing the critical point that if the northeastern region dared to defy the central government, it risked severing access to essential supplies. The interconnectedness of northeastern businesses with the central authority created a dependency that seemed insurmountable. Breaking this cycle was essential. Otherwise, the nobles residing outside the capital would find themselves inexorably bound to the will of the central government, with scant opportunity for independent action. Roman addressed the assembled counts at the table, conveying that with unanimous agreement and collaboration, he believed they could, at the very least, find a solution to the pressing issue of rations. Roman shows everyone a paper and states that this is the future development plan of the northeastern region. Our lands may be rugged, but they hold untapped potential, he proclaimed, gesturing to the sprawling mountains that dominated Dimitri's domain. Dimitri's realm boasted an expanse of boundless mountain ranges, a natural fortress, ideal for repelling enemy incursions. Roman envisioned the construction of a formidable stronghold within these rugged peaks, a sanctuary where the people could seek refuge in times of strife. Once reclaimed, these mountains would not only serve as a bulwark against external threats, but also as fertile grounds for cultivation, fostering the region's self-sufficiency. Count Conrad voiced his skepticism, questioning the feasibility of such ambitious plans. Roman assured Count Conrad, it is indeed possible. Roman reflected on his past experiences. The case of the heavenly demon divine cult stood out as a formidable fortress, capable of enduring relentless assaults from the orthodox Murim for several years. Nestled within the 10,000 Mountains region, its defenses were bolstered by sprawling mountain ranges stretching hundreds of kilometers. Roman drew parallels between this legendary stronghold and the terrain of Dimitri's domain, noting the abundance of blacksmiths within its borders. Was it mere coincidence or the hand of fate guiding their path? Roman laid out the plans before the assembled nobles, each sheet of paper a testament to his vision. Marked areas signified where reclamation efforts were underway, a tangible sign of progress amidst uncertainty. With a measured tone, Roman assured them of the time and dedication required, yet promised that their efforts would yield the strength needed to stand firm against the central government's encroachment. As the counts scrutinized the documents, they marveled at the meticulousness of Roman strategy. Jonathan's astonishment was palpable noting the intricate detail woven into both the reclamation plans and fortress blueprints. It was evident that Roman's suggestion was more than mere conjecture, it was a blueprint for action. Viscount Lawrence pledged his family's allegiance to Dimitri's cause, a sentiment echoed by the Conrad family. With unanimous agreement, the nobles aligned themselves with Roman's vision. With a sense of finality, Roman christened their union the Dimitri Alliance, symbolizing the region's newfound unity under Dimitri's leadership. The scene transitions to Romero Dimitri's office, where he contemplates Roman's plan, relayed to him by Jonathan. Despite harboring a twinge of regret for Rodwell, who had dedicated himself tirelessly, Romero acknowledges that Roman has become an irreplaceable figure within the Dimitri family. Standing before the window, he remarks on the brilliance of the moon, a silent observer to the unfolding events below. Meanwhile, Marquis Valentino finds himself consumed by frustration in his own domain. For weeks, he has been plagued by unanswered questions, sparked by a letter from Dimitri's esteemed blacksmith, Hendrix. In it, Hendrix reveals that none of his crafted swords have ever graced the auction house. Perplexed, Marquis Valentino embarks on a fruitless quest to uncover the elusive artisan behind the legendary blade, reaching out to countless blacksmiths to no avail. As Marquis Valentino delves deeper into his quest for answers, a worker enters his chambers bearing unexpected news. Someone has reportedly spotted a sword resembling Blaze in the possession of a master blacksmith from the Dimitri estate. Astonished by this revelation, Marquis Valentino wastes no time in issuing orders to hasten his journey to the Dimitri estate. Upon arrival, he is greeted by Hendrik, Dimitri's master blacksmith, who inquires about the purpose of Valentino's visit. Cutting straight to the heart of the matter, Valentino recounts his acquisition of Blaze at the Adelian auction house a month prior. Hendrik confirms having read Valentino's letter regarding the sword. Valentino wastes no time in presenting Blaze to Hendrik, 
emphasizing its extraordinary craftsmanship and unique ability to channel mana flawlessly. Convinced that the artisan behind Blaze must be among the finest in Cairo, Valentino eagerly awaits Hendrix's reaction as the master blacksmith lays eyes on the remarkable blade. Observing Hendrix's expression, Marquis Valentino's confidence in his suspicions grows. He informs Hendrick that it appears he indeed possesses a sword akin to Blaze, citing a recent report he had received. Hendrick takes a moment to mull over Valentino's words before agreeing to retrieve the sword. Valentino's anticipation swells as he waits, his excitement palpable. Hendrick, meanwhile, considers the implications of Valentino's interest. Surely, a collector of Valentino's stature would appreciate the significance of the sword he is about to unveil. With a sense of ceremony, Hendrick presents the blade to Valentino, revealing its name, Salamander. As Valentino lays eyes on the sword, a shiver runs down his spine. His intuition tells him that Salamander is none other than the magnum opus of the artisan responsible for Blaze. Hendrick confirms Valentino's suspicion. Both Blaze and Salamander were indeed crafted by the same skilled hand. However, he clarifies that Salamander was the initial creation, predating Blaze. Valentino's mind whirls with the implications of this revelation. He desires to possess the Salamander sword. Carefully broaching the subject, Valentino inquires if Hendrick would consider selling Salamander. Hendrick's response dashes Valentino's hopes. The sword is not for sale. It was a gift, and as such, holds sentimental value beyond its craftsmanship. Valentino is taken aback by this revelation, realizing that Hendrick not only possesses knowledge of the sword's artisan but also has a personal connection to them. Valentino's thoughts raise as he considers the implications. Could the retired Baron Romero be the elusive artisan behind these extraordinary swords? The pieces of the puzzle begin to fall into place, fueling Valentino's determination to unravel the mystery surrounding Blaze and Salamander. Hendrick's revelation stuns Marquis Valentino. Salamander was not the creation of Baron Romero, but rather the handiwork of Roman Dimitri, the eldest son of Dimitri. Valentino's mind races as he processes this information. Roman Dimitri, the youngest ranker in Cairo, and the creator of the kingdom's finest sword, this changes everything. Valentino understands the significance of the story behind each masterpiece. If a sword is merely crafted by an artisan, its value is judged solely by its quality. However, a sword forged by the youngest genius swordsman of the kingdom carries a different weight. Its rarity alone could drive its value skyward. Realizing the potential implications, Valentino knows he must meet with Roman Dimitri at once. The scene transitions to the training grounds of Dimitri. Chris and Roman engage in a practice match, their blades dancing in the air with calculated precision. Chris, with a ferocity fueled by determination, launches a relentless assault upon Roman. Yet, with a grace born of experience, Roman effortlessly evades each of Chris's strikes, his movements fluid and precise. However, amidst their spar, Roman's keen eyes catch sight of a figure standing beside Hans, a glimmer of opportunity amidst the chaos. Seizing upon this opening, Chris channels his aura into a powerful strike, unleashing a surge of energy that erupts into a formidable explosion. As the dust settles and the echoes of the blast fade away, the assembled soldiers gaze in astonishment at the scene before them, Roman standing tall, victorious over his adversary. Acknowledging Chris's formidable tactic, Roman offers words of praise tempered with wisdom. He advises Chris that while such sudden bursts of power may be effective, they also leave one vulnerable to counterattacks. Encouraging Chris to consider a strategy that disrupts their opponent's balance more subtly, Roman's guidance underscores his depth of understanding in combat. Observing the exchange from the sidelines, Marquis Valentino cannot help but marvel at the strength and skill displayed by Roman Dimitri. Indeed, Roman's name has become a topic of fervent discussion throughout the kingdom, particularly following his recent victory over the second-ranked fighter from Hector. Lost in contemplation, Marquis Valentino muses on the potential accolades that await Roman within the ranks of Cairo. Having witnessed Roman's prowess firsthand, he ponders the implications of Roman's rise to prominence, recognizing the shifting tides of power and influence within the kingdom. Marquis Valentino's mind churned with newfound respect as he observed Roman in person. It was clear that Roman surpassed the mere rumors and whispers that circulated about him. The notion of someone like Roman, a humble blacksmith from the depths of the Cairo kingdom, potentially being the most gifted individual on the entire continent, was a revelation that stirred Marquis Valentino's thoughts. His musings were interrupted by Hans's announcement of a guest. Roman turned to see Marquis Valentino enter, and without hesitation, 
extended his hand in greeting. Marquis Valentino couldn't help but marvel at the thought that this was the very hand that had forged the legendary blade. Blaze. With a smile, he reciprocated the handshake and introduced himself in turn. Moving to a more private setting, Marquis Valentino revealed the purpose of his visit, Blaze. Roman's eyes fell upon the sword, recognizing it as the very weapon he had entrusted to Lucas. Marquis Valentino explained that he had marshaled the considerable resources of his family to uncover the truth behind Blaze's creation. With a directness born of his reputation as the wealthiest man in the Cairo kingdom, Marquis Valentino asked Roman the pivotal question, was he truly the artisan who had forged Blaze? Meanwhile, Roman couldn't help but ponder the irony of the situation. Here stood Marquis Valentino, known far and wide as the greedy collector. Valentino stood as a figure of considerable influence among the neutral factions, commanding the most formidable troops named Mong and holding sway over Cairo's bustling commerce. His wealth was a force to be reckoned with, capable of tilting the delicate balance of power in any direction. Yet, despite this potential for upheaval, Valentino had demonstrated unwavering determination in maintaining equilibrium among the four factions. To Roman, Valentino was a fascinating character, a man whose actions spoke volumes about his shrewdness and foresight. As their conversation unfolded, Roman confirmed to Valentino that indeed, he was the master craftsman behind the creation of Blaze. The admission seemed to elevate Valentino to the status of a fervent admirer, as he expressed his profound gratitude for the opportunity to meet the renowned blacksmith. Valentino recounted his relentless pursuit of Roman, describing the electrifying moment when he first laid eyes on Blaze at an auction house, a moment that felt akin to being struck by lightning. He praised Dimitri as the hallowed ground of blacksmiths, prompting him to inquire about Roman's lineage and the source of his remarkable talent. With a sense of reverence, Valentino requested to see the sword that had captivated his attention mere moments ago. In response to Valentino's inquiry, Roman offered a nod of assent before presenting his blade. Valentino's eyes widened in astonishment as he beheld the sword in his hands. With a mixture of curiosity and admiration, he inquired about the name of the blade. Roman, with a hint of pride in his voice, revealed that he had christened it Darkness. Valentino's mind whirled with thoughts as he processed this revelation. He reflected on the legendary status of swords like Salamander and Blaze, acknowledging their unprecedented craftsmanship and power. Yet, in the presence of darkness, a blade infused with intense darkness, he recognized a whole new level of artistry and mastery. The notion of Roman's continuous growth as a blacksmith intrigued Valentino. He pondered the potential of future creations, wondering just how much more formidable Roman swords could become. With a gleam of excitement in his eyes, Valentino presented Roman with a special proposition. His conditions were straightforward. Firstly, if Roman ever decided to sell his swords, Valentino wished to be given the opportunity to purchase them. Secondly, Valentino expressed a desire to be the first to witness each new creation forged by Roman, regardless of location or circumstance. Marquis Valentino's determination to reach Roman was palpable, his expression brimming with enthusiasm as he addressed him. With a sense of urgency, he conveyed to Roman that if he could offer his assurance on two pivotal points, the entire Valentino family would throw their support behind Dimitri henceforth. Roman's surprise was evident as he processed the gravity of Valentino's words. Was Valentino, known for his neutrality, truly considering abandoning that stance? Valentino, sensing Roman's astonishment, emphasized the significance of his proposal. By aligning with Dimitri, the Valentino family would be relinquishing the neutrality they had upheld for so long, a decision not to be taken lightly. Curious about Valentino's motives, Roman pressed for an explanation. In response, Valentino admitted to feeling mounting pressure from the four factions in recent times. Recognizing that neutrality could not be maintained indefinitely, Valentino had begun contemplating which faction to support when the time inevitably came. Learning of Roman's role in founding the Dimitri Alliance and his prowess as the artisan behind Blaze only strengthened Valentino's inclination towards him. To Valentino, the logic was clear. With Roman's leadership and expertise, aligning with Dimitri seemed not only logical but also advantageous. Marquis Valentino couldn't deny the financial stability of the Dimitri family, yet the allure of greater wealth remained irresistible. With a wry smile, he confessed to being truly captivated by Roman Dimitri's proposition, recognizing the potential benefits of aligning with such a formidable force. Roman's reaction was swift and resolute. Rising to his feet, he reaffirmed the loyalty pledged by the nobles of the Dimitri alliance to their family name. 
With a stern expression, he posed a critical question to Valentino. Was the Valentino family prepared to stand alongside Dimitri? Valentino's smile was genuine as he bowed in deference to Roman, assuring him of the unwavering commitment of the Valentino family. He pledged that they would follow Roman's lead without hesitation, even if it meant braving the flames of adversity. Roman couldn't help but be surprised by Valentino's unwavering loyalty and unexpected ally in their midst. With a warm smile, Roman expressed his gratitude for Valentino's support, acknowledging the significance of their newfound alliance. From that moment on, Roman made it clear that he would depend on Marquis Valentino's steadfastness. In a moment of transparency, Valentino sought Roman's permission to reveal the truth about his role in forging Blaze. With a grin, Valentino expressed his excitement over acquiring such an extraordinary sword. He playfully remarked that he would be overwhelmed with frustration if he couldn't boast about it to everyone he encountered. Roman couldn't help but marvel at Valentino's unique charisma, granting him permission to share the news with the world. The scene then shifted to the grand halls of the Valentino family palace, where Marquis Valentino proudly displayed the fabled artisan sword to a gathering of nobles. He regaled his friends with tales of its remarkable abilities, asserting that even a swordsman of modest skill could repel the aura of a more seasoned opponent. Intrigued, Valentino's friends sought confirmation of the sword's capabilities. With a twinkle in his eye, Valentino assured them that he had never misled them about his collections before. Moreover, he emphasized the illustrious pedigree of the sword's creator, the same artisan who had famously driven away Hector, earning him the title of Cairo's hero, Roman Dimitri of the blacksmith family. Excitement rippled through the gathering as Valentino's friends connected the dots. This was the very sword Roman had wielded to defeat Butler, a fact that added to its mystique. Valentino continued to share insights, revealing that Blaze was just one of three remarkable swords crafted by Roman thus far. In light of this revelation, the assembled individuals began to affectionately refer to them as the Roman Dimitri Collection. As Roman's fame soared, the Dimitri blacksmiths experienced an unprecedented surge in business, straining to keep pace with the newfound demand. One night, within the opulent halls of the Dimitri Palace, Roman strolled through the corridors deep in thought. Suddenly, a figure cloaked in secrecy emerged from the shadows. Mackin, an agent of Valhalla Intelligence, approached Roman with a solemn message. Not only had Roman vanquished Hector, but he had also emerged victorious against Butler, a feat that had not gone unnoticed by Valhalla. Mackin confessed that Valhalla had underestimated Roman's influence and power, especially with the recent formation of the independent organization known as the Dimitri Alliance in the northeastern region. In Mackin's eyes, Roman had become a significant threat to the future plans of the Valhalla Empire. Mackin asked Roman to decide whether he would follow Valhalla or become its enemy. With a smirk and a gleam in his eyes, Roman asked Mackin, Why should I obey Valhalla's orders? In the dimly lit chamber, Mackin's words hung heavy in the air as he confronted Roman. Mackin, with a steely gaze, warned Roman of his anticipated hostility towards Valhalla. But Roman, unfazed, stood his ground. Let's get things straight, Roman retorted, his voice laced with determination. He reminded Mackin that it was Mackin himself who had initiated the threat against him. Roman made it clear that he harbored no intention of coercing anyone into swearing allegiance to him. His principles remained steadfast even in the face of looming conflict. As Mackin's words lingered, Roman's mind raced. He couldn't shake the conviction that the Cairo kingdom was a prime target groomed by the Kronos Empire for years. The prospect of Valhalla's aggression against Cairo ignited a spark of concern within Roman. He knew all too well that such actions would not go unanswered by the formidable Kronos Empire. With a grave expression, Roman leveled a serious gaze at Mackin. He conveyed a warning veiled in determination, urging Mackin to reconsider his stance. If Mackin dared not to become Roman's adversary, he needed to exercise patience. Roman assured Mackin that the group he had assembled would ascend to the pinnacle of Cairo's power, with Dimitri emerging as the linchpin of change. Mackin, taken aback by Roman's resolve, acknowledged his boldness. Mackin's words resonated in the air as he cautioned Roman against carrying himself with undue pride. He warned Roman that such arrogance would inevitably attract challenges and adversaries. Even someone like Butler, whom Roman had struggled to overcome, was considered insignificant in the grand scheme of Valhalla. Mackin emphasized the vastness of the continent, implying the multitude of potential threats lurking within it. Before disappearing into the shadows, Mackin granted Roman a reprieve, promising him additional time to contemplate his next moves. Mackin expressed genuine hope that Roman would exercise wisdom in his decision-making, 
With the formation of the Dimitri Alliance, the political landscape of Cairo shifted. Each faction reached out to Roman, beseeching him to make a decisive choice. The weight of their expectations bore down on Roman's shoulders as he contemplated the path ahead. Meanwhile, in the opulent confines of Marquis Benedict's office, tension simmered beneath the surface. A concerned worker dared to question Marquis Benedict's intentions regarding Roman. Marquis Benedict's response dripped with calculated ambiguity. If Roman were to align himself with Marquis Benedict, all past transgressions would be forgiven. However, should Roman opt for any faction other than the one Marquis Benedict represents, he solemnly pledges to ensure that Roman faces the repercussions of his decisions and actions. Back in Roman's quarters, he found himself gazing out of the window, lost in thought. As the Dimitri alliance had deftly exploited the delicate balance of power, yet Roman understood that their time was limited. The upcoming year would be crucial, a fleeting window of opportunity that must be seized with precision. The looming specter of war cast a shadow over the Dimitri alliance, signaling inevitable losses and sacrifices on the horizon. Roman, cognizant of the impending conflict, realized the urgent need to fortify his skills, particularly in mastering magic, an indispensable asset in the impending turmoil. In the vast expanse of the continent lay thirteen formidable magic towers, each a bastion of arcane power. Among them, the magic tower of the Heavenly Palace stood as a pinnacle of magical prowess. Here, a grand conference convened, gathering representatives from each tower to showcase their achievements and advancements. Despite the Phoenix Tower's impressive display of fifth circle magic, it was met with apathy from the attending mages. The reason behind the Phoenix Tower's subdued reactions stemmed from a fundamental issue plaguing them a crisis of identity. This unique dilemma afflicted only the Phoenix Tower, stemming from the loss of their ancient grimoire, a cherished artifact passed down through generations. Within the confines of the Phoenix Magic Tower, Felix, acting as the tower's proxy, grappled with the weight of responsibility. Three years prior, Felix had unexpectedly assumed the mantle of leadership, thrust into a position for which he felt ill-prepared. His mentor's disappearance left a void, compounding the challenges he faced. The inability to inherit the burning grimoire, a revered artifact of the Phoenix Tower, further underscored Felix's inadequacy in the eyes of his peers. As disillusionment spread among the Tower's members, the once thriving community dwindled, exacerbated by the loss of funding from the Frank Empire. In the midst of despair, a glimmer of hope emerged in an unexpected form, a letter bearing the seal of Roman Dimitri. The missive bore a proposition that stirred both surprise and intrigue within Felix's troubled heart. In exchange for the Dimitri Alliance's assistance, Felix was offered a role as Roman sparring partner for the next six months, with a generous stipend of 1,000 gold coins granted monthly. The offer, though distant, presented a lifeline amid the encroaching darkness. In the realm of necessity, Felix found himself devoid of the luxury of choice. Despite any reservations or hesitations, his path led directly to Dimitri, a journey he must undertake. As he journeyed in a carriage towards his destination, Felix contemplated the renown of the Dimitri family, known as the Sacred Land of Blacksmiths. It was a place seemingly uninterested in the arcane arts, contrasting sharply with the prominence of magic towers scattered across the continent. Among these towers, the Heavenly Palace Tower stood as a beacon of magical prowess, while seven others resided within the Kronos Empire, revered as sacred lands for mages. In contrast, Cairo, and by extension, Dimitri, were often regarded as barren lands for magic. Yet, despite this perception, Dimitri held a reputation as a formidable force, situated in the remote northeastern reaches of Cairo. Roman's invitation was the sole catalyst propelling Felix towards Dimitri's gates. The Phoenix Tower, facing its own existential crisis, focused solely on acquiring the necessary funds to sustain its survival. With this imperative driving him forward, Felix's journey culminated in the sight of Dimitri's entrance, a scene marked by meticulous order and efficiency. Approaching the entry point, Felix encountered a guard whose stern demeanor belied the precision of his duties. Halting Felix's progress, the guard inquired about his purpose. Felix, composed yet eager, identified himself and disclosed his purpose, an invitation from Sir Roman Dimitri. Observing the scene, Felix couldn't help but marvel at the systematic and orderly nature of Dimitri. The precision in the movements of the guards and the strategically placed magical devices, along with the imposing fortress walls in case of war, led Felix to conclude that Dimitri's defense was flawless. Despite being a remote territory, Dimitri had earned its reputation as a formidable force that demanded recognition. 
Within Dimitri's confines, Felix finally met Roman face to face. Roman's commanding presence and aura of authority were unmistakable. With a firm handshake and a direct gaze, Roman welcomed Felix into his domain. In Roman's presence, Felix couldn't help but feel a sense of reverence. There was something about him that transcended the ordinary, a quality that commanded respect and admiration. Gathering his thoughts, Felix wasted no time in getting to the heart of the matter. Felix inquired of Roman, seeking assurance about the terms set forth in the letter Roman had dispatched to him. Roman reassured Felix about the terms laid out in the letter he had sent, confirming that Felix would indeed receive 1,000 gold per month for six months as compensation for serving as his sparring partner. This amounted to a total of 6,000 gold, a significant sum by any measure. However, Felix couldn't help but express his confusion. He questioned why Roman had singled him out for this role when there were likely numerous candidates eager to spar with someone of Roman stature. Roman's response shed light on his decision-making process. He acknowledged the formidable reputation of the Phoenix Tower's flame magic, recognizing Felix's exceptional skills in this domain. Moreover, Roman acknowledged the challenges currently faced by the Phoenix Tower, implying that Felix's assistance was particularly valuable during this precarious time. In Roman's eyes, compensating Felix appropriately was a means of securing the expertise and time of a mage as skilled as Felix. Furthermore, Roman made it clear that he bore full responsibility for any harm that might befall him during their training sessions. As long as Felix committed to giving his utmost effort in every bout, he wouldn't be held accountable for any adverse outcomes. With a serious demeanor, Felix contemplated whether Roman truly understood the implications of their agreement or if he was perhaps underestimating the abilities of mages in general. The scene then shifted to the training grounds of Dimitri, where Roman and Felix faced off against each other. Roman generously offered Felix the first move, a gesture that Felix eagerly accepted. With determination in his eyes, Felix unleashed his formidable fire lance magic, triggering a powerful explosion. As Roman deftly evaded Felix's attack, Felix found himself face to face with Roman behind him. Undeterred, Felix unleashed his inferno spell, directing a blaze towards Roman. However, Roman found himself hemmed in by walls of fire conjured by Felix's spell on both sides. Undeterred, Felix launched his final spell, Rune Flare, with all the force he could muster. As the spell hurtled towards Roman, Felix was convinced that he had successfully immobilized his opponent. Yet, to his astonishment, Roman emerged and scathed, standing behind him with a hint of amusement in his eyes. Roman's casual remark about Felix's reluctance to employ fifth circle magic left Felix momentarily speechless. Felix watched in disbelief as Roman emerged and scathed from the flames. Roman's calm demeanor amidst the inferno unsettled Felix, prompting him to spring into action. As Roman reached out, Felix instinctively activated his blink magic, sidestepping Roman's grasp and creating a brief respite. But Roman was swift. In the blink of an eye, he closed the distance between them, catching Felix off guard. With a surge of determination, Felix unleashed his hold spell, hoping to restrain Roman momentarily. Despite Roman's efforts to break free, Felix maintained his grip buying himself precious seconds to strategize. Felix knew it was time to prove his worth. With a steely resolve, he unleashed his inferno burning spell, sending waves of fire in all directions. Yet, to his astonishment, Roman effortlessly evaded each flame, reappearing before Felix with a knowing smirk. Their sparring session concluded. Roman announced their meeting for the following day. Surprised and defeated, Felix found himself sprawled on the ground after his encounter with Roman Dimitri. Contemplating his defeat, Felix couldn't shake the feeling that Roman had somehow anticipated the magic he would employ. Knowing that there were no techniques capable of foreseeing magic, Felix was left wondering how Roman had managed to do so. Frustration welled up within Felix as he pondered the prospect of facing Roman in battle again. Doubt crept in as Felix realized that, under the current circumstances, he stood little chance of defeating Roman. Recognizing the need for a new approach, Felix resolved to engage in deeper contemplation and strategic planning. Since the disappearance of the Phoenix Tower Master, Felix had dedicated himself to mastering the secrets of fire magic. Despite the tower's looming demise, he remained undeterred, driven by an unyielding determination to keep its legacy alive. His relentless pursuit had earned him admiration from his peers, who regarded him as a beacon of strength and resilience in the face of adversity. As dawn broke on the next day, Felix found himself once again facing Roman. With a sense of urgency, he cast another spell, 
as Felix mulled over Roman's seemingly preternatural ability to anticipate his magical maneuvers, he resolved to shift his strategy. Convinced that confounding Roman's predictions could provide an edge, Felix summoned a towering cliff using his Stone Age spell, blocking Roman's path. Roman's reaction, a serene smile, prompted Felix to reflect on the inherent advantage of magic. Unlike physical combat, magic offered a fluidity that didn't hinge on pinpoint precision. This observation emboldened Felix as he launched a fire wave spell at Roman. Yet, Roman effortlessly dodged the fiery onslaught, evading with a nimble leap into the air. Unfazed by the evasion, Felix pressed on, unleashing a barrage of fire cannons aimed directly at Roman. But once more, Roman deflected the attack, erecting a barrier with his sword in a display of remarkable skill and precision. Felix's mind raced, contemplating whether Roman's defense was aided by some magical artifact. However, Upon reflection, he concluded that Roman had likely crafted the barrier himself, a testament to his formidable abilities. In a swift counterattack, Roman closed the distance between them, delivering a punishing blow to Felix's abdomen, sending him crashing to the ground. As Felix grappled with the pain and frustration of yet another defeat, he realized that his current approach was insufficient to overcome Roman's prowess. Sensing Felix's inner turmoil, Roman extended an unexpected offer. He granted Felix carte blanche to employ any means necessary in their future encounters, including enlisting aid from his fellow mages. Additionally, Roman adjusted the stakes of their battles, offering a substantial reward of 10,000 gold for each victory Felix achieved. The magnitude of the offer left Felix stunned. The realization dawned that such a sum could sustain countless individuals for an entire year. Felix concluded that Roman had never regarded him as an equal from the beginning. However, Roman posed a question to Felix. Would he accept Roman's offer? Without hesitation, Felix accepted the proposition. With a sense of determination and pride, Felix vowed to make Roman Dimitri yield and to deplete the gold reserves of Dimitri. It had become a matter of personal pride for Felix, and he was determined to emerge victorious. In the days that followed, he approached each confrontation with renewed focus and vigor, using every defeat as a lesson to refine his tactics. By the eighth encounter, Felix began incorporating spells designed to restrict Roman's movements, such as slow, mist, and magic traps. Felix watched in dismay as none of his attacks seemed to have any effect on Roman. After losing 30 consecutive fights against him, Felix realized he had to come to terms with reality. His pride, once unwavering, now seemed meaningless in the face of Roman's unstoppable power. Felix knew he couldn't defeat Roman alone. Desperate for a solution, Felix reached out to a fifth circle mage named Knox. He implored Knox to join him in facing Roman Dimitri. However, Knox hesitated, expressing concern about the uncontrollable power of their combined magic in a duel against Roman. Additionally, Knox questioned why the proxy of the magic tower was involving himself in matters outside his jurisdiction. Knox feared the repercussions if anything were to happen to the eldest son of the Dimitri family. Despite Knox's reservations, Felix emphasized the substantial reward awaiting them if they were to defeat Roman together. He promised Knox a generous share of the reward, half of the 10,000-fold sum, if they succeeded. Upon hearing this, Vox remarked to Felix that they only needed to defeat Roman once, correct? To which Felix responded affirmatively, though he cautioned Vox that it wouldn't be as straightforward as Vox might believe. Felix explained to Vox that Roman seemed to be a natural adversary of mages, emphasizing the necessity of a strategic meeting before taking action. However, Vox reassured Felix, telling him not to worry, as Vox and his subordinates would handle the matter. A few days later, Knox and his subordinates stood before Roman, ready to engage in battle. Roman, ever confident, offered them the first move. Knox and his companions unleashed a barrage of spells upon Roman, hoping to overpower him with sheer force. From the sidelines, Felix observed, realizing that Knox and his subordinates were making the same mistakes he had made in his previous encounters with Roman. Despite their concerted effort, Roman effortlessly defeated all four of them, standing firm in the face of their onslaught. As Roman emerged victorious once again, standing with unwavering resolve, Roman reflected on the transformation brought about by his second body reformation. This metamorphosis had bestowed upon him a newfound immunity to both heat and cold. Roman understood that this enhancement rendered many heat-based attacks ineffective against him. Vox and his subordinates lay on the ground, battered and injured, questioning the enigma that was Roman Dimitri. Felix, taking charge, reassured them to wait, promising to return after a conversation with Roman. 
Inside the palace, Roman stood regally as Felix approached with an honest admission. Felix conceded that he doubted his ability to defeat Roman. However, curiosity burning within him, Felix posed a question that had been gnawing at him. How did Roman possess the uncanny ability to predict and dismantle magic? Hoping for insight, Felix anxiously awaited Roman's response. With a confident smile, Roman assured Felix that he would share the secrets of his preparation for battles. Felix, taken aback by this unexpected revelation, couldn't help but be surprised at Roman's willingness to unveil the mysteries behind his formidable skills. As Roman led Felix into the room, Felix couldn't conceal his surprise at the sight before him. What caught his attention most was the array of grimoires neatly arranged on shelves, a testament to Roman's extensive knowledge. Felix's amazement only grew as he realized that Roman had devoured the contents of every single one of those ancient tomes. Roman, noticing Felix's astonishment, began to explain the intricacies of magic. He spoke of mana resonating with the natural elements within a circle, fire, water, wind, all elements intertwined with the very essence of nature itself. What captured Felix's attention most was Roman's revelation that the resonance of mana within this magical circle could be read like a language. A cascade of signals and patterns would emerge, offering a window into the type of magic being cast. Roman elucidated further, emphasizing the importance of three key abilities when dealing with magic. Firstly, the capability to sense and read the resonance. Secondly, the knowledge to recognize the type of magic by interpreting the form of the resonance. And finally, the ability to make swift decisions based on this information. As Roman spoke, Felix found himself stunned by the depth of Roman's understanding in the seemingly effortless manner in which he wielded this magical knowledge. The realization struck Felix that Roman possessed an extraordinary command over the mystical arts. Leaving the room, Felix couldn't shake the feeling that Roman Dimitri transcended the mere label of genius. The word seemed inadequate to describe the marvel he had just encountered. Roman's relentless pursuit of strength left Felix in awe, making him question his own dedication and accomplishments. Contemplating his role as the Tower Master's proxy, Felix admitted to himself that he had been avoiding reality. The disappearance of his master had become a convenient excuse, hindering his own growth. Determined to change this, Felix resolved to prepare rigorously for his impending spars with Roman. Two months later, he felt a palpable difference in his abilities. Despite the Dimitri family being a baronial household on the border, Felix noted the exceptional strength and loyalty of their soldiers. This realization piqued his curiosity about the man known as Roman. The stark contrast between the Dimitri soldiers and those of typical noble families fueled Felix's interest in understanding the roots of Roman's prowess. Yearning for more insights, Felix sought out the blacksmith's workshop. He approached a worker, inquiring about Roman's presence in the forge. The worker confirmed that Roman frequented the workshop but shared that Roman preferred using his personal forge for sword crafting. Intriguingly, the worker recounted stories from the master blacksmith describing how, during Roman's forging sessions, the flames would engulf his entire body, the worker's vivid description painted a mesmerizing picture for Felix, leaving him in awe of the sight of Roman engulfed in flames. The flames, the worker claimed, were so intense that one might think the god of fire himself stood in front of them. As Felix absorbed this tale, memories flooded back, his master's words echoing in his mind. His master had advised him to forge a connection with fire daily urging Felix to find his unique way to embrace it. The burning magic, his master had emphasized, required an extraordinary affinity with fire. It wasn't a skill one could simply learn at will. Moreover, the master had imparted a peculiar notion. If Felix could endure the engulfing flames without feeling pain, he could be reborn as an incarnation of fire. Returning to the present, Felix ruminated on Roman Dimitri's apparent lack of fear toward fire and heat. A family entrenched in generations of familiarity with the flame's brazier likely held a secret method to coexist with the fiery element. With a determination to unveil this mystery, as Felix approached Roman on the training ground, he couldn't resist the urge to inquire about a rumor he had heard. With a curious expression, Felix posed his question to Sir Roman, wondering if there was any truth to the tales of Roman's ability to handle the flames of the brazier with ease during forging sessions. Eager for knowledge, Felix sought to uncover whether there was a special technique or method behind Roman's remarkable feat. Roman, confirming the existence of his unique method, left Felix stunned. It was the missing piece of the puzzle Felix had been seeking. In that moment, Felix clenched his fists, ready to cut to the chase. Bowing respectfully, Felix implored Roman to share his technique, 
stressing its vital role in the Phoenix Magic Tower. The three years of hardship and suffering had led Felix to this point, where he saw Roman's knowledge as his last glimmer of hope. However, Roman's response introduced an unexpected twist. With a serious expression, Roman questioned why he should do Felix such a favor. The stark reality hit Felix. Roman expected something in return for his invaluable knowledge. Roman pointed out that Felix had already received compensation for his work, leaving Felix to ponder what he could offer in exchange. Felix found himself grappling with the question of what he could possibly offer Roman Dimitri in exchange for the invaluable knowledge he sought. This internal deliberation set the stage for a pivotal scene, one that unfolded within the meeting room of the Phoenix Magic Tower. Gathering the other members, Felix expressed his intention to hear their perspectives. Among them, Knox emerged as a vocal participant. He painted a stark picture, portraying Roman Dimitri as a formidable adversary to mages. Knox's suggestion was startling yet pragmatic. If the Phoenix Tower couldn't best Roman, perhaps they should consider aligning with him. Given the tower's already precarious position within the Frank Empire's hierarchy, such a move might not be as unthinkable as it seemed. Felix was taken aback by this proposal. However, Knox and the others assured him they were fully cognizant of the circumstances at hand. The idea of the Phoenix Magic Tower breaking away from the traditional model, affiliating with a family rather than a nation, sparked contemplation within Felix. It was a radical departure from the norm, but perhaps therein lay the path to securing the tower's future. In response to this discourse, Felix made a decisive proclamation to the assembled members. He declared that from that moment forward, the destiny of the Phoenix Magic Tower would be entrusted to the Dimitris. With that declaration, the wheels of migration were set in motion, marking a significant shift in the tower's trajectory. The narrative then shifted to Felix's office, where a sudden interruption shattered the tranquility of his contemplation. A worker burst in, breathless with urgency, bearing news of the budget allocated by the Dimitris for the Phoenix Magic Tower. Felix's initial expectation was a reduction in funds, given the impending transition to the Dimitri fold. Yet, to his astonishment, the tower had been allocated a generous sum of 24,000 gold annually. Confusion gripped Felix, for he struggled to comprehend the situation at hand. The perplexity stemmed from the prevalent notion among the masses, labeling mages as voracious creatures devouring wealth. This perception stemmed from the necessity for mages to acquire costly items such as grimoires and mana crystals in their pursuit of advancing to higher magic circles. The worker shared Felix's disbelief, acknowledging the incredulity of the situation. It seemed the Dimitris had not only provided ample funding but also extended an invitation for the tower to propose additional budgetary needs if necessary. This revelation left Felix with a sense of disorientation as he contemplated the implications of such unprecedented support. The workers' insistence that Felix step outside to witness the unfolding events firsthand underscored the gravity of the situation. As Felix stepped outside, the grandeur of the palace designated for the members of the Phoenix Magic Tower left him stunned. Chris, observant of Felix's reaction, explained that the palace was built to accommodate the tower's anticipated expansion, with room for up to a thousand members. Curious about Felix's thoughts, Chris sought his opinion on the impressive structure. Felix, taken aback by the unexpected scale of the palace, confessed to feeling puzzled. The Phoenix Magic Tower hadn't foreseen such lavish accommodations from Sir Roman. Chris reassured Felix, explaining that Lord Roman Dimitri prioritized the welfare of his people above all else. It was a trait Felix would need to adjust to. Surprised by this insight into Roman's character, Felix mulled over the implications of his generosity. Meanwhile, the scene shifted to the Dimitri Palace, where Hans was briefing his replacement, Murphy. Hans emphasized the importance of maintaining young Master Roman's routine in his absence. He instructed Murphy to ensure towels were readily available for Roman to wipe off sweat and warm water was on hand. Despite some concern for Murphy's readiness, Hans took comfort in his graduation from the prestigious Adelian Academy. As Hans prepared to take a day off to attend his granddaughter's birthday celebration, he couldn't shake off the uncertainty gnawing at him. Holding a doll tightly in his grasp, a gift for his beloved granddaughter, Hans couldn't help but wonder if she would appreciate his choice. Just as Hans stepped out of the palace, he was greeted by a palace worker who had been patiently awaiting his arrival. Flustered by the unexpected encounter, Hans inquired about the reason for the worker's presence. To his surprise, the worker politely urged Hans to board the waiting carriage. Perplexed, Hans questioned the worker's intentions, only to learn that it was at the behest of young Lord Roman that the worker had been instructed to assist him.
The scene then shifted to Harrison House, Hans's only child. Harrison was astonished to find his home bustling with activity as workers busily prepared for his daughter's birthday party. Confused by the sudden flurry of activity, he turned to his wife for an explanation, only to find that she was equally unaware of the preparations. Yet these workers claimed they were dispatched by young Master Roman. Harrison, perplexed, questioned why Roman would send people to his humble abode. Among the workers, Lucas stepped forward, introducing himself to Harrison. Lucas explained that young Master Roman had sent them to express gratitude to Sir Hans for his dedicated service. Attempting to make sense of the situation, Harrison, flustered, expressed his confusion. He questioned why all these workers were present, emphasizing that his father served as a mere servant in the Dimitri family. In response, Lucas clarified that young Master Roman held Sir Hans in high regard, deeming him important. Lucas then asked Harrison if he had never heard of their Lord Roman from his father. Harrison, stunned, reflected on his memories of Roman Dimitri. He remembered a time when Roman was disparaged as a good-for-nothing, someone oblivious to his father's unwavering devotion and sacrifices. Harrison, in contrast, had harbored a lack of trust in Roman, a sentiment starkly different from his father's unwavering faith. Hans had reassured his son, emphasizing that young Master Roman was going through a challenging phase. As Harrison's eyes welled up with tears, he contemplated the significance of his father's dedication. The revelation that young Master Roman recognized and appreciated Hans's efforts brought a profound sense of meaning to his father's hard work. As guests arrived at Harrison's house for his daughter's birthday celebration, they were met with a scene that left them astonished. The spread of food and the transformed appearance of the house led many to question if they were in the right place. Amidst the murmurs of confusion, soldiers suddenly appeared, signaling the imminent arrival of someone important. The guests watched in curiosity as the soldiers lined up, creating a path for the distinguished guest. Their anticipation peaked as Hans, Harrison's father, made his entrance. Overwhelmed with emotion, Harrison rushed to embrace his father, their reunion filled with warmth and affection. After the heartfelt reunion, attention turned to the presence. Harrison, with his daughter at his side, began to unwrap the gifts, starting with one from his father, a beautiful doll that brought joy to his granddaughter's face. The generosity continued as Harrison opened a gift from Count Conrad, a stunning ruby ring, a gesture that surprised the guests, accustomed to nobles typically reserving such lavish gifts for their own kin. The surprises didn't end there. Gifts from Viscount Lawrence and Count Adelian followed a necklace, and a brooch respectively. The guests couldn't help but wonder why these high-ranking nobles were showering Hans's family with such extravagant presents. It soon became apparent that their motives were strategic, seeking to gain favor with Hans, who had been a steadfast supporter of Roman even in the face of ridicule, and had played a crucial role in his upbringing. Hans's position as a trusted ally to Roman had elevated him to a position of influence, coveted by the nobles seeking connections to the enigmatic young master. As the gifts continued to pour in, Harrison found himself feeling overwhelmed. He was grateful for the generosity but unsure of how to manage such abundance. Opening the final gift, which bore Roman's name, at the mention of Roman's name, Hans's curiosity stirred. He couldn't help but wonder what sort of gift Roman might have presented to his granddaughter. Harrison was stunned by its contents, a recommendation letter for the Glory Academy. The significance of the gesture wasn't lost on Harrison. The Glory Academy was renowned as the most prestigious educational institution, a dream for many commoners. In the wake of the overwhelming revelation that young Master Roman had secured a coveted spot for Harrison's daughter at the esteemed Glory Academy, emotions ran high. Harrison, deeply moved by the magnitude of this opportunity, found himself shedding tears of gratitude. The mere notion of accessing the Academy was daunting, even for those with financial means, making Roman's gesture all the more profound. The scene then shifted to the Dimitri Palace, where Hans, in his characteristic humility, approached Roman. He expressed a sense of unworthiness for the lavish presence bestowed upon his family, emphasizing that the fulfillment derived from his work and the genuine appreciation shown by Roman were more than sufficient. As Roman contemplated his past life as a heavenly demon, memories resurfaced. Roman turned to his loyal subordinate, Mad Demon, and posed a question that weighed on his mind. With a steady gaze, Roman inquired whether Mad Demon harbored any regrets in pledging allegiance to him. In response, Mad Demon's unwavering loyalty shone through as he affirmed that he held no regrets whatsoever. To Mad Demon, the mere fact that Roman placed trust in him was enough to solidify his commitment to serving Roman for the remainder of his days. 
Meanwhile, Hans stood as another servant in the service of Roman Dimitri. Roman turned to Hans with a contemplative expression. Reflecting on the years they had spent together, Roman remarked that Hans had been a constant presence in his life, even surpassing the time he had spent with his own father. Despite the disparity in their social standings, Roman emphasized the unique significance of Hans in his life. To Roman, Hans wasn't merely a servant. He was a cherished individual, valued for his unwavering loyalty and genuine sincerity. In a heartfelt gesture, Roman assured Hans that he was considered one of his people, akin to family, owing to his steadfast commitment. With this acknowledgement, Roman conveyed that Hans had every right to accept the gifts bestowed upon him. Overwhelmed by Roman's words, Hans was deeply moved, touched by the recognition of his dedication and the bond they shared. Roman, in turn, extended sincere congratulations on Hans's granddaughter's birthday, solidifying the depth of their bond. Fast forward to a year later at the Cairo branch of the Valhalla Temple, where Willis found himself tending to the flowers with a sense of boredom. Reflecting on the aftermath of Roman Dimitri's return from the southern front line, Willis contemplated the unexpected turn of events. The mention of the ranking battle had triggered a seismic shift in the Cairo kingdom. Rankers, who traditionally engaged in intense battles amongst themselves, had redirected their focus. Instead, they spent a year meticulously preparing for an impending confrontation with Roman Dimitri. Roman's standing in the kingdom remained somewhat elusive. Officially ranked 100 after his duel with Homeros, Roman's triumph over Butler, the second strongest swordsman of the Hector kingdom, Roman's emergence as a formidable force posed a significant challenge. Positioned within the range of ranks 1 to 99, Roman had the potential to target anyone within this spectrum. His mere decision to act could trigger substantial shifts within Cairo's ranking structure, causing a ripple effect of consequences. Across town, a member of the Valhalla Temple delivered news to Willis. Roman had made contact with the temple. Willis couldn't contain his excitement at the mention of Roman's name, interpreting this development as a sign that the long-awaited public ranking battles were finally on the horizon. Meanwhile, within the hushed confines of the central government palace, Marquis Benedict scrutinized a document that hinted at Roman's forthcoming actions. The political climate in Cairo had grown increasingly precarious. Tower masters, including the esteemed Phoenix Tower Master of the Frank Kingdom, had mysteriously vanished. Rumors swirled that the Kronos Empire pointed fingers at other nations, inciting talks of continent-wide conquest. Such whispers fueled anxiety among the smaller neighboring countries, especially those sharing borders with Kronos, knowing that conflict with the formidable empire was inevitable. Marquis Benedict recognized the urgent need for a robust power structure to withstand Kronos' looming threat. A weak ruler would leave Cairo vulnerable during these tumultuous times. The prospect of Roman Dimitri aligning with the aristocratic faction could potentially tilt the balance of power, sparking a response from the established authorities. Frustrated by the ambiguity of the situation, Marquis Benedict sought to uncover Roman's whereabouts, speculating whether Roman had deliberately chosen to start his ascent from the bottom. Meanwhile, at the bustling public ranking battle arena, Willis stood poised to make an announcement, signaling the commencement of the ranking battle. Between Roman Dimitri, ranked 100, and Jaden, who holds rank 99, a tense confrontation unfolds. Jaden grapples with disbelief that Roman would challenge someone of his lower rank especially when Roman has declared his ambition to claim the top spot. Jaden questions why Roman, if truly as skilled as rumored, would bother with lower-ranked opponents like himself. As Roman stands before Jaden, their faces inches apart, Jaden scrutinizes him closely. Despite expecting a seasoned warrior, Jaden is struck by Roman's youthful appearance. Rumors had circulated that Roman had already set his sights on the next ranking battle, fueling Jaden's perception of Roman as arrogant. The match begins, and Jaden launches into action with full intensity. Gathering his aura, Jaden unleashes a powerful strike aimed directly at Roman. Yet, to Jaden's astonishment, Roman effortlessly evades the attack and swiftly counters, incapacitating Jaden with a mere tap of his sword. In the aftermath of a seemingly one sided battle, Willis confronted Roman, expressing his doubts about the purposefulness of such fights. Was there really a need to engage in this? Willis queried suggesting an alternative strategy of starting the climb from the top 30 rankers instead. Roman's response was resolute, a testament to his unwavering determination. Despite being hailed as a hero by some, Roman acknowledged the pervasive doubts surrounding his abilities. His resolve was clear. He would prove himself by defeating all rankers using only his own skills. 
Willis couldn't help but smirk as he listened to Roman's declaration. This was the Roman he had been waiting for, the one who would defy expectations and astonish the world. The media had already cast doubt on Roman's chances of climbing from rank 99 to the coveted top spot. Yet, Roman's swift and decisive victory over the 98th ranker, Delhi, within a mere day, silenced their skepticism. Willis wasted no time in proclaiming Roman as the new 98th ranker, a testament to his undeniable prowess. Roman wasted no time in seeking out his next opponent, his determination unyielding. With a single strike, he dispatched the 97th ranker, leaving spectators in awe of his unparalleled skill. Despite starting from the bottom of the rankings, Roman's opponents were no pushovers. Each one was a formidable three-star ranker, yet Roman defeated them with effortless efficiency, taking less than 10 seconds to triumph over each. The news spread like wildfire, captivating the attention of all who followed the rankings. In just two days, Roman had battled his way to rank 91, defying all expectations and shattering any doubts about his abilities. The sheer speed and precision of his victories were unprecedented, leaving even the most skeptical observers in disbelief. Meanwhile, the scene shifted to Jaden, the 99th ranker, waking up in a daze. Confusion clouded Jaden's mind as they struggled to comprehend their surroundings. A nearby worker approached, offering an explanation for Jaden's disorientation. They had underestimated their opponent, Roman Dimitri, and had been swiftly defeated with a single devastating blow. It had been a full day since Jaden had lost consciousness, yet they were the only one to have awakened after facing Roman. As the reality of their defeat sunk in, Jaden's mind raced with questions. How many opponents had Roman faced? How many had he defeated? The worker's response only deepened Jaden's sense of astonishment. Roman had defeated five rankers in just one day, including Jaden himself. The magnitude of Roman's feat was staggering, leaving Jaden to ponder the implications of such an extraordinary accomplishment. The worker's inquiry pierced through Jaden's bewildered state, prompting him to grapple with the weight of his recent defeat. As the worker elucidated that the other rankers had never truly been Roman's adversaries from the outset, Jaden's mind raced, trying to comprehend the gravity of the situation. Then, a surge of pain shot through his body, leaving him feeling as though he'd been torn apart at the seams. The worker's prognosis was grim. Jaden would be incapacitated for at least a month, courtesy of the havoc wreaked upon his muscles by Roman's mysterious spell. Stunned disbelief gave way to frustration as Jaden grappled with the aftermath of his encounter with Roman. He realized the urgency of halting Roman's relentless advance and issued a solemn warning to his fellow rankers. Drawing from his own harrowing experience, Jaden recounted the sheer force of Roman's strength, which had rendered him defenseless with a single devastating blow. It wasn't merely a matter of losing a duel. Facing Roman meant risking life-altering injury. Meanwhile, Roman's rampage through the ranks continued unabated. In the span of just one week, he systematically dismantled all opposition, vanquishing adversaries from rank 91 to 40 with alarming efficiency. With each resounding victory, the doubts and rumors that had plagued Roman's ascent dissipated like morning mist. Those ranked from 39th to 31st resigned themselves to defeat, acknowledging the futility of resisting Roman's inexorable advance. When Fernando, the 30th ranker, accepted Roman's challenge, skepticism rippled through the ranks. Ranker 32 cautioned Fernando against his rash decision, warning of the formidable opponent he was about to face. Roman, with his unmatched skill and prowess, was deemed by many to be a five-star threat, far beyond the reach of all but the most elite rankers. Yet, Fernando remained steadfast in his resolve, undeterred by the warnings of his peers. As Fernando faced criticism for his decision, he refused to waver, steadfast in his conviction that facing Roman was a challenge worth undertaking. In his eyes, it was not a matter of recklessness but rather a test of his own courage and determination. He refused to cower in the face of fear, steadfastly maintaining his belief that surrendering to Romans might would tarnish their collective image far more than any defeat on the battlefield. Despite the doubts and admonitions of his fellow rankers, Fernando stood firm, a beacon of unwavering resolve amidst the swirling currents of uncertainty. As a ranker, he understood the risks inherent in challenging someone as formidable as Roman Dimitri. Yet, he refused to cower in the face of adversity, choosing instead to confront it head-on. For Fernando, the duel with Roman was not merely a test of skill, but a testament to the indomitable spirit that defined him as a ranker. Fernando cared little for appearances. What he sought was the chance to test his mettle against a foe stronger than himself, a chance to hone his skills where talent fell short. As he squared off against Roman in the arena, 
murmurs rippled through the audience, speculating on the duration of the match. While Fernando was known for his mastery of basic combat skills, he struggled against opponents rated four stars or higher. With determination alone, he had climbed to rank 30, but there he found his limits. In the heat of battle, Fernando believed that Roman might see him as nothing more than a sacrificial pawn. Yet, in return, Fernando hoped that Roman might offer him insights into the world of combat, allowing him to progress even further. As the duel commenced, Fernando launched himself at Roman with full force, his aura blazing around him. However, Roman effortlessly sidestepped Fernando's onslaught, evading each strike with ease. Spotting an opening, Fernando gracefully arced his sword sideways. However, Roman instinctively leaned back, skillfully evading Fernando's strike. Undeterred, Fernando persisted, propelling himself through the air and aiming a decisive blow towards Roman's head. Yet, Roman effortlessly sidestepped the assault, swiftly regaining his stance. But Roman's elusive movements left him frustrated and confused. Was Roman toying with him? Did he think Fernando unworthy of a true challenge? Fernando's pride stung, but he had long ago shed his ego in pursuit of improvement. Then, to Fernando's astonishment, Roman began communicating with him telepathically, guiding him through the intricacies of combat. Roman explained to Fernando that despite being rated as a formidable four-star warrior, his weakness stemmed from an unstable aura output. He warned Fernando that if he continued to fight in the same manner, he would never progress. Roman elaborated that the conventional method of stabilizing aura output involved absorbing mana and channeling it along a specific pathway. This approach was widely adopted by swordsmen across Cairo Kingdom and the Salamander Continent, following a standardized mana path system. However, Roman's assertion left Fernando astonished. He had always believed there was only one mana path and was perplexed by Roman's revelations. Roman took a moment to unravel the complexities of aura manipulation for Fernando. He explained that an outburst of aura occurs when mana surges along its designated pathway, a fundamental principle shared among practitioners. While the specifics of circulation methods may vary from individual to individual, the process of constructing these pathways remains constant, a universally recognized approach. Acknowledging the challenge of forging a new pathway while adhering to an existing one, Roman posed a thought-provoking question to Fernando. Wasn't it worth exploring the possibility of charting a new course? Fernando found himself grappling with Roman's proposition, unsure of what it entailed but willing to embark on the journey nonetheless. Unlike his peers fixated on reputation and honor, Fernando remained indifferent to such concerns, choosing instead to place his trust in Roman, even if doubts lingered about the sincerity of Roman's guidance. Encouraged by Roman's reassurance, Fernando immersed himself in the task at hand. With Roman's guidance, he focused on channeling and containing the energy of his mana, a feat that required both concentration and control. Roman promised that with diligence, a new pathway would reveal itself, a promising avenue for Fernando's growth. As Fernando delved deeper into the depths of his mana, a sense of clarity began to emerge. Guided by Roman's instructions, he navigated the intricate currents of his aura, seeking out the elusive pathway that lay hidden within. With each passing moment, Fernando's connection to his mana strengthened, paving the way for a breakthrough that would alter the course of his journey. In a moment of revelation, Fernando felt the subtle shift in energy, a sign that he had succeeded in carving out a new pathway for his aura. The realization washed over him like a wave, filling him with a sense of accomplishment and newfound purpose. In that fleeting moment, Fernando understood the true extent of Roman's wisdom and the transformative power of his guidance. With a knowing smile, Roman signaled the conclusion of their session. In a display of unparalleled skill, he delivered a single strike that brought Fernando to his knees, a testament to the vast disparity in their abilities. Observers in the audience marveled at the spectacle, recognizing Fernando's pivotal role in showcasing Roman's unparalleled strength. Despite the defeat, Fernando remained undeterred, rising to his feet with a sense of determination. As he called out to Roman, signaling his desire for further discourse, a sense of anticipation filled the air. Inside the confines of the waiting room, Fernando sought answers from Roman, eager to understand the source of his newfound insight. With patience and clarity, Roman elucidated the intricacies of Fernando's aura, shedding light on the root of his struggle. He explained that while Fernando possessed the potential for greatness, the instability of his aura's pathway had hindered his progress. Fernando stood before Roman, his mind racing with a whirlwind of emotions. Roman's revelation had sparked a glimmer of hope within him, a faint beacon in the darkness of his uncertainty. 
With a rare display of honesty, Fernando confessed to Roman the conflicting feelings swirling within him. While he felt encouraged by Roman's words, he couldn't shake the doubt that lingered, the fear that his own strength might not be enough to carry him forward. It was with this vulnerability that Fernando mustered the courage to ask Roman for guidance, to teach him the elusive art of opening his aura pathway. Roman's response was measured yet decisive. He acknowledged Fernando's request, assuring him that teaching the method wouldn't pose a problem. However, Roman made it clear that he preferred deals that yielded mutual benefits, hinting at a deeper layer of understanding between them. Undeterred by Roman's caveat, Fernando implored him to name his terms, a testament to his unwavering determination to learn from the enigmatic swordsman. It was a plea born not out of desperation, but out of a genuine hunger for growth and improvement. In that moment, Roman issued a request that caught Fernando off guard. He asked Fernando to follow him and live for Roman's sake, a proposition that resonated deeply with Fernando's sense of purpose. To Fernando, Roman represented not just a mentor, but a guiding light illuminating the path ahead. Without hesitation, Fernando knelt before Roman, pledging his loyalty with a solemn vow that echoed through the chambers of their shared destiny. The scene transitions to the gathering of the aristocratic faction, where representatives from all four factions have convened. They express concern over the recent actions of Roman Dimitri, recognizing the potential trouble his actions may bring. Speculation arises that Roman might actually pose a significant threat to Count Nicholas. Marquis Benedict interjects, cautioning against premature conclusions. While acknowledging Roman's past victory over Butler, he emphasizes the vast disparity in power, noting that Count Nicholas holds a formidable rank of 80 within the continent. Count Nicholas, a royal knight revered as the strongest swordsman in Cairo, commanded respect and fear in equal measure. Yet, Roman's recent feats had cast doubt upon the established hierarchy, hinting at a paradigm shift that threatened to upend the status quo. As the discussion unfolded, one nobleman dared to voice the unspoken question looming over their deliberations, what would happen if Roman emerged victorious over Count Nicholas? Marquis Benedict's response was swift and unequivocal. He warned of the ramifications of such an outcome, emphasizing Count Nicholas's indispensable role in upholding the royal faction's power. To Marquis Benedict, Roman's triumph would not only undermine the existing order, but herald the rise of a new force that must be stopped at all costs. In the face of this uncertainty, Marquis Benedict laid bare the stark choice that lay before them. If Roman rejected their proposal, the decision had been made within the aristocratic faction, unanimous and resolute. Roman's presence posed an imminent threat that could no longer be ignored. Marquis Benedict's authoritative voice cut through the tense atmosphere as he declared that Roman must be eliminated, regardless of the consequences. With urgency in his tone, he instructed all members of the aristocratic faction to mobilize their family's troops secretly within the capital. It was a calculated move, designed to ensnare Roman within their grasp, regardless of his next move. Meanwhile, in the bustling arena where Roman had just emerged victorious against Heron, the 10th-ranked combatant from the Kronos faction, the crowd erupted into cheers. Roman's gaze swept over the audience, his voice cutting through the air with a mix of frustration and determination. His unexpected outburst caught everyone off guard. Roman continued, expressing his disappointment in the situation. He recounted how he had initiated a public ranking battle a year ago, hoping that the esteemed rankers of Cairo would rise to the challenge. However, after defeating the formidable rank 10, Heron, Roman came to a stark realization. He declared that the only adversary worthy of his skill was Count Nicholas. Roman declared his intention to forego meaningless formalities announcing his plan to face off against ranks 9 through 2 in the arena in three days' time. With unwavering resolve, he vowed to emerge victorious against each opponent, culminating in a direct challenge to Cairo's strongest swordsman. His words sent shockwaves through the city, stirring up a frenzy of anticipation and speculation. Meanwhile, among the assembled rankers, Bruno, rank 9 from the Valhalla faction, voiced his intention to concede defeat. He reasoned that his skills were too similar to Geron's, and thus Roman would undoubtedly overpower him. However, Oscar, the second-ranked member of the aristocratic faction, vehemently rejected the idea of surrender. Reminding Bruno of Roman's public disparagement of Sir Geron's skills and his bold declaration to defeat all remaining rankers from ninth to first on the same day, Oscar argued that capitulation was not an option. Surrendering now would only invite scorn and mockery from the public. That's why he had convened all the rankers of Cairo to stand united against Roman's audacious ambitions. Urging his fellow rankers to set aside their differences and work together, 
Oscar implored them to exhaust Roman to the fullest extent possible, determined to thwart his plans at any cost. Oscar, fervently loyal to Marquis Benedict, rallied the rankers, promising rewards for their allegiance and vowing to confront Roman with his life on the line to preserve their honor. Inspired, the rankers pledged their support, uniting as the collective strength of Cairo's swordsmen against Roman's challenge. Oscar's smirk revealed his confidence as he prepared to lead them into battle. In the arena, the unified front of rankers from 9 to 2 stirred the audience, who cheered at their defiance of Roman's provocation. The display of solidarity left Roman sobered, recognizing the inherent unity among nobles in times of crisis. With time dwindling, Roman braced for the impending clash, understanding that in Cairo, it was a matter of survival, dominate or be dominated. As the battle commenced, Bruno, the ninth-ranked combatant, stepped forward, expecting a protracted struggle. However, Roman swiftly dispatched him with a single strike, shocking both Bruno and the onlookers. This pattern repeated as each ranker fell in rapid succession, Roman's determination growing with every victory. Oscar and his comrades watched in disbelief as Roman's seemingly invincible skill demolished their hopes. With a stern gaze, Roman singled out Oscar, ominously declaring, only one left. The scene transitions to the grandeur of the royal palace, where a soldier rushes in, his demeanor urgent as he delivers news to the king. With a mixture of awe and concern, he announces Roman's staggering victory, recounting how Roman swiftly dispatched rankers nine through two in a single day. This triumph, the soldier adds, leaves the royal faction without any viable justification to bar Roman from challenging rank one. Daniel is visibly troubled by this revelation. He contemplates the implications of Roman's unchecked ascent and turns to Count Nicholas, the esteemed swordsman of Cairo, seeking counsel in this moment of uncertainty. Daniel wonders if there is any way to avert a potentially catastrophic confrontation with Roman. Daniel confided in Nicholas, expressing his trust in him. However, he voiced his concern that if the foremost swordsman of Cairo were to falter at this juncture, Daniel's own standing would inevitably render him vulnerable to the machinations of the aristocratic faction. Nicholas, exuding confidence, reassures Daniel, urging him to place his faith in him once more. With a determined nod, Nicholas vows to demonstrate why he holds the esteemed title of the strongest swordsman in Cairo. As Nicholas exits the king's chamber, he is met by Binner, a loyal companion. Concern etched on his face, Binner inquires about Nicholas's well-being. In response, Nicholas seeks Binner's insight into the character of Roman. Binner paints a vivid picture of Roman as a natural-born predator, endowed with an innate sense of purpose long before the world acknowledged his prowess. He warns Nicholas to proceed with caution, emphasizing the dire consequences should Nicholas fail to thwart Roman's ambitions. With a steely resolve, Nicholas pledges to protect the royal family from any potential threats, assuring Binner that he will not falter in his duty. The following day dawns, and the arena buzzes with anticipation as Roman makes his way toward the battleground, a figure of awe-inspiring determination. Across from him stands Nicholas, the epitome of stoic resolve, his sword gleaming in the sunlight. With a sense of solemnity, Nicholas draws his weapon, ready to face Roman and defend the honor of Cairo. In a resolute voice, Nicholas proclaims himself as the strongest swordsman in Cairo, poised to impart upon Roman the harsh realities of their world. Roman, undaunted, accepts the challenge, his gaze steely with determination. As the match commences, both combatants charge toward each other, their swords clashing in a symphony of steel. Each strike resonates with a power that leaves the audience spellbound, their collective breath caught in the intensity of the moment. Willis, among the spectators, watches with bated breath as Roman and Nicholas engage in a breathtaking display of skill and prowess. Willis, watching from the sidelines, couldn't contain his excitement. This was the kind of fight he had been longing to witness, a battle between two titans. Nicholas, known as the strongest swordsman of Cairo, couldn't help but acknowledge Roman's unique approach to combat. Roman, in turn, showed respect for Nicholas's formidable reputation. The audience held their breath as the two warriors engaged in a dance of blades, their movements swift and precise. Nicholas launched a fierce strike imbued with his aura, aiming to test Roman's defenses. To the amazement of the spectators, Roman managed to block the attack effortlessly. The sight of two of Cairo's finest swordsmen locked in combat left the audience spellbound, their eyes glued to the spectacle unfolding before them. Seizing an opening, Roman surged forward with his own aura-infused sword, aiming a powerful blow at Nicholas. Although Nicholas successfully parried the attack, he found himself forced backward by Roman's sheer strength. 
Doubts began to creep into Nicholas's mind as he realized he was struggling to match Roman's power. On the other hand, Roman reveled in the intensity of the battle, his adrenaline pumping as he pushed himself to the limit. Each exchange of blows only fueled his determination further, driving him to test the limits of his abilities. Nicholas understood the precariousness of the situation. If he were to falter, it could spell disaster for the royal family. In that crucial moment, Nicholas lunged forward, aiming a slashing strike with his aura-infused sword at Roman. Yet, with lightning reflexes, Roman evaded the attack, gracefully leaping back onto the arena floor. With this in mind, he steeled himself, focusing his energy to unleash his ultimate technique, demolition. Surrounding himself with a radiant aura, Nicholas launched a precise and devastating attack aimed at Roman. Caught off guard by the sudden onslaught, Roman reacted swiftly. Drawing upon his own mastery of swordsmanship, he unleashed the Heavenly Demon Sword technique, a move he had perfected through years of training. The clash between their energies resulted in a dazzling explosion, engulfing the arena in chaos. As the dust settled, the outcome became clear. Nicholas, once standing proud as Cairo's strongest swordsman, now found himself on his knees, defeated. Despite the shock of his loss, Nicholas refused to yield, his determination unwavering. Rising to his feet, he urged Roman to continue the fight, his resolve unbroken. Roman, taken aback by Nicholas's resilience, couldn't help but question his opponent's motives. Why was Nicholas pushing himself so far? With a smile, Nicholas asserts to Roman that he remains the strongest swordsman in Cairo. Even if he were to fall, his spirit would remain unbroken. Witnessing Nicholas's unwavering resolve, Roman is struck by his remarkable character. Despite the admiration, Roman swiftly moves to strike down the formidable swordsman. In a decisive blow, Roman defeats the titan who had long dominated Cairo. The audience watches in stunned silence as the era of Nicholas's reign comes to an abrupt end. Willis, acknowledging the momentous occasion, declares Roman Dimitri as the new number one swordsman in the Cairo kingdom before departing from the arena. Reflecting on the outcome, Willis ponders whether everyone had underestimated Roman Dimitri or if Roman had simply surpassed all expectations. He contemplates Roman's disinterest in joining Valhalla recognizing him as a formidable force that must not be left unchecked.